Falling for Olivia. A Sweet Southern Romantic Comedy. Written by Suzanne Ash. Chapter 1. Harrison. Refill? Dolores, the middle-aged woman who had taken my order half an hour ago, holds up a carafe. Yes, please. I slide my cup over, creating a bit of distance between it and my laptop. That's a neat-looking place. Thinking about renting it for the weekend, she asks. No. I wish. I'm doing research. I look at the small cabin listing with fresh eyes. I'm not sure it would be my first choice for a weekend getaway. If I was dating someone, maybe. But even then, it was a little too frilly for me. But it's the type of place people rent when they want to experience a few days out in the country on a working farm. My phone dings. I pick it up and glance at the message from Lex. My cousin wants me back on the family farm. I'll let you get back to work, then. Holler if you need anything else. Dolores walks off, and I get back to scanning listings and making notes. Who knew that a tea and coffee bar and local honey were standard in this kind of place? Throw in a couple of jars of homemade jam and half a dozen farm fresh eggs, and you were almost guaranteed rating reviews. I click on the listing for a nearby experience, deciding that farm life can wait. As much as I love Lex and my grandparents, I need this break for a few hours. Yet, even here at the diner in the town my father grew up in, I can't escape it. I don't know where this particular farm is, but I have to figure out what in the world goat yoga is. The listing doesn't help. It assumes I know all about the activity and am ready to book an experience. The reviews are positive, though. The bell above the diner door chimes, and I look up. The most gorgeous woman I've seen in a long time walks in. Not that I'm in the market, but when you get around as much as I have, you appreciate beautiful members of the opposite sex. With her raven black hair and large sunglasses, she would make it into any of the fashion magazines my mom can't get enough of. Her skin is alabaster white, creating a stark contrast to her dark hair. She's wearing a black wrap dress that's almost too tight and shows off her curves. The black sandals she's wearing have enough of a heel to make her legs lift and give her the illusion of being taller than she really is. She's tiny, barely over five feet tall without those shoes. She pushes the sunglasses up on her hair and, for a brief second, piercing blue eyes stare into my soul. I blink and she turns to speak to Dolores. I'm tempted to get up and move closer. The diner is noisy and with her head turned away from me, I can't make out what she says. Dolores laughs and says something about a latte and things having changed. It doesn't make sense. I tear my eyes away and return to my quest to discover what this goat yoga stuff is all about. I pull a pair of earbuds from my pocket, plug them in, and click on the first of a list of videos my Google search brings up. No way! I realize I spoke too loudly when every pair of eyes in the diner zeroes in on me, including the icy blue ones from the girl at the counter who's accepting a large mug of what looks like a latte. But who could blame me? This goat yoga thing was nuts. I've gone to my share of yoga sessions. Bree would have been all over this. Ignoring the pain in my chest that's still there any time I think about the woman I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with, I redirect my attention to the ridiculousness playing out on the screen in front of me. But how are you supposed to focus with actual goats climbing all over you? I almost lose it when one of them starts dropping milk duds. What's so funny? I look up to see the young woman walking toward me, coffee and a large stack of papers I hadn't noticed before in hand. Goats! While goat yoga might not be my cup of tea, it's the perfect use for the pair of goats I have bought along with a few other animals to join the chickens and cows at the farm. A petting zoo will make for a great attraction that will bring more people in. Lex is going to love it. More customers for the farm shop he's opened in the past year, much to our grandfather's dismay. Hmm, she makes her way across the room toward me when she stumbles. Papers go flying and coffee sloshes out of the cup, covering me and my laptop. Her hands fly out, catching herself on edge of my table. I can smell the sugar in it, picking my laptop up to allow most of it to pour off as Dolores rushes toward us, 
a stack of towels and a bucket in hand. I'm so sorry. Her face is whiter than it was before. If that's even possible. She pushes herself up and looks at the mess she caused. Coffee and papers are everywhere. Don't worry about it. I grab one of the white towels Dolores hands me and soak up as much of the liquid as I can. I shut my laptop and set it down on the bit of table that isn't covered in stickiness. How much sugar is in this drink? My phone dings again. I ignore it while wiping the table. I stand up to let the rest of the coffee drip down my pants instead of pooling in my lap. Here. Dolores hands me a few more towels, and I do my best to clean my pants. I can't believe I tripped over my own feet. The young woman shakes her head before bending down to retrieve the papers she dropped. There have got to be at least a hundred pages here, more than half of them soaked in coffee. Who knew one cup could spread so far and wreak so much havoc? My phone rings. I glance down and send the call to voicemail. I can't deal with Lex right now. Not sure how you manage that, either. I look down at the floor to confirm what I already know. Nothing there but tile. There isn't even a chair leg close enough that it could have possibly been the object that caused the fall. It had to be her own feet. A nervous laugh escapes her lips, drawing my attention up to her face. My gaze schemes across her boldly colored lips, being drawn to those eyes of hers like they are powerful magnets. I'll make it up to you. I promise. Do you think it's fixable? She looks at the closed laptop sitting on the table. I get the feeling that she's worried about having to replace it. Not that I'd make her do that. Even if it isn't salvageable, which I doubt. Not that big of a deal. I'm due for an upgrade, and I'm not the kind of person who would take advantage of what had clearly been an accident. Unless. My heart skips a beat at the idea of this being a weird way to instigate a meeting before dismissing the idea just as fast. I'm Harrison, and I'm sure it's fine. And if it isn't, I have everything backed up to the cloud. No harm done. Really, I add when I see the doubt in those pretty blue eyes. Liv, it's nice to meet you. She holds out her hand. I shake it, surprised how small it feels. The skin is soft, warmth traveling from her delicate fingers and palm up my arm all the way to my chest. It's the strangest feeling. It's nice to meet you too, I say, my voice sounding rough, even to me. She holds out her hand again. Your phone, she demands. Why? So I can give you my number. Call me and let me know how much I owe you to get this fixed. She motions first at my computer, then at my pants and shoes. There is no way I'm making her pay for all that, even if her handbag looks expensive. But that doesn't mean I won't accept her number. It would make tracking her down to ask her out that much simpler. My phone rings again when she hands it back to me a few seconds later. Maybe you should get that? Probably. I pick it up and step around the table, out of the way of Dolores, who is busy mopping the floor. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Liv collect her papers. I don't even try to stop the grin spreading across my face. She's a good-looking woman. Explain to me why I have a donkey, two goats, and a bunch of rats sitting in my driveway, my cousin demands, ruining a perfectly good moment. Chapter 2 Olivia Done staring? Dolores asks when I turn around. Sorry. Who could blame me? He was the best-looking guy in Linden. That might have something to do with the fact that I know every member of the male species in this town and have watched anyone my age grow from snotty schoolboys to awkward teenagers and then country guys whose idea of a good Saturday night is watching a football game or grabbing a drink at the tipsy cow. Nothing to be sorry about. He's a nice breath of fresh air. Dolores takes a damp rag and wipes across the now empty table. I sigh and stare at the mess in front of me. The script I'd discovered and the reason I was back home in Linden was scattered across the copper kettle's tile floor. I crouch back down and get back to picking up the papers scattered across the floor. Far too many of them are soaked in caramel latte. The rest have splashes of the coffee on them. This is ruined, I sigh. 
Here. Dolores holds a bucket out to me. I look at the soggy mess in my hands. There's no way I can salvage this. Thanks. I drop what I picked up in the bucket and grab the next batch. Getting it reprinted in this little town won't be easy, and the last thing I want to do is drive all the way out to Greenville to find an office supply store that can reprint them. I have this covered. Why don't you go clean up and have a seat? I'll bring you a fresh coffee in a minute. On the house. Dolores shoes me toward the back of the diner where the restrooms are located. You don't have to do that. This was completely my fault. I toss the last of the papers into the bucket and look at my hands, before heading back to wash them. By the time I return to my table, the floor is clean. Aside from the shine coming off the damp tiles and the bright yellow sign warning patrons that the floor is wet, all evidence of my latest klutzy moment is gone. Here you go, hun. I barely sit down and pull out my phone to search for a way to reprint the screenplay when Dolores walks up with a fresh caramel latte and places it in front of me along with a slice of her famous chess pie. I can't. Yes, you can. My way of saying welcome home. We missed you around here. Not as much as your mama, though, I bet. She takes a seat across from me, using the corner of her apron to clean an imaginary spot off the table. She was pretty happy to see me. Not as happy as Marshall, though. He barreled into me the minute he saw me. I relive the moment my 80-pound dog ran up to me, jumped me, pushed me into the dirt, and gave me kisses for five minutes straight before I could get up and hug my mom. My white Levi's will never be the same, despite my mom's best efforts. And she has plenty of experience getting dirt and grass stains out of clothes. I'm sure. How long will you be in town? Dolores asks. Her eyes quickly roam across the dining room before settling on me. Her smile is warm, and I have her full attention. I'm not sure. This is sort of a work thing. I shrug. This isn't something I want to get into. At least not yet. You brought work with you? That's what those papers were? Dolores asks. I nod. It's as good of an explanation as any. Dolores rises. Well, we're glad to have you back. Even if it's just for a short time. I hope I see you soon. Bring your mom next time. She hasn't been to see me in a while. I will. I make a note to find out why my mom hasn't been to the diner. Before I moved west, we'd come here at least once a week for dinner. Enjoy your pie. She rushes off to take the order of the couple that walked in a minute ago. I don't recognize either of them. I dig into the pie, and it's as good as I remember. Sweet with a flaky crust. I almost wish I had gotten black coffee to cut the sweetness. Almost. I take another sip of my latte and sigh, relishing in the sugar high that hits me. I pull my phone out of my purse and look for options to reprint the script that could change the entire trajectory of my career. It has to. Without it, I'm pretty much out of options. Speaking of options, as expected, they are scarce when it comes to print shops in the area. The local library is the only option available within 50 miles. I cringe at the thought of standing next to the old copier in the lobby, waiting for all 400 pages to print, crossing my fingers that neither paper nor ink will run out. I shake my head and take another bite of pie. Ordering the prints online and having them shipped to my mother's house seems like the best option. I find an office supply store that offers the service and order two copies, just in case, before taking the last bite of my pie. The cost almost drains my bank account, but what can you do? Nothing risked, nothing gained. If all else fails, I'll take a part-time job in town. Maybe Dolores needs an extra pair of hands in the diner, I muse. I look over at the counter. She's busy pouring coffee and jotting down the couple's order. After tripping over my own feet and making her mop in the middle of the day, I seriously doubt Dolores would hire me as a server. Maybe she needs a social media manager? I laugh at the ridiculousness of the idea in our one-stop light town. 
I finish my latte and stroll to the counter to pay. No need to wait for Dolores to make her way back over here. She's busy fixing a fresh pot of coffee. I hop on one of the open stools at the counter. I can't help but overhear the couple next to me. I don't think this will work. This place is too, the man wearing tailored wool pants and a white dress shirt that I'm sure costs more than anything in my wardrobe. He shakes his head and glances around the diner. From the look on his face, he's not impressed. I follow his gaze. Sure, this isn't as fancy as some of the LA places I've been to, but it's a nice diner. It's homey and comfortable. The kind of place where you know the special will taste amazing the moment you walk in the door. Forget about what it's looking like now. It's a diamond in the rough. Not too far from Greenville and close to the mountains. That lake alone will draw people here. If we can get a foot in the door before the rest of the bloodhounds show up. What can I get ya, hun? Dolores asks, looking up at me. I turn my attention to her. What do I owe you for the coffee and pie? I ask. Nothing. It's on the house. She smiles and grabs a stack of menus, wiping the clear plastic covers and neatly arranging them in a stack in front of her. The woman's hands are never still. I made a mess of the place. The least I can do is pay. I pull my wallet out of my purse. Dolores reaches across the counter and puts her hand on mine. Keep your money and don't you worry about the coffee. The floor needed mopping anyway. It's a blatant lie. Dolores always keeps the diner spotless. Are you sure? I ask. She pats my hand and nods. Of course. I'm glad you're back home. Tell you mom I said hi. Dolores turned back to make a second pot of coffee. Decoff by the look of the orange lid on the carafe. I hop from the stool. I will. And I promise to drag her back in here this week. Chapter 3 Harrison This can't be real. I know this isn't ending well the minute I pull into the driveway of my grandparents' farm and see the chaos in front of me. I swerve to keep from running over a goat that looks like it's spent the better part of the day rolling in mud. Lex waves his arms, yelling something I can't hear. I pull up, park the car, and open my door. He sprints past me toward the gate. Don't let that billy goat out of the yard. We'll never catch him, my grandfather yells. I take off after Lex. For the first time in my life, I'm thankful my family's farm has such a long driveway. Cattle fence runs along both sides of the dirt road. That said, I'm not sure it's long enough for either of us to catch up with the goat bent on escape. Until something catches its attention. The ugly goat slows its run and finally comes to a stop when it spots a patch of dandelion in the cow pasture. Lex slows his own pace, and I catch up to my cousin with little effort. Before I can pass him, his arm shoots out, and he holds me back. Don't spook him, he breathes. I barely nod my head and do my best to slow my breathing. I take a closer look at the beast in front of me. It's not the goat I thought I was getting. It's nothing like the cute little critters in the goat yoga videos I watched. This one is obviously a male, with matted fur, and doesn't look like something I'd want walking on my back. And who knows what could happen with those hoofs and horns. What's the plan? Sneak up on him, grab him by the collar and drag him back without getting dudded, Lex says. I wish he'd sound a little more confident. Got it. I can feel the eyes of my grandparents and Becky Williams, the previous owner of the billy goat on my back. Lex takes a step forward, and I follow close behind. Two more steps and we're within arm's reach of the goat. I take a deep breath and immediately regret it. My cousin motions for me to get to the other side of the goat. We both reach for the goat's collar at the same time, and by some miracle, we both get a good hand on it. The goat isn't too happy, and kicks out, the hoof grazing my leg. Don't let go, Lex says, his own hand tightening on the collar. I've seen dogs larger than this billy, but they don't have horns. 
Thankfully, he settles down and lets us pull him up the driveway toward the small crowd gathered around the truck and trailer I assume belong to Mrs. Williams. What's that stench? I ask, turning my head to take a somewhat fresh breath of air. That's Billy Goats for you. They urinate on themselves and think it's appealing to the ladies. Lex grins and then quickly shuts his mouth. You're saying that's their version of drowning themselves in too much cheap cologne? I ask. Pretty much. That's why Grandma never let me show a Billy when I was in 4-H. A doling was as far as she was willing to go. And it was sold the minute the showing was over. What were you thinking, buying two old Billies? Lex looks at me over said goat. I thought it was a good deal. It seemed like it when I'd come across the listing in a local Facebook group and Mrs. Williams had assured me that the goats would be perfect for a small petting zoo. I'll tie Rocky here up until you can get him in his stall, Mrs. Williams says when we reach the top of the drive, dragging the billy goat between us. She expertly attaches a rope to the collar and fastens it around a beam on the livestock trailer. He's not staying. And neither is the rest of this mess. My grandfather shakes the shovel he's holding at her. You bought them, they're yours, she replies calmly. Her voice is rough and gravely. It sounds like she's been smoking a pack or two of cigarettes for decades. Right on cue, she pulls a pack out of the back pocket of her worn jeans and lights one up. I did no such thing. I have owned this farm for close to fifty years and... I step up before my grandfather gets any more worked up. It can't be good for his heart. I bought them. Harrison Clark. You must be Mrs. Williams. I hold out my hand and she shakes it. Her palms have more calluses on them than my grandfather's. Call me Becky. Mrs. Williams was my mother-in-law. She blows out a cloud of smoke and, for once, I don't mind. Anything is better than the scent of goat urine. Rocky would need a bath or ten before he was ready to become part of the farm's new petting zoo. Becky, thanks so much for bringing them over, but I thought we'd agreed on next Thursday. I was in the area, and you seemed excited about them little critters. Figured I'd bring them on by, she said. Harrison, a word. My grandfather's voice is booming across the drive, and I watch him walk off around the side of the house toward the feed shed. I know better than to ignore the old man. Lex falls into step with me. I can explain, I start. My grandfather raises his hand, and I stop. This is my farm my land. And I will not. Let me repeat, I will not let you bring a bunch of poorly kept, disease-ridden animals on it. What were you thinking, taking in a bunch of strays? This is a working farm, not a, he drops his and stares back in the direction of the drive. We can't see the animals, or their previous owner, but it's hard to ignore the sound of rabbits thumping, guinea pigs squeaking, and goats bleeding. I didn't get them as pets or anything. I have a plan, and they will serve a purpose on the farm, Grandpa. After my awful attempt at sneaking a kitten into the house during a summer visit when I was eleven or twelve, I knew that every animal living here had a purpose. My grandparents didn't do pets, not even when they were an adorable gray kitten with ice blue eyes and the softest fur you've ever touched. Kayla hadn't been barn cat material and was scared of mice. Thankfully, I'd been able to find her a new home before my grandfather's deadline. I didn't want to think what he would have done to the poor kitten if I hadn't. How could a bunch of disease-ridden rats and billy goats serve a purpose? He stares me down, but at least he's giving me a chance to explain myself. I've been thinking about Lex's produce stand, I start. Don't even get me started on that nonsense, my grandfather interrupts. Hey, it's starting to catch on. Lex steps beside me and crosses his arm. The small stand filled with excess produce from our large vegetable garden and farm fresh eggs is his pet project and attempt to diversify the income generated on the farm. Our grandfather harumphs. He's not wrong. It's been slow to catch on. Which was why I'd been racking my brain about ways to bring more people to the farm. It wasn't far out of town, but the residents of Linden, SC weren't used to shopping farm to table, yet. 
I was thinking since most of the people that have been to the produce stand have had kids, it would be nice to have a little petting zoo. Give them a reason to come by more often and shop at the store. I do my best to look confident. And how do you plan on paying for the feed? These critters aren't going to provide for themselves. I smile, my confidence growing. This is something I've thought about. I'm renting them out for birthday parties and stuff. One party per month should cover the feed bill. After all, how much can rabbits and guinea pigs eat? And the goats obviously like the weeds growing all over the place. Who knows, maybe I can teach them to weed the vegetable patches, or at the very least, they can eat everything Lex and my grandmother spend hours weeding and thinning from those gardens. Petting Zoo? Who would want a couple of ornery goats in their yard on their birthday? My grandfather shakes his head in disbelief. You'd be surprised. When I lived in Boston, my neighbors brought in a small petting zoo for their son. It was an immense success, and the owner booked three more parties on the spot. Granted, they had fluffy bunnies, baby goats, sheep, and a pony, but we all have to start somewhere. Petting zoos. My grandfather shakes his head. At birthday parties. That can't be good for anyone, least of all those poor animals. It wasn't bad. They were getting petted, and the kids fed them treats. For a lot of children, this was the first time they'd seen a real sheep or rabbit. It's good for them. For city children, maybe. But who would care for something like that around here? We all grew up with 4-H, and most of the families around here either own their own farms or have a farmer in the family, Lex says. Way to stab me in the back, cuz. You'd be surprised. I've been putting some feelers out, and there's interest. Plus, I don't mind driving a bit. I think it's at least worth a shot. And if nothing else, we'll get more people to come to your shop and stay around. Who knows, they might end up buying more. Heck, we could even sell small bags of feed. I bet the kids would love it. And where do you plan on keeping these animals, my grandfather asks. In one of the barns, I guess. I hadn't thought too much about it. There was plenty of available space on the farm. How hard could it be? You guess? You're telling me you bought all these critters not only without talking to us about it, but didn't even set up space for them? Have I taught you nothing? My grandfather looks at me, and I can feel the disappointment wash over me. I figured we'd have plenty of empty stalls in the cow barn. I'd walk down there after I first got in touch with Becky about purchasing the animals. No, my grandfather turned and walked back toward the front of the house where my grandmother was entertaining Becky. Those animals could carry diseases. At the very least, we need to quarantine them away from anything else on the farm for 40 to 60 days, Lex explained. There's got to be somewhere on the farm to put them. This is a good idea. It'll bring more folks out here, and that's got to be good for the produce stand. I look at my cousin. Maybe. Let's see if we can talk Grandpa into it. He motions for me to walk ahead of him. I get it. This is my fight, but he'll have my back as much as he can. I'm not taking them back. Your grandson and I made a deal. They are his, and I have got to get on the road. I've got goats to milk and chickens to tend to, Becky says as we catch up with my grandfather. We could put the goats and the donkey in the old corn crib down the hill, and the rabbits and guineas can stay in their cages in the feed barn until we can come up with something more permanent, Lex suggests. I'll give you two months. If they don't pay for themselves by then, I want them gone. Understand? Grandpa stares at both of us, and I see Lex nod next to me. Understand, I say quickly, feeling ten years old. I turn to Becky. How do you want me to pay for these? PayPal? She shakes her head. Cash works. $450 as agreed, she says, holding out her hand. Does she seriously expect me to have that kind of money in my back pocket? I'll have to run out and get that, I say, feeling like a fool. I should have brought it up when we discussed this originally. Becky looks down at her watch, looking displeased. My grandfather throws up his arms and walks away toward the cow barn down the hill. 
Wait just a minute, my grandma says. She rushes into the house and returns, still wearing her half apron by the time we've finished unloading the last of the rabbit and guinea pig cages from the trailer. I'm going to need those back eventually, but you hang on to them until you can build your own. Becky hands me the last of the cages. It holds a female rabbit with five little babies. I appreciate that, I say before my grandmother pulls a handful of folded bills from her apron pocket and hands it to me. I counted it. It's $450 exactly, she says. I'm stunned. Where did you get that kind of cash? I say, the words flying out of my mouth before my brain catches up. My cheeks heat up when I realize what I've said. Lex behind me coughs. Not that it's any of your business, but I do pretty well for myself selling eggs. She smiles and winks. I love my grandma. It takes a lot to make her upset with you, and she loves her children and grandchildren unconditionally. Maybe it's to make up for the way grandpa behaves from time to time. You're selling eggs? Lex asks, his voice shooting up right along with his eyebrows. I have to bite my lip to keep from laughing. Unlike my cousin, I've known about my grandmother's egg business since I was barely taller than the fence posts. Of course. Have ever since I got my first flock when I was 12 years old. My father encouraged all of us to make a little pocket money. Pocket money? I look at the bills in my hand, giving it a quick count. $450 exactly. Most of it in 10 and $20 bills. No wonder I have such a hard time moving eggs on the farm stand, Lex murmurs under his breath. Oh no, that's all on you, not on me. I've had my customers for years and years. Our grandmother laughs and takes her leave from Becky before heading to the backyard to hang up laundry. Call me if you have questions about any of them. They are pretty easy to care for. Becky takes the money, not bothering to count it. She unties Rocky and hands me the rope before pulling out of the driveway. I stand there, stinky Rocky by my side, munching a bit of hay he pulled out of his previous owner's trailer. You're okay, there? Lex asks. Yeah, trying to figure out what to do next, I say. I hate to admit it, but I have no idea what I'm doing here. This seemed like a much better idea last week when I was looking at a bunch of cute pictures of bunnies and guinea pigs sitting in the grass munching on daisies. Chapter 4 Harrison I had no idea this was so much work. I leaned back against the warm wood of the small shed that has become the temporary home for the rabbits and guinea pigs. Lex takes a seat next to me on the bales of straw that are stored under the small overhang. He hands me a cold beer and cracks his own open. Where did this come from? I ask. I keep a six-pack in the old fridge in the milk barn. He grins and takes a long swig. I follow suit and have a taste myself. The ice-cold effervescent beverage rushes down my throat, cooling me down instantly. Keeping livestock is a lot more work than most people realize. And these guys are easy. Except for the goats. They are going to be a pain. Just wait until we let them out on pasture. Lex leans back and closes his eyes. He looks as tired as I feel. And I wouldn't have guessed feeding them would be so complicated. It had taken two trips to the feed store to get everything I needed to make sure everyone had a dinner that agreed with them. You really didn't look into this much at all, did you? Lex's tone is more amused than accusatory. I didn't. Thanks for saving my bacon this afternoon. More than once. Without Lex, I would have been lost. And who knows what would have happened to Rocky and the rest of the zoo. Not a problem. I don't know about the traveling zoo part, but having a few cute animals on the farm for kids to play with isn't a bad idea. I don't know about those goats, though. Rocky doesn't look like he's going to like anyone petting him. The bigger problem is that no one is going to want to get anywhere near him or his roommate. The second goat, also a billy, smelled just as bad. A good wash will help with that. For a few hours at least. Lex raises his bottle in salute. In other words, if I want them to be part of the petting zoo, I have to give them a bath every morning? I try to picture the scene in my head. 
It does not sound like fun, and after the way this has gone so far, I'm sure I'm gravely underestimating how hard it will be to groom a pair of boy goats. Pretty much. Or you can put them out to pasture. I'm not having them put down. If anything, I'll find them a new home. There is no way I'm letting anything happen to Rocky and Rambo. I never caught the second goat's name, but it seems appropriate. Good luck with that. Nothing harder than selling a pair of grown billies. You're not going to find any good takers. Lex sounds confident, and considering Becky had pretty much thrown the goats in as a bonus for buying the rodents, I don't doubt his assessment. Doesn't mean I'm not going to try, though. There's no way I'm letting them become goats too. I was serious about putting them on a pasture. Future pasture actually. There's a decent piece of land at the back of the property. Back where the land touches the old Lawrence place. I know what he's talking about. The creek runs through the parcel of land, but it's rocky and overgrown with shrubs and trees. It's also hard to get to, which is why our grandfather hasn't tried to turn it into pasture for his dairy cows. That's pretty rocky and completely overgrown, right? Perfect for goats. Those two will have that cleared out in a year and we can move some sheep in there, Lex says. I didn't know you were thinking about adding sheep. And I didn't know you were starting a petting zoo. Guess in a way we're both doing the same thing. Trying to find a way to expand and diversify to make sure the farm makes it into the next century. Lex rises and tips up the bottle of beer, finishing the last bit. I guess we are, I say, following his example. It hurts to get up. Those feed bags and cages did a number on my back, and I'm starting to wonder if I'm developing a hernia. You're all right there, old man? Lex asks. He's almost a year older than me, but I get his point. The sitting hasn't done me much good. My muscles are stiff, and I feel like a robot. Thankfully, I start to loosen up as we make our way up toward the farmhouse. I'll be fine. Not sure I'm cut out for this farmhand job though, I say. This was nothing. Wait until we get to work building cages and your zoo. I'm guessing you're planning on setting it up near the farm stand? Lex points to the small shed close to the road. There's a small strip of land that we mow up there. Enough space for a rabbit colony and a guinea pig village. Maybe a few chickens if Grandma can part with some of her prize hens. If not, I'll grab some chicks from the feed store. They seem to have plenty, and I'm sure Lex would welcome a few more egg layers to produce for his stand. I'll be ready to go in the morning. I'll draw up some plans tonight, I promise. Boys! Supper is ready. Go wash up and come eat, our grandmother calls from the porch. Lex falls into a jog, and I have to spend the last few ounces of energy I have, courtesy of the beer, to catch up. Will do, Lex calls. I'm calling first dibs on the shower. He kicks it into another gear and sprints up to the house. I fall back and slow to a stroll, taking in the sight of the setting sun. The beauty of this place keeps surprising me. And it is calm around here. Not quiet. Between the farm animals and the wildlife, there are plenty of sounds in the air, but it is calm. Nothing like the big cities where I've spent much of my childhood. And nothing like Boston where I'd gone to school and tried to carve a life out for myself and Bree. The noise of the traffic and people living their life 24-7 never stopped. Neither did the steady stream of planes flying over the small condo I shared with the girl I thought I'd marry and my best friend. How are your critters? Grandma asks when I stepped up on the porch. I didn't realize she was waiting for me. Everyone's taken care of and fed. I think they'll make it through their first night. I decide to take it one day at a time. Hopefully, tomorrow won't bring another trip to the feed store. That's good. Come sit with me for a minute until Lex is finished with his shower. She takes a seat in one of the old rocking chairs on the porch. I choose the one downwind from her and scoot it away a little to spare her the worst of the goat smell. From the wrinkling off her nose, I only half succeed. But she doesn't say anything, so there's that. I forgot to stop by the bank earlier, Grandma. I promise I'll get you your money first thing tomorrow morning. Don't worry about it. There's more where that came from. 
Selling eggs to the diner and a few other folks in town is good business. Don't tell Lex or your grandfather, she stage whispers with another wink. I appreciate that, but I'm going to pay you back. The whole idea for this is to help out around here. You mean that, don't you? Does that mean you plan on staying here? She asks. It's the first time since I showed up on her doorstep six months ago that she's asked me about my plans. Not for good. But I appreciate you taking me in, and I would like to do my part and maybe add something that will help Lex down the road. Farming was hard, and it was getting harder year after year. Well, we're glad to have you, and I think it's a good idea that the two of you are trying new things. She smiles and reaches over to pat my hand. She quickly retreats when she gets a good whiff of me and does her best to be discreet about wiping her hand on her apron. I'm not sure Grandpa agrees with you. He had made his opinion clear about both the petting zoo and the farm stand when he came to check on our progress a few hours ago. I haven't had a chance to tell him about the farm rental idea I've been working on. Somehow, I doubt it will go over well, considering how upset he's gotten over the addition of a few animals. He's a little stuck in his ways, but he wasn't always like that. Did you ever hear the story about how we started the dairy? She asks. I shake my head. I thought you'd always had cows. They've been here as long as I could remember, and unless I remember wrong, Grandpa would tell stories of having to milk before school when Lex and I complained about having to get up early during summer break. There's always been a milk cow or two on the farm. She looks down at the dairy barn. The lights are still on, which means my grandfather is still back there, working on getting his prize cows settled down for the night. But not the herd you have now? There were close to 50 milk cows in that barn. No. They had enough for their own household, but the money was in beef and corn. It had been that way for close to a hundred years. As long as your grandfather's family had the farm. Grandpa wanted to change things up, I guess. I sit up, giving Grandma my full attention. He did. And let's just say it went over about as well as your little enterprise did this afternoon. It took him a good six months to talk his parents into letting him add five more cows to the barn. We didn't have the dairy barn back then. We kept them in the shed where you put the goats and rabbits, Grandma says. I didn't realize the shed was that old. Oh, it's a good bit older than that. Before your grandfather started using it for the cows, they kept hay in there for the winter. What made Grandpa decide to get more cows? I ask. Your grandfather was good friends with the schoolteacher and the man who ran the old general store. Both of them assured him they could sell as much milk as he could produce. So your grandfather took every penny we had and bought those first few cows. You should have seen the look on your great-grandfather's face when he found out. Called him a fool for risking every penny he had. And he wasn't wrong. Grandma leans back and rocks in her chair, going quiet for a moment. Did something happen to the cows? I wondered if he'd used the wrong feed. I'd learned a bit today about what bloat could do to young rabbits. Maybe cows had the same issues. Oh, no. The cows were fine, and what good milkers they were. We got a good 15 gallons of milk in the spring. She smiled. Every day? I ask. I have no idea if that's a good yield or how much the current herd of dairy cows produce. Every day. And we milk them all by hand. Let me tell you, that was no piece of cake. Especially not when I was pregnant with your uncle and later your father. But we got it done. Filtered the milk, chilled it, and bottled it. The whole nine yards. That sounds like a lot of work. It was. Especially when it turned out, the school only needed two gallons a day and the general store didn't sell much more than that. We had to get creative, or all that milk was going to go to waste. And your grandfather wasn't about to let his father prove him wrong. We tried all sorts of things. We made ice cream and cheese and did okay. But what really did the trick was butter and bacon. She laughs when she sees the confused look on my face. We turned the cream into butter and sold it by the pound. It lasts a good while and for some reason, our meadows and the spring water the cows were drinking made the best butter in the area. 
people couldn't get enough of it. But that left us with gallons and gallons of skim milk. You know your grandfather. He doesn't like to see anything go to waste, and it turns out pigs love milk. Each spring he would get a few feeder pigs, fatten them up with vegetable scraps from the garden, a bit of grain, and the skim milk and we'd have them butchered in the fall. It was a nice change from the beef we usually have, and there was plenty left to sell. He ended up making a nice little profit his second year. And he added more cows. He did. We kept some of the calves and added some new lines. And here we are today. She stands and straightens her apron. Here we are, and I guess it's my turn to hit the shower. I get up as well and walk to the front door. Good idea. And, Harrison? I turn to look at my grandmother. Her wrinkled face is lit by the warm light from the lamps inside. Yes? Don't ever be afraid to start over or try something new. And tell your cousin the same. You guys keep trying new things. Times are changing, and the farm needs to change with it. It's good to have you back and nice to see the two of you working together. She walks around me and pushes open the door before vanishing in the direction of the kitchen. I will, I say into the emptiness of the low-lit porch before making my way upstairs to shower. Chapter 5 Olivia Hand me those starts, my mother says, pointing to a small tray of tomato plants. Here you go. I go back to mixing the light potting soil we are using to up-pot the tomato and pepper plants as well as a variety of herbs. My mother sells these to vegetable farmers in the area. What remains, she'll offer at the local farmer's market for the next few weeks. This is the busiest time of the year for her. The next two months will make or break the family business. And if I hadn't come home, she'd be doing it all by herself again, I realize. It's nice to have an extra pair of hands this year, my mother says, echoing my own thoughts. I forgot how much I like this. My hands are covered in warm earth. There's something about the smell and the feel of it that brings back childhood memories. I've been potting and planting for as long as I can remember. I remember standing on an apple crate to reach the old oak table we're still working at. Oh, please. I'd have to drag you out here and threaten to cut off your phone to get you to help me start seedlings. My mother smiles, but there's a hint of hurt in her voice. Somehow, I don't think it's because of my bratty teenage behavior back then. I liked it when I was little. Dad would let me moisten the soil and when we were done, he'd build a fire and we'd roast hot dogs out back. I can still smell the food roasting. I don't think anything had ever tasted as good as those dogs and the foil potatoes he'd cooked in the coals. Do you know why we started having dinner outside on big planting days like this when you helped? My mother asks. Her eyes are twinkling, the sadness gone from her voice. I shake my head. All I remember is that we've always done it that way. You would get so covered in mud and dirt we couldn't let you in the house to eat. And by the time we were done, everyone was too hungry to get you in the bath first. We'd eat, get the worst of the dried mud off you, and then I'd put you in the bath while Dad cleaned up and put out the fire. By the time I had you dried off and put into your PJs, you were usually sound asleep. She reaches over and caresses my cheek. I had no idea, I say. My voice is hoarse. You were little, and you had fun. And Dad did too. We all did. I'm glad we had those days. She turns and focuses on her work, but I know it's to hide her red eyes. We work quietly until we get all the tomatoes up potted. Where are you selling the plant starts these days? I ask as we walk to the front of the greenhouse to get the tiny little pepper plants that need larger pots as well. Still mostly growing for some of the produce farmers around here. No one else wants to mess with a greenhouse. They'd rather buy them from me and put them in the ground after the last frost. Billy at the feed store takes a good bit off my hands, and everything that's left goes to the farmers' markets. By the middle of April, these will all be gone. It's hard to believe looking at the thousands of little baby plants that line the shelves in the large greenhouse my mother keeps. I don't know how you do this all by yourself, I say, 
feeling guilty for leaving her and the town three years ago. I'd stuck around for a year after my father had passed away. Ran the farm with my mom. Hung out with my friends. Almost got myself engaged. Why? Are you offering to stay home? My mother asks. No. That's not what I meant. I know, honey. I'm just teasing. I do hope you'll make it back here more often, though. I'd love to come visit you in LA, but it's hard to get away with no one here to care for the plants or the place. My mother sets another tray of plants on the oak table and grabs a stack of larger pots. Have you thought about hiring some help or bringing on a partner? I ask. Now that I'm back home, I realize how much my mother is doing on her own. She's busy from sunup to long after sundown. These days it's her, who almost falls asleep over supper. The farm doesn't make enough. Maybe after I pay off your father's hospital bills, but for now, it's just me, myself, and I. Mom adds another scoop of potting soil to the pot she's working on. You don't mind? I ask. She doesn't sound bitter. Not at all. It's good to keep busy and things will slow down after these plant starts are sold. She slides a stack of empty pots my way. I get the hint and fill them with the last of the potting soil. Maybe you can hire someone next year, and until then I'll try to come home a little more often to help out around here. You don't have to do that, honey. I know you have a life out there. But that doesn't mean I don't enjoy having you around. Let's make the most of the time we have together. She wipes her hands on the bandana that's always hanging out of the back pocket of the denim overalls she wears when she's working on the farm. Which is most of the time other than church on Sunday or rare trips into town. I know I don't have to. I want to. And you're right. We should make the most of our time together. Why don't we have dinner at the diner tonight? My treat. I should be able to swing dinner and a few other treats with what's left in my bank account. My mom reaches over and wipes a bit of dirt from my cheek. Sorry, I must have got that on there earlier. Dinner sounds like a lovely idea, but there's bean soup left over. Before I can insist on dinner at the diner, my phone rings. We're going out, I say, looking at the screen. I send it to voicemail. Something important, my mother asks. I don't think so. Not a number I recognize. I'll make another batch of potting soil. I scoop topsoil into a large mixing bin before adding peat moss and perlite to lighten it up and make it easier for the tiny roots of the baby plants to make their way through the dirt. The specific mixture is a family secret and one of the reasons why everyone wants sprout farm plants for their vegetable gardens. My phone lights up with a voicemail notification. A few minutes later, it rings again. Same number. Persistent little bugger. Telemarketer? My mother asks. Probably. It's the best of the options. I don't recognize the area code. Wouldn't be the first time a bill collector catches up with me by calling my number repeatedly. It's why I don't pick up anymore unless I know the person calling me. My phone rings again. Another voicemail. I shake my head. I'm not wasting my time checking them. Instead, I silence the sound and shove the phone into the back pocket of my jeans before digging back into the dirt, making sure everything is mixed well. I haven't been to the diner in a while, my mother says out of the blue a little while later. I know. Dolores misses seeing you. I run into her at church all the time. That's not the same, and you know it. Why did you stop going over there for lunch? I ask. She keeps trying to set me up. My mom shrugs, but I can see the color rising in her cheeks. That's so sweet of her. It would be good for my mom to get out of there and meet someone. It's a little weird, but maybe Dolores is right to suggest it. There are plenty of single men in and around town who would be lucky to have my mother's company. It's too soon. Besides, I don't even remember how to do this. Do what? I ask and instantly wish I hadn't. I hope this isn't going to be a talk about the birds and the bees. Have someone ask me out.
date. It's a ridiculous idea. She shoves a tray of plants to the side. It would have toppled off over if I hadn't caught the tray. You start with coffee. You can meet them at the diner so Dolores can keep an eye on you and let you know what she thinks. You share a cup of coffee, and if it doesn't work out, no harm no foul. Doesn't cost you more than a dollar or two and fifteen minutes of your time. I perfected the coffee date in my time in L.A. Not that it's done me much good. It did, however, lead me to a script that was basically written for Amy. If I get the first scoop on her return to the screen, I'll be golden. And if I play my cards right, I might even end up managing her career. I could be an agent. Every other person I've met in my time in the City of Angels has been either a screenwriter or an agent. There's more of them than actors in the land of milk and honey. I'll think about it, my mom says when my phone beeps. I guess I should check this. I pull my phone out. It's a text message from the same number that's been calling. It's Harrison from the diner yesterday. Trying to get in touch. Oh. I feel like a jerk, sending all his calls to voicemail. Not a telemarketer, I guess, my mom says with a smile. No. Someone I met at the diner. I should probably call him back. Go ahead and take your time. I'll finish up over here. She takes the tub of potting soil I've mixed and sets it on the oak table. I stare at my phone. I should call Harrison back. Maybe the coffee has done more damage to his laptop than he realized at first. Sighing, I hit the call back button. Liv? The one and only. Sorry I missed your calls. I've been working. I was beginning to think I had the wrong number, Harrison says. Someone is hammering in the background. Or that I was ghosting you. I wasn't. I had my hands covered in dirt. I take a few steps toward the front end of the greenhouse to give my mom a little more space to move around. I figured you'd be working on another script, he says, sounding surprised. I didn't realize he'd read any of the pages I had tossed in his direction during our encounter. I'm helping my mom in the greenhouse. That sounds like more fun than building rabbit hutches, he says. The hammering continues. It's not bad, I agree. Listen, I have to get back to work in a minute. Would you like to meet me for dinner tonight? The diner, he asks. The hammering stops and is replaced by the sound of a donkey raising an alarm. Sorry, I'm having dinner with my mom. But I could meet you for a drink at the tipsy cow after. Sounds like a plan. Eight o'clock, he asks. I'll meet you there. I hang up the phone and wonder what I've gotten myself into. He didn't mention his computer, but if it's fried and he expects me to replace it, I'm going to have to come up with some extra cash fast. My mom looks at me when I walk back to the table to help her with the last tray of plants. She doesn't say a word, but curiosity is written across her face. We met at the diner. I dumped my coffee all over Harrison's laptop. We're meeting at the bar tonight to talk. I hope I didn't completely ruin it. Harrison? Harrison Clark, she asks. Cold dread washes over me. I don't know his last name. Tall, dirty blonde hair, broad shoulders? Yes. My voice is shaky, and I have to lean on the table for support. The solid oak, warm from the sun and the protection of the greenhouse steadies me. That's Lex's cousin. He's been in town for a couple of months. He's helping out around the farm. And he's the last person I should be meeting for a beer. What if Lex tags along? Suddenly, having to buy a new laptop seems like the least of my problems. Chapter 6 Harrison I spot her the moment I walk into the door. Somehow, I'm not surprised that she beat me here, even though I'm right on time. I like that in a girl. Nothing like Bree, who made me wait at least half an hour whenever I picked her up to go out. Liv doesn't see me walk in. She's sitting at the bar, chatting with Amy, the new owner. 
Let me know if you want to wait a few tables for old time's sake, Amy says as I walk up. I might take you up on that, Liz says. She hasn't spotted me yet. Hey, I was wondering if you've been thinking of doing another TV show or movie anytime soon. I have my hands full here. My days as an actress are over. Not even for the right script? Liv asks. What can I get you? Amy asks when I take a seat at the bar. Liv turns, a smile spreading across her face. You made it. I'll take a beer. Coors Light, if you have it. I need a moment to compose myself. Those steel blue eyes of Liv's get me every time. Coming right up. Are you guys good here, or do you want to move to one of the tables in the back? Amy asks, motioning to one of the quieter corners of the bar. Not that it's busy. It's a weeknight after all. Do you play darts? I ask Liv. A little, she says, hopping off the stool and grabbing her beer. Don't let her hustle you, Amy warns. My eyes are on Liv, who's strutting to the board, looking better than anyone should in faded jeans and a pair of old leather boots. A tight t-shirt with the local high school's name printed across the back stretches in all the right places. I'll do my best, I say, taking the ice-cold course she hands me. I take a sip to soothe the dry and burning feeling in my mouth and throat. I need to get my head in the game if I want to avoid looking like an idiot. How do you want to play? Around the world, legs. Four points? Liv pulls the darts from the board and hands me a set. Around the world works to warm up. It's been a while since I've played, but Amy has nothing to worry about. I'd supplemented my income throughout college playing pool and darts. There was no way Liv would get the better of me unless I decided to let her win. Sounds good. Do you want to start? She takes a sip of her beer and sits it down on the table closest to the board. Ladies first. My mom raised me right, and my grandma would have my hide if I made Liv flip for it. Suit yourself. I know she's serious before the first dart leaves her hand. Liv has the posture of a good dart player and hits her targets without a problem. She takes the numbers in order, knocking out one through four before stepping aside to give me my turn. I follow suit, almost missing number three. You play a lot? She asks when I step up to pull my darts from the board. Not in a while. I did in college. You? I ask. I used to work here after high school. We play when it was slow and when someone new rolled in, she shrugs and hits the next four numbers in a row. Not to be outdone, I follow suit. I miss number seven but hit it right in the center on my second try. What's all that talk about Amy making a movie? You overhead that? She misses her next number and turns to glare at me. You guys were talking when I walked in. I shrug and take a seat. I came across this script that would be perfect for her comeback. Liv rolls her shoulders and quickly hits the next three numbers. She's acted before? What rock did you live under? She's the town's biggest celebrity and would have made it big with a TV show if things didn't blow up. Liv grabs her phone from her back pocket and pulls up an article about a show I'd never heard of. I scan the story. Some rumor about preferential treatment by the producer or something. I recognize the guy in the picture with her. I look up. He's sitting at the end of the bar, writing in a notebook. And you think she should get back into acting? I ask. Absolutely. Amy is amazing. You should have seen her in high school or some of those commercials she's done. And this script I've found is perfect for her. It's why I'm here. Liv blushes, and I get the feeling she shared more than she meant to. She looks happy here, and from what I've heard, she owns the bar. I shrug and get up, trying to clear my head so I don't miss again. That's what she said, but this is too good to pass up. She's leaning against the table, the beer back in her hand. I throw my darts, hitting each target. The game is tied. Are you acting as well? Oh no. That's not my thing. I freeze in front of a crowd or a camera. I love the industry though. That's why I moved out to LA. I've been working as a publicist. 
and you're trying to land Amy as a client. It was starting to all make sense. Something like that. It's worth a shot. She takes her turn and throws, missing two shots in a row. She's off her game. That's what brought you home. I ask. That and seeing my mom. Getting a break from LA traffic is a bonus. The rest of her throws hit the mark. I toy with the idea of missing on purpose to even the score again and then dismiss it. Liv doesn't need my help and would probably call me out for it. Where did you call home before the wind blew you here? She asks. I can't tell if it's an attempt to throw me off my game or if she's genuinely interested. If it is an act, she's doing a pretty fine job. I grew up all over the place. My family moved around a lot. I spent the last few years in Boston. I missed the mark on my next throw. I'm still ahead by one. A couple of good throws, and I will win the game. College, she guesses. Grad school at Boston College. Texas and M before that. High school was all over Europe and North Africa. I hope it's enough of a hook to make her change the topic. The last thing I want to do is relive my Boston days. That must have been nice. Army brat? It had its moments, and no. My dad never liked staying in the same place for too long, and his business was pretty flexible so we kept moving from town to town and country to country. My mom's family is in Egypt, and we spent time visiting family there. That explains it, she says before landing the last of her darts. Explains what? I wait for her to say something about my olive complexion or my eyes. It's not usually much of an issue overseas, but for some reason in the States my mixed heritage is a big deal. It's one of the reasons my parents never spent much time on this side of the Atlantic. That and the fact that my father and grandfather don't exactly see eye to eye. Your accent. It isn't Southern and not quite like anything else I've heard. Makes sense that you spent most of your time growing up overseas. She sits down and motions for me to throw the last four of my darts. People usually think I'm Cajun or Creole. I throw the first of the darts and hit my target perfectly. The next one is a little off to the right, but it makes it. Two more hits, and I'll win. I don't hear it, and my landlord is from the bayou. She kicks out the chair across from her and puts her boots on it. I throw the next dart, and it's another hit. I can feel my confidence rising and don't even try to keep the grin off my face. How do you feel about hikes? Why? Her eyes are on the dartboard, not on me. She's as anxious to finish this game as I am. There's a trail along one of the bigger creeks that leads up into the hills that I've been meaning to check out. I throw and know the moment it leaves my hand that it's off its mark. Instead of landing on the skinny segment of number 20, I hit the center of the bullseye. That's what I get for trying to show off. You did that on purpose. Liv jumps up and walks up to the board. I swear I didn't. I was playing to win. Sort of. Honestly, I don't mind the tie. I don't believe you. No one hits the bullseye shooting for 20. She shakes her head and pulls the darts from the board, handing them to me. Rematch? I ask. Liv shakes her head. I need to head back in a few. I promised my mom to get up early and help with chores around the farm. Does that mean no time for hikes? Or if that's not your thing, that's okay too. I should warn you. I have a tendency to get lost. I quickly throw all eight darts into the board, creating a nice little circle around the outer bullseye. Liv's eyebrows shoot up as she watches me. I like a good hike, and it sounds like you're in desperate need of a walking buddy. Despite the L.A. look, I'm a country girl at heart, and I know my way around a trail with a compass. I think I know the one you're talking about. It leads up to an abandoned homestead. That's the one. I was thinking Sunday. The weather is supposed to be pretty good. I'm hoping we'll have most of the petting zoo finished by then, and even if we don't, I'm sure Lex will be ready for a break by then. Let's do it, she says putting her feet back on the floor and sitting up to drown the last of her beer. I stand up when she does. I'll pick you up bright and early. That way, 
We'll get through most of the hike before it gets too hot. Does six o'clock work for you? She swallows hard before plastering a sweet smile on her face. Bring coffee. Not a morning person. I file that bit of information away for later. Chapter 7 Olivia I don't know about this. We could have had soup and sandwiches at home. Mom sits in the car, her seat belt still buckled. Don't be silly. It's good to get out, and you haven't seen Dolores in ages. Besides, I've been looking forward to a bowl of her chicken and dumplings all week. I open my door and hop out of the car before my mom can try to talk herself out of this. It had taken two days and more cajoling than I had expected to get her to go out to dinner in the first place. I think she's spending way too much time by herself, working on the house or in the greenhouse. She needs friends. Social interaction. And I'm going to do what I can to drag her out while I'm in town. Just a quick bite. I want to sort through my seeds for the summer vegetables. It's almost time to plant squash and zucchini. My mom follows me into the diner. Dolores spots us the moment we walk in the door. Ruth. It's been ages. I was starting to think you've grown tired of my cooking. Never. My mom laughs and gives Dolores a quick hug. Sit anywhere you like. It's pretty quiet tonight. We don't get much business on a Thursday afternoon. Dolores hands us two menus and promises to be right with us before rushing back to the kitchen. Is this why you wanted to come here early? You knew there wasn't much going on? I ask as we seat ourselves in the booth my mother chooses. It's tucked away in a corner in the back of the restaurant. I don't know what you're talking about. I was hungry, and we didn't have lunch. We had sandwiches three hours ago, I remind her. That was a snack. Besides, I told you, I need to go through the seeds for the summer garden and see if there's anything I need to order before everyone sells out. Mom opens the menu and hides behind it. Okay. I'm getting hungry too. What looks good? I ask, scanning my own menu. I don't see the chicken and dumplings I'm craving. What can I get y'all today? Dolores asks, setting two glasses of sweet tea in front of us. Mine has a straw and a slice of lemon, and my mother's doesn't. She knows us well. I was hoping for a bowl of chicken and dumplings, but I don't see it on the menu, I say. Sorry, hun. That's the Tuesday special. Today, we're having pork chops, mashed potatoes, and farm-fresh roasted asparagus, Dolores says. That sounds delicious. I'll take that with a small side salad, please. My mother closes her menu. I scan the dishes one last time. I'll have the grilled chicken salad with honey mustard dressing. Great choice. That one's my favorite. We make the dressing in-house. Dolores takes our menus and rushes off to put in the order. How much of a garden are you growing this year? I ask my mother. The usual. Enough to fill the pantry and freezer and sell at the farmer's market through fall. There should be plenty for you to take home to California with you if you come for another visit. My mother's eyes are darting to the windows and door every few seconds. Are you expecting someone? I ask. No, what makes you say that? She pulls her glass toward herself, stirs the tea with a spoon. The ice cubes clink against each other. Because you keep looking up. What's going on? I can't shake the feeling that something's wrong and wish she'd tell me about it. There is nothing wrong. I just like to look around. Mom stops stirring her tea, sits back, and folds her arms across her chest. We both look up when Dolores approaches the table, carrying a basket of biscuits and a dish of butter. This should tide you over until the food comes out. Shouldn't be long. I have your pork chops cooking already, she says, looking at my mom before placing the biscuits in front of me. They are hot from the oven and smell amazing. My stomach growls loudly. I thought you weren't hungry yet, mom says, smiling and looking more relaxed than she had a moment ago. I was wrong. 
I pick up a biscuit and cut into it. It's light and fluffy. The butter practically melts into it, and it is all I can do not to moan when I take that first, delicious bite. Enjoy, you too. I'm going to run back to the kitchen. We're a little shorthanded today. I'll get you, if someone walks in, my mom says, before Dolores rushes off. Thanks, hun. Mom and I talk about her garden, the greenhouse, and the latest town gossip until she comes back, a large plate in each hand. This looks amazing. The salad is huge, topped with plenty of grilled chicken, sliced cucumber, shredded carrot, and grape tomatoes. Orange slices line the plate and the dressing is on the side, the way I like it. Thanks. It tastes even better than it looks. I hired a new chef, and he's worth his weight in gold, Dolores says, setting the second plate in front of my mother. Anyone I know, she asks. Dave's cousin, Walter. Dolores says, before telling us to enjoy our meal and heading back to the kitchen. You know this Walter guy? I ask after she leaves. What makes you think that? That look on your face. I point at her, with my fork, before spearing a piece of chicken and popping it into my mouth. It tastes even better than it looks. We met at church, and he keeps asking me out. Mom cuts into her pork chop and eats quickly. That's what you're worried about? That he might come out here and try to talk to you? I ask, my eyes trained on my mother's face. Something like that. I keep telling him that I'm not interested. But he's not getting the point? That's harassment. I push back my chair, ready to storm into Dolores's kitchen. That's not quite it. I keep telling him that it's not a good time. Her eyes are down on her plate. She's cutting her pork chop into bites small enough for a toddler. Mom, do you like him? I ask, surprised. Her cheeks color, and she doesn't look up at me. Maybe. He has kind eyes. How is everything? Dolores asks. I look up, surprised. I didn't notice her approach. She's holding a cup of coffee. It's delicious, my mother says quickly, spearing up several pieces of meat, adding a bit of mashed potato, before popping it into her mouth. I'm glad. Mind if I sit for a spell? Everything is under control in the kitchen, and I'd love to catch up. Unless the two of you would rather. Please do, I say quickly before my mom can finish chewing. How long has Walter been working for you? Let me think. Two or three months? It's been a little while. Such a nice guy. Dolores sits down and takes a sip of her coffee. He has family in town? I ask, hoping that will get Dolores talking about him. He's kin with the Kilcher family, but didn't grow up around here. From what I hear, he went through a nasty divorce last year and came here for a change of pace. Dolores puts her cup down. That didn't sound good. I'd have to make it a point to check the guy out and see what I could find out about that divorce of his. The last thing I need is for my mother to fall in with someone who doesn't treat her right. On the plus side, Dolores seems to like him, and from what I can tell, she's a good judge of character. How about you? Enjoying your time back in town? I'm sure you have plenty of friends to catch up with, Dolores says. Honestly, there aren't too many of them left. I ran into Amy last night at the bar though. We had a nice chat. Not as good as I'd hoped, but it had been a start. What about Lex? Did you two run into each other yet? Dolores asks. She's been avoiding him, my mother says. I have not. I didn't drive out to the farm, that's all. Besides, with the way we ended stuff, it may be better if we don't see much of each other. It hadn't been an easy breakup when I told him I was moving out to LA. The last thing I needed was to give him a false sense of hope that we'd pick up where we left off two years ago. He's been working with his cousin, Harrison. You've met him. He's the young gentleman you dumped your coffee on. Dolores turns to my mother. She claims it was an accident, but I'm not so sure. Have you met Harrison? Nice-looking young man. 
My mom shakes her head. I haven't, but Olivia seems smitten. The two went out for drinks. The smile on her face matches that of Dolores. Can you two stop? There's nothing going on. We're friends. That's all. Oh, just friends. That's why you're seeing him again on Sunday? My mother's eyes are twinkling. She's enjoying this. We're going for a hike. Friends can hike together. Besides, I didn't know he was Lex's cousin when we met, and after the mess I made of his laptop, I owe him. The least I can do is make sure he doesn't get lost out in the woods, I say. Are you sure that's a good idea? There's a front moving through Sunday afternoon that could bring some pretty bad weather. Dolores's eyes are drawn together, frown lines forming on her forehead. We're leaving bright and early, right after sunrise. We should be back home long before the weather turns. It was the only bright spot about this insanely early start time. That and the fact that it wouldn't get too hot on the first part of the hike when we'd be out in the open. Be careful and check on the weather before you leave, Dolores warns. She gets up and leaves when a group of diners arrives. Mom and I are both quiet on the drive home. I wonder if she's worried that I'll bring up this Walter guy again. Have you heard from Lex since you've left? Mom asks when I pull into our street. I was wrong. It wasn't Walter who's been on her mind the past few minutes. We texted for a while when I first moved. After that, I'd gotten the occasional message or email, but nothing in a while. The way the two of you ended things. She doesn't finish, and I don't prompt her. This isn't a conversation I want to have right now. How do you think he'll react when he finds out that you're seeing Harrison, she asks. I'm not seeing. Okay. What do you think he'll do when he finds out you and Harrison are friends? Did he tell him yet? I don't know. On both counts. Harrison and I barely know each other. I have no idea if he brought this up with his cousin, or if he even knows Lex and I dated all through high school. I promise myself to bring the topic up during our hike. Don't hurt the boy. From what I can tell, he still has pretty strong feelings for you. So unless things between you and this Harrison are getting serious. I pull into the driveway and head up toward the small house that's been home for as long as I can remember. It's not getting serious. I'm only in town for a little while. Okay. Just be kind. To both of them. My mother gets out the moment the car stops. I follow close behind. I can hear Marshall's excited barks before I step on the porch. He's ready to be let out. Mom picks up a cardboard box and hands it to me. This is for you. The package is from the print company and is larger than I expected. Marshall shoots out the door the moment my mom unlocks it. He's running around the front yard in circles. I follow my mother inside and sit it on the kitchen table before walking back out to check on my dog. What did you order? Anything fun? Mom asks when we make it back inside. Marshall heads straight for his water dish. Work-related. I had a script printed out. I hand her one of the binders. This is nice. But what are you doing with it here, she asks, thumbing through the pages. I think it's perfect for Amy. I thought she retired from acting and took over the bar, my mom says, distracted. She is reading the first scene of the romantic comedy script a friend of mine in L.A. wrote. She did. I'm hoping to talk her into coming back. Amy didn't seem too excited about the idea when we talked last night, but Leo seemed interested in at least seeing the script. This is good, she says, walking off with the binder, still reading as she makes her way to the living room. Chapter 8 Harrison Breakfast is ready. Grandma stands at the bottom of the stairs, banging a pot with a wooden spoon like every morning. It makes me miss the alarm on my phone. I run into Lex when I make my way out the door of the bedroom that's been mine since I was six. Back in the day it was my dad's. His train set still sits in a trunk along with a few other toys. 
The only one my dad cares about is the Rock'em Sock'em robots he played with his older brother, Lex's dad. Better get down there, Lex says when she bangs the pot again. He isn't kidding. There's no late breakfast on the farm. If you don't show up when it's ready, you're out of luck until lunchtime. We race down the stairs, pushing each other as we make our way into the kitchen. It earns us a stern look from my grandfather, who's sitting at the table, eating his bacon and eggs. Get some coffee and sit down. Your eggs are ready. Grandma pulls the pan from the stove and dishes a healthy serving of scrambled eggs on two plates before adding bacon and sausage. She puts them on the table before going back to the stove to fix her own breakfast. The woman never stops. Yes, ma'am, we both say. Lex pulls two cups from the cabinet and pours us each a cup. I take mine black and carry it to my seat at the kitchen table. A basket of made-from-scratch biscuits sits in the center, along with the Tupperware salt and pepper shakers that have been there for as long as I can remember. They must be indestructible. What are you two up to today? Grandpa asks when Lex joins me. We're finishing up the last of the rabbit hutches, and then we thought we'd get to work on the guinea pig village, I say before taking a sip of the coffee. It's hot and strong like it is every morning. Lex pours a healthy swig of fresh cream into his cup and joins us at the table. Shouldn't take too long. All we need is a couple of pieces of pine and some wire fencing. Bit of paint, some pebbles from the creek, and a few plants, and we'll be good to go. The kids will love it. Waste of time and feed, if you ask me. Grandpa cuts one of his biscuits in half and adds a couple of slices of thick bacon and a squirt of mustard. Oh, let them have their fun. And who knows, it might work out better than you think. Your father thought more milk cows would be a waste of time and look how that's worked out for us. Grandma brings her own plate to the table and sits down with us. As long as you keep up with the rest of the chores. We will, I promise. It's going to make for some long days, but it will be worth it. I'm determined to leave this place in better shape to face the future. Everyone eats quietly for a few minutes. There's nothing like food fresh from the farm. I'm going to miss this when I eventually move on. For now, I enjoy my grandmother's famous biscuits, eggs from the backyard flock, and bacon and sausage that come from a farm a few miles down the road. Have you ever thought about getting pigs again? I ask my grandfather. How do you know about that? We had some for a while, back after the war. They are hard on the land, digging up everything and making a huge mess. It's easier to let Doug raise them. He pops the last of his biscuit into his mouth and washes it down with more coffee. And they would get out of their pen, scaring the cows. I don't miss having them around. You think those goats of yours are smelly? Pigs are worse, my grandmother adds, shaking her head. There's some scrap wood and wire in the shed that you're welcome to use. You too know where the tools are. Make sure everything is put back before you call it a day. Grandpa gets up and takes his cup and plate to the sink. I think he's starting to come around to your petting zoo. Lex grins and takes another big bite of eggs and sausage. I think you're right. For what it's worth, I think it's a lovely idea. I can't wait to see how it turns out, and those little critters are growing on me. Even the goats. To everyone's surprise, my grandmother has taken a liking to the two billies, hosing them off, and feeding them scraps from the kitchen garden. Thanks, Grandma. I get up and kiss her on the cheek, taking Lex's and my plate to the sink. I turn on the faucet and get to work washing the breakfast dishes. You don't have to do that, Grandma says. I know but my mama raised me to help out around the kitchen. Sit back down and enjoy your breakfast, I say as sternly as I can. He's right. I'll dry. Lex gets up and pours her another cup of coffee before grabbing the kitchen towel that hangs on the oven door. All right, then. I could get used to this. Grandma pours a bit more cream into her coffee and sits back to watch the two of us work. Did you hear that Olivia is back in town? Lex makes an indiscernible sound under his breath. Your ex? I ask. I've never met the woman who broke my cousin's heart, but I've heard stories. 
From the sound of it, she did quite the number on him, leaving town right before he could propose. That's the one. He dries the next plate so aggressively, I'm tempted to grab it from him. I think that one's dry, Grandma says. Are you going to go see her? I ask, scrubbing the last of the stuck-on egg from the cast-iron skillet that's been in my family forever. Grandma claims it dates back to the Civil War, but I have my doubts. It's old and well-seasoned, though, and works better than any non-stick pan I've come across. You should. I think it would be good for the two of you to have a talk. Call her. Grandma gets up and hands me her plate. She takes the washed cast iron and puts it back on the stove to dry out before applying a bit of oil and pushing it to the back of the stove, ready for the next meal. I don't think that's a good idea, Grandma. Besides, I doubt she's here for long. She made it very clear that this is the last place she wants to live. Lex tosses the towel on the counter and stomps out. He's not taking it well, is he? I ask, draining the dish water. No, he isn't. Hasn't been since she left. Those two belong together. I hope she's realized what she's given up and is back for good. My grandmother sighs and grabs the broom. She hums under her breath as she sweeps. You really think so? I know so. And you would too if you'd ever seen those two lovebirds together. Now get out of here and let me finish cleaning up. She shoes me out the door with the broom. It isn't until I step off the porch and walk down the drive that it occurs to me that my cousin has been quite the recluse the past few days. Usually, he can't wait to head into town to grab a beer at the Tipsy Cow. Chapter 9 Harrison Hand me that roll of hardware cloth, will you? Lex looks at me across the latest rabbit hutch we've been building. It's nothing like the cute colony setup I'd envisioned initially. A bit of research had nixed the idea. Unfortunately, rabbits and guinea pigs don't make the best roommates. Here you go. I hold down the cloth while he hammers it into the wooden frame we built earlier this morning. It's close to noon, and the temperature's steadily rising. Sorry your colony setup for the rabbits didn't work out. Lex pounds in the last of the nails and we raise the new hutch, carrying it into place on the back side of what will be the guinea pig village. That's okay. I should have realized that the guineas and bunnies don't get along. And when I found out how much rabbits like to dig and what it would have taken to set up an enclosure on the ground that they couldn't tunnel out of, I ditched the idea and gone back to the drawing board. The two-story hutch design that gave each rabbit space to hop around in the grass, protected by hardware cloth on all sides, was the better option. And it would keep the rabbits from doing what rabbits did best, which apparently was multiplying. Yeah, wouldn't want any territorial fights in front of the kids, Lex said. I know what he's thinking. We wouldn't want the males and females to put on a show either. There's a limit to how much nature we want to expose the children to. I hope the guinea pigs are more discreet. So far, they seem to enjoy the makeshift pen we've set up for them with scrap pieces of chicken wire. That's a nice piece of craftsmanship, my grandfather says. By the surprised look on Lex's face, he didn't notice him walk up either. Thanks. Two more to go, and we can move on to the next project. Lex points to the chicken wire contraption. You're going to need some better protection from predators. A hawk will grab one of those little things and carry it off as an afternoon snack. Grandpa looks up and points at a bird circling the farm overhead. I'd noticed it as well, and it wasn't the first one. Each time, the guineas would squeak and seek cover under whatever they could find. We'll get it done before nightfall, Lex said, his voice sounding more confident than I feel. As long as you get the stalls mucked out before dinner, that's fine with me. Holler if you need an extra pair of hands. He strolls off into the direction of the farmhouse. I think he's starting to come around to this, I say, motioning in the direction of the farm stand Lex put up. Maybe. Listen, if this draws in more people, how would you feel about helping me build an actual little farm store to replace the produce stand? Nothing fancy, but a bit more space to expand our offering. Lex raises up and wipes the sweat off his brow. I think that sounds like a great idea. What did you have in mind? 
I have some plans drawn up. I'll show you after lunch. Basically, I'd like to have a cooler and more shelving for canned and preserved stuff. I talked to a couple of farmers around town, and there seems to be interest on their end if we can provide a large enough customer base. It's the happiest and most excited I've seen Lex in weeks. Anything I can do to help, I promise. I tell him about my idea of adding one or two little rental cottages on the property while we work on the frame for the next hutch. Could be risky. It'll take some money to get those cabins built. Money neither one of us has right now, including grandma and grandpa. I know better than to suggest that my father could bankroll the enterprise without a problem. We can bootstrap it. I've been looking into some of the small container homes. If we do most of the work ourselves. Lex shrugs. Another income stream wouldn't be a bad idea. I've been looking into growing custom lettuce blends and micro greens. If you ask me, the only way forward is to experiment with different things and see what's profitable. You'd sell those greens at the farm stand? Yes, and to restaurants around the area. I talked to a couple of places in Greenville and Spartanburg. The chefs there seem interested and willing to pay a bit more than retail for good quality. His eyes are gleaming with excitement. I'm guessing it wouldn't take much to get that up and running. And really, Atlanta and Charlotte are both close enough to ship produce the same day. My mind is reeling with the possibilities this venture opens up. Absolutely. And we can funnel profits into building the first of your cabins, he says. After we build the farm store. Baby steps. The farm wasn't built in a day or a year, and neither will the improvements that will help grandma and grandpa enjoy their golden years. Who knows, maybe we can talk grandma into bankrolling the build with her egg money. Lex winks, but after the other day, I'm not so sure that's a joke. There's no telling how much cash she has stuffed under that mattress of hers. Worth a try. I'll talk to her next time I catch her alone, I promise. Deal. Does that mean you're planning on sticking around for good, then? Lex asks. Not for good, no. But I like the idea of adding something to this place. Being a part of the family legacy. It's hard to explain why this place is so important to me. Maybe because it's the closest thing I have to a home. A connection to my roots. I get that. It's why I'm working so hard, trying everything I can to keep this place going. It's nowhere near as profitable as those large agro-industry places out in the Midlands, but it's home. In other words, cows and corn aren't going to do it going forward, are they? I read enough of the agricultural magazines and trade papers our grandfather has lying around everywhere to know commercial agriculture is a cutthroat business with slim margins. The only way to continue to make it work is to scale up and automate as much as possible. They are not. If you ask me, the key is to niche down and find your local market. Go back to the way things were run a hundred years ago. Grow some produce, keep a couple of pigs, some sheep, and raise it all in a natural, ethical way. There are people out there willing to pay for something like that. Have you seen how much ethically raised pork goes for these days? Lex shakes his head. Sounds to me like we have our work cut out for us. I get back to sawing the next piece of lumber. None of those dreams will become reality if we can't finish today's projects first. We do, but it'll be worth it. I'd love to turn this place into something we can pass down to the next generation. Lex grins, and it's good to hear that he hasn't completely given up on finding love and starting a family of his own. If there is one. Neither one of you seems to be in a hurry to settle down and give me some great grandkids. Grandma hands us each a tall glass of lemonade. Rocky, the goat, is following close behind. Thanks, we say in unison before downing the ice-cold, sweet liquid. Lunch will be ready in an hour. Don't be late, she says before walking back to the house, an empty glass in each hand. We can hear her laughter when the billy goat gently bumps her rear end. From the looks of it, he wants her to walk faster up the hill toward the house. We're going to have to start putting bells on them, Lex mumbles under his breath. That or the two of us have to stop getting lost in our thoughts and dreams of the future. She's not wrong, though. 
Who are we doing all this work for if neither one of us is finding the one? I ask. An image of a certain dark-haired beauty with a tendency to drop things pops into my mind. Because we're hopeless fools? Lex asks. Does that mean you're going to talk to this Olivia girl? The one that got away? I thought about it, but at the end of the day, it was her decision. I don't think she came back because of me. Probably just a short visit to see her mom. Trying not to get your hopes up, I get it. I nail in the next board with more force than necessary. Things didn't end well for you in Boston, did they? It's the first time Lex has asked me a direct question about my reason for coming to the farm. I dated this girl all through college. I thought Bree was the one. Even told my mom about her. I swallow and try to block the flashes of good memories that appear uncalled. What happened? She decided to move out west, too. Worse. I walked in on her and my best friend. The guy I'd trusted. The man I'd built a business with. We were in the middle of securing a loan for a development near Boston College that would have made both of us a small fortune. Condos, restaurants, small retail, with public transport to downtown and the college. Good neighborhood, good schools. We couldn't believe our luck when we came across the piece of land. Now it would be someone else's dream, and I was building a petting zoo and a couple of cottages on my family's farm instead. Ouch! No wonder you ran off. If you want to go find the guy, give me the word. We can drive up to Boston tonight. Lex pounded his fist in his hand. I laugh. Partially, because the idea of beating up Todd is absurd, but also because Lex is dead serious. He'd do it if I asked. Heck, sounds like I don't even have to ask. I put my arm around his shoulder. I appreciate it, but he's not worth it. Neither one of them is. Let me know if you change your mind, Lex says before we both get back to pounding nails. There you go, Ginger. Enjoy your new home. I pick up the last of the rabbits and put her into her new hutch. She's a pretty bunny with a reddish-brown color and the friendliest of the bunch. She hops around, her nose and whiskers twitching as she checks out the new digs. Ginger? Lex asks. We're both crouched down, watching the bunnies hop around in the hutches we spent all morning building. From that TV show Grandma used to make us watch about the people stranded on an island. It had been a daily staple one summer I spent on the farm. She'd owned the entire first season on DVD and made us watch it each afternoon when it was too hot to do anything outside. Oh, the stunning redhead? I nod. This one seems as outgoing as the TV show character. As much as you can say that about a rabbit. I remember feeling bad for the skipper and Gilligan, Lex says. Because they ended up alone on the show? You'd think at least one of them would end up with Ginger or Mary Ann, eventually. You remember that show a lot more than I do, but yes, I guess. Lex pulls some dandelion leaves and feeds them to Ginger. She's a big fan. The green leaf quickly vanishes, and she's ready for more. It isn't a lot of fun to start over on this whole relationship thing, is it? Especially not when you thought you had found the one. Makes you wonder if it's all worth it. He pulls a handful of leaves and opens the door to the hutch to put them on the inside, petting Ginger while she's happily chowing away. Of course it is. Look at Grandma and Grandpa. Don't you want something like that? I know I do. I want what they have or, better, what my parents have. An openly affectionate relationship. Someone on my side who supports me no matter what. Someone to grow old with. I thought I had it, he says, his voice thick with emotion. Then go find her. Talk to her. Maybe Grandma is right, and she misses you and wants you back. And if she doesn't, at least you'll get some closure. Maybe that's what he needs to be able to move on. I'll think about it. Let me guess. That means you'll leave it up to Faith, and if you happen to run into her in town, it's meant to be? I shake my head. Lex has never been the one to take charge about anything outside the farm. Sounds about right. Let's just see what happens. Ready to get cracking on this guinea pig village of yours? 
he pulls a set of sketches out of his back pocket that we worked on the night before. If we can pull this off, it's going to be epic. Chapter 10 Olivia Olivia? I pull the covers over my head when mom flicks the overhead light on. Olivia, Harrison is waiting for you in the kitchen. Aren't you supposed to go on a hike with him? She pulls the covers away from my face. Tell him I'm sick, I say, rolling over on my side and pulling the covers with me. Marshall jumps up on the bed and licks my face. Go tell him yourself. He brought you coffee. Caramel latte, from the smell of it. I have no idea where he got that at six o'clock in the morning. My mother knows no mercy and pulls the entire comforter off. I sit up and rub my eyes. As suspected, it's still dark outside. What was I thinking, making a date for an early morning Sunday hike? I'll be right down. You better. I don't want to get dragged into a conversation about his family and your connection to them. You haven't told him yet who you are, have you? She asks. The thought of walking in on that conversation wakes me up better than a cold shower and a strong cup of coffee could. I'll be down in ten minutes. I make it in less than seven. To my relief, Harrison and my mother are talking about the greenhouse and high tunnel. From the sound of it, he's interested in looking at options to grow different types of lettuce throughout the year. There you are, my mother says when I walk into the kitchen. Marshall is sitting in front of Harrison, keeping a close eye on him. Coffee as requested. Harrison hands me a to-go cup. My mom was right. It's a caramel latte and a good one at that. Where did you find this at this hour? I ask, while sitting down to lace up my hiking boots. I called in a favor with Dolores. She opened up a few minutes early and had this ready when I got there. I hope the coffee is still hot. I take a cautious sip. It's perfect. Did you pack a water bottle? My mom asks when I grab my purse and rain jacket. No, thanks. If my head wasn't attached, I dig around the cabinet until I find one of the stainless steel bottles I used to carry with me in high school. I fill it and clip it to my purse before slinging it across my head. It holds everything I need, including the granola bars my mom insists I take. Ready? Harrison waits by the door, sipping his coffee and watching me fumble through the process of getting ready to go on a ten-mile hike before the crack of dawn. Ready. I'm pretty sure I have everything. I can't shake the feeling that there's something I'm forgetting. Rain jacket. Check. Water bottle. Check. Food. Check. I grab my coffee and follow him out the door. Have fun and be careful, my mother calls behind us, holding Marshall by the collar. I wave and get into the car when Harrison holds open the door to the small Honda he's driving. Not exactly a farm vehicle, and I'm not sure where he charges it around here. We should be able to make it to the trail before sunrise. Harrison backs down our drive and heads down the old country road that leads further away from town and toward the trailhead. I sip my coffee and continue to try to wake up. My brain isn't all there yet, and I can't shake the feeling that there's something I'm forgetting. I printed out a map of the hike. It doesn't look too complicated, and if we keep up a good pace, we should make it back home long before any of the rain moves through, Harrison says. He points to a piece of paper lying on the dash. I grab it and turn it over. That's when it hits me. I forgot to pack the map and compass I dug out last night. They are still sitting on my night table. I sigh with relief. With this, we shouldn't need either. Everything okay? Harrison asks. Yes, I realized what I forgot to bring. A map and compass. With this, we should be good to go. I wave his printout around. You're worried I'll get us lost, he asks. Not going to let that happen. And this looks pretty straightforward. I take another sip of my coffee. By the time we pull into the gravel parking lot at the trailhead, I'm finished with it and feeling ready to tackle the day. 
Harrison clips his own water bottle to the belt loop of his jeans and tucks a protein bar into his back pocket. We both tie the rain jackets we brought just in case around our waists and head down the trail. It's still dark out, with only the lightest glimmer of dawn adding light to the path ahead of us. Thankfully, this first part or the hike is a walk across an abandoned field. By the time we reach the woods and the first incline, it is getting brighter. This is stunning. The view as we turn a corner is breathtaking. The woods open up and give us a clear view of the sunrise over the valley below. My hand goes to my back pocket. I need to capture the magic of this moment for my Instagram account. I come up empty. This was worth the 5M alarm, Harrison says. He's standing next to me, as captivated by the scene in front of us as I am. I check my other pocket and then those in my rain jacket. No luck. I dig around my purse without any luck, either. What are you looking for? Harrison asks. My phone. I can't find it anywhere. I pat my jeans one last time, knowing the attempt is fruitless. You can borrow mine. He holds his out to me. That won't do me much good. I was going to post this to Instagram. Hashtag magic moment. Expect the magic is gone, and I can't believe I left my phone. How about this? I'll take your picture and text it to you. You can post it when we get back. Say cheese. He's taken a step back, and the flash goes off, before I can protest. Thanks. He turns his phone to show me the image. It's not bad, and with a little editing, it'll be usable. We get back on the trail and make good progress. The air is crisp and fresh, the rays of the sun warming us up just a bit while bathing the landscape in a golden light. The fog we've encountered during the beginning of our walk burns off the fields, and by the time we reach the small creek we'll be crossing several times, there is no hint of it left. The grass in the meadows and fields around us is dry, and there is no sign yet of the impending storm. Harrison is chattier than I am and keeps pointing out what catches his eye along the way. A moss-covered rock, a couple of deer crossing the path in front of us, a leaf riding the ripples down the stream. Each time he does this, my hand flies to my back pocket, looking for my phone. I've been listening to the familiar buzz of an incoming message, even though I know it's not there. I think I'm having phone withdrawals, I say, when Harrison catches me doing it yet again. I'm not proud of the addiction, and it's worse than I realized. I can't fully enjoy the surrounding beauty without the need to capture it. I feel that. I had to put my phone into a timeout for a week to get over it. He holds out his hand to help me across the moss-covered log that has fallen across the trail. I wonder how long ago the tree has fallen. Probably in one of the severe storms this winter my mother told me about. I can't imagine doing that. I'm not sure I'll make it until we get back to the house where I hope my phone is sitting on my nightstand, still plugged into charge. The key is to distract yourself. Let's see if you can make it 20 minutes without reaching for your phone. He looks back at me, the challenge gleaming in his eyes. Our hands are still intertwined, even though I've cleared the trunk. You're on. I pull my hand from his and instantly miss the connection. The warmth from his fingers wrapped around mine lingers. Have you heard of goat yoga? He asks, falling into step beside me. Where did that come from? I ask. Trying to distract you with conversation, and it was the first thing that popped into my head. So, have you? Yes, I've heard of it. I've been to a few sessions out in LA. Yoga, or goat yoga? With actual goats. The words come out fast, and his head turns to look at me. Yes, actual goat yoga. They offered some sessions at a park in my neighborhood. It was the cool new thing in LA last year, and I decided to check it out. Really? How was it? I laugh at the sound of his voice. You don't believe me? I'm still not entirely sure it's an actual thing. It sounds so, absurd. He shakes his head. It isn't your regular yoga session, but it's definitely an actual thing, I assure him. How is it different? Aside from the obvious? 
the obvious being baby goats jumping on your back. I ask, not even trying to hide my grin. Pretty much. Well, it's outside, but then, that's not unusual. At least not in California. You can actually do stuff outside in the summer without breaking into a sweat. I wipe the moisture from my forehead and wish I'd brought something to pin my hair up. It didn't take long for the sun to do its job, and between the rising temperatures and the high humidity, it's already starting to get uncomfortably warm. Makes sense. What else? It's not nearly as serious as regular sessions. Or as quiet. Everyone laughs, and it's almost impossible to get any of the poses perfectly right. You just do your best and try not to get too startled when a goat jumps on you. I have fond memories of the sessions. I should definitely see if they are still going on when I get back to Los Angeles. What's the point of it, then? If you don't get a good workout, or practice, or whatever you call it. Stress relief, I guess. Or maybe trying something new and different. It's definitely a lot of fun. Everyone's laughing, and you can't help but feel better when you see those little guys jumping around, living their best lives. I can see the appeal of that. He's deep in thought for a while, and we continue to make our way up the path. The trail is getting steeper as we make it up one of the hills that leads us closer to the mountains. The summit of the next one and the old abandoned homestead from the early 19th century atop it is the final destination for today's hike. After that, we'll take a second path that winds through more thickets and fields but avoids crossing the stream back to the trailhead and Harrison's car. Is it always baby goats? Harrison asks, pulling me out of my own thoughts. Mostly. They did have a couple of older goats. Moms to some of the babies, I think. They were pretty chill, spending most of the time grazing or laying in the sun, letting it warm their fur. They were both very zen. So it's mostly the babies that climb all over you. He nods like this, confirms a suspicion he's had. Pretty much. What does it feel like? Is it painful? he asks, his eyes darting from the path to me and back several times. The trail is getting a little trickier, with plenty of roots and rocks to avoid. I keep my eyes in front of my feed. Not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. It's almost like a massage and doesn't hurt at all. That's good to know. You thinking of joining a session? I ask. I would have to get the details. I didn't know of anyone who offered goat yoga in or around Linden. Thinking of offering it at the family farm, actually. Or thought about it, I should add. We have two billy goats, but I don't think they're zen enough. Or clean enough. He shrugs. You could always get a few babies. Or female goats, since you have the baby daddies already. I trip over something and shriek. The water bottle I'd been holding goes flying off to the side. Before I can hit the ground, Harrison is there to catch me. I grab hold of his broad shoulders to steady myself. Are you okay? he asks. His eyes connect with mine, concern flashing in them. He's close. So close I can feel his sweet breath washing over me. Feel the heat emanating from his body and engulfing me like a protective shield. I don't breathe. I don't move, except to inch a tiny little bit higher, stretching my calves, keeping most of my weight on my left leg and using my arms to pull myself up. My fingers are wrapped around his strong shoulders, holding on for added support. He lowers his head a fraction of an inch, his lips getting closer to mine. I sigh, and my eyes are about to flutter close when we hear it. Thunder. His head jerks back and he creates the smallest bit of distance between us. The magic of the moment is gone. It's still pretty far off, but we should probably try to make it back. How's the foot? Can you walk? Harrison asks, his concern taking on a more urgent tone. I'm fine. I put a little weight on my right foot that had twisted out from under me. It's a little painful, but doable. Something I can walk off. I have plenty of experience in that department. Why don't we rest for a minute? 
There are some rocks up ahead that look pretty comfortable. He points to a small outcropping. With his help, I hobble to the spot and sit down. My water bottle. I'll get it. He jogs down the path, clearing roots and rocks without a problem and comes back a moment later with my bottle. The cap came off and only a little water remains in the bottom. I take a tiny sip and close it, attaching the bottle to my purse. It feels strangely light and bouncy. I better save the rest for the way back, I say, getting worried about making it all the way back to the car with only an ounce of water left. We'll fill it up when we get back to the creek. I don't think that's a good idea. There are lots of cow fields upstream. That water isn't safe unless we filter it. One of those portable water purifiers my friend Caitlin has would come in handy right about now. I didn't think about that. We'll make do with what I have left then. He shakes his own bottle. It sounds more than half full. We better get going. I stand up and do my best to hide the pain that shoots up my leg. Here. He puts his arm around my shoulder, taking most of my weight. With his help, I am able to hobble down the rocky path. It's slow going, but we make progress until the rain starts. At least we don't have to worry about water anymore, I say, sticking my tongue out to catch a few of the raindrops. Harrison laughs, but his eyes are on me, staring intently. I nudge my shoulder into his side, and he blinks. Try it. I push a few damp strands out of my face and lean back my head to catch more of the rain. He follows my example, and we both stand there, catching raindrops, looking like fools. Thankfully, the cows in a field off in the distance are the only witnesses around. It doesn't take long for my hair to get drenched. The raindrops become larger and more frequent. I don't think we'll make it back to the car, Harrison says when another round of thunder echoes through the valley. This time we can see the flash as well. The storm is getting closer and we need shelter, fast. I think I remember seeing an old shed or corn crib on the way out. I wish I could remember how long ago that had been. A huge flash of lightning lights up the sky, followed closely by the loudest boom yet. I don't think we have time to try to find it. That outcropping is our best bet, I think. Plenty of tall trees around to serve as lightning rods. Harrison points to the outcropping where we sat a few minutes ago. Let's go. With his help, I make it back, and we crouch down behind the rocks we'd sat on, sheltered by an overhanging slab of sandstone and a few thickets. Give me your jacket. Harrison holds out his hand after getting me settled on a handful of pine branches. Why? It's still fairly warm, but I'm tempted to pull it on to preserve body heat. Trust me. Harrison picks up his own jacket and holds his hand out for mine again. I give it to him and watch him disappear around the rocks. I hear the breaking of branches and then another round of thunder and lightning. Hurry up. A moment later, the jackets appear above me. Stretched between two pieces of wood, they make a tent of sorts, keeping most of the rain away from our hiding spot. How's that? Harrison asks when he crouches back down, securing his end with a large rock. Much better. You've got skills. I smile, and the look in his eyes makes my heart skip a beat or five. Not bad for a city boy, eh? He grins and leans back against the rock. I follow suit. It's still warm from the sun and takes away the chill of my wet shirt. Looks like that storm came in a lot faster than expected, I say, digging one of my granola bars out of my purse and handing him half. Hopefully, that means it'll move through pretty quick too, he says, before shoving a large chunk of it into his mouth. You got somewhere to be tonight? I ask. Not exactly, but I don't want my grandmother to worry. Give her a call and tell her you're okay, I suggest. Harrison pulls his phone from his pocket and curses under his breath. What's wrong? No reception. I should have thought about this. I have trouble any time I'm more than a few miles outside of Linden. It'll be fine, I say, as much to reassure him as myself. You're right. 
We'll be back in no time, and Lex will give me a hard time for the next week or two. He told me this was a bad idea. He'd been bound to bring up his cousin, but hearing my ex's name still came as a bit of a shock. And a reminder. Now was as good a time as any to have the conversation I'd been dreading since I'd accepted his invitation to the tipsy cow. Lex Clark is your cousin. He is. You know him? He asks. I do. I hesitate for a moment, trying to come up with the best way to break the news. Of course you do. This is a small town. You two probably went to school together. We did. And to prom. I don't look at him, choosing to stare at the small stream of rainwater that's falling off my jacket and running through the sandy dirt in front of me before vanishing out of sight behind one of the rocks that shelter us from the increasing breeze. Prom? Lex and I dated all through high school and after. I finally look up. You're Olivia, he says. Chapter 11 Harrison Olivia I can't believe it. Liv is Lex's ex Olivia. I almost kissed the woman less than an hour ago. That's my name, she says. Liv, Olivia. How did I miss this before? I wish you'd told me, I say. I scoot to my left. I have to put some distance between us. Easier said than done in this space. I should have told you that Liv is a nickname. She looks at me with those big blue eyes of hers. There's hurt in them, and it's nothing like the pain when she twisted her ankle. This one cuts me to my soul. No. That's on me. I should have realized sooner. That Liv is short for Olivia? That you're Lex's ex? It sounds like some cheesy line from a teen drama. Why does that matter? She asks. I turn back to look at her. She looks surprised. Does she not realize what this means? It matters because Lex still has feelings for you. He's hoping to run into you and patch things up. I swallow hard. Saying it out loud leaves a foul taste in my mouth. Thinking of her and Lex getting back together is gut-wrenching. But taking my cousin's girl is unthinkable. We're over. We have been over for a long time. Since before I left town. I thought Lex and I were on the same page, she looks off into the distance. The rain slows for a moment, but the wind howls more fiercely than ever. Trust me, he doesn't think so. I grab her water bottle, now full of rainwater, and hand it to her. Look! I don't know what Lex thinks. I haven't heard from him in months. All I can say is that as far as I'm concerned, our relationship has been over for a long time. She scans my face, looking for a reaction. I do my best to keep my expression blank, but inside I'm reeling. I like Liv. More than I'd realized. He says you're the one. My voice breaks, and I hate it. I clear my throat and scrub my face. What Lex and I had was puppy love. We started dating our freshman year. It was fun while it lasted, but eventually we grew apart. His dream has always been to stay in Linden and take over his grandfather's farm. And that's not what you want? I say to keep her talking. I need time to get my feelings under control. Every inch of me wants to escape, but it isn't an option. The chill in the air helps cool down the fire of emotion that's roaring inside my chest. No. I couldn't wait to get out of here. I wanted to see the world, make a difference. And that led you to Los Angeles? I ask. It did. A friend introduced me to some people in the film industry. I think I have a shot working as a publicist for an agent. If you can bring that guy, or her, Amy? She nods. Not that it's looking good, but if I can talk her into an audition, or at least expressing some interest, I have a foot in the door. And it's a good script. Perfect for her. Even Leo thinks so. She sounds convincing, but there's doubt in her eyes. It's the distraction I need. What makes you think it would be right for her? I ask. It's an indie movie about a young woman who raises her siblings after their parents die in a car crash. It's part drama, 
part romantic comedy and would be a chance for her to show what she can do and open doors for all sorts of opportunities. If acting is something she wants to pursue. Right. Liv wraps her arms around herself. You need this, don't you? It's a wild guess. I do. Without it, she shakes her head. Her jaw is tight, her brows are furrowed. She needs this win. Desperately. And it's why you came back to Linden, isn't it? She nods, and a small part of me revels in the fact that Lex doesn't have anything to do with her return. Maybe she's right. But I'm not that guy. No matter what. Are you cold? She asks. A little. I look at her more closely. Her arms are wrapped around herself tightly, and she's shivering. Her shoulders are moving, and now that I'm paying attention, I can hear her teeth shatter. Come here. I hold my arm out to her, and she scoots over, pressing herself close to my body. I pull her closer. She feels ice cold. The sky grows darker, and the temperature drops noticeably. The rain turns to hail, and I know we are in trouble before the sirens go off in the distance. Those are tornado sirens, Liv says. I know. Let's hope we don't get one close to here. I pull my phone back out on the off chance I get a strong enough internet connection to pull up the radar, or at the very least enough bars to get a text from Lex. He'd try to get in touch the moment he found out about the weather. Any luck? Liv is looking down at what I'm doing. No. That's okay. What does it matter? All we can do is pray that nothing comes right over us. And if it does, all we can do is hunker down and hold on. Her voice is somber. Chapter 12 Olivia Something's wrong. I know at the moment we turn the corner, and I see the cruiser pulled up next to Harrison's car. They are probably searching for us since we didn't make it back last night. Harrison raises his arm and waves. Lex waves back, but neither he nor the sheriff with him move. No, that's not it. Icy dread rushes over me, and I pick up the pace, running the last quarter of a mile of the trail toward the parking lot. By some miracle, I don't trip, but I'm out of breath when I reach the two men. Liv, are you okay? Lex asks, putting a hand on my shoulder. I'm fine. We're fine, I get out between sucking in deep breaths of air. We got caught by the storm and took shelter in an outcropping. By the time the wind died down, it was too dark to hike back. Harrison steps up beside me, his breath slow and even. The two of you spent the night out there? Sheriff Michaels asks, looking at both of us in turn. I push back my hair and scrub a bit of dirt off the leg of my jeans. Harrison has leaves in his hair and a smudge of dirt on his cheek. I resist the temptation to wipe it off. Both of our boots are caked in mud from the trail. We did. It wasn't comfortable, but we survived. Harrison rubs his neck. He made a small fire outside the shelter that helped us stay warm. It had been my saving grace. I didn't realize how cold you could get in early summer once you got wet. The fire and the makeshift tarp had helped dry both of us out, and after a few hours, I'd finally stopped shivering. I'm glad you're both okay and no one got hurt. Next time, tell me when you're heading out and who you are hiking with, Lex says. I told Grandma I'd be gone. About Liv, Harrison's eyes are downcast, and I remember that he didn't know about me and Lex when we started this misadventure. We can talk about that later, Lex says, the words coming out fast. He does his best to avoid looking at either of us. How did you find us? I ask. Your mother told us where to look, the sheriff says. She didn't come with you? I ask, the feeling of dread welling back up. No. What happened? I ask, my eyes darting from one man to the other. We heard tornado sirens, Harrison says. We had three of them come through the area yesterday. Did a good bit of damage, the sheriff says. Liv, it went over your place, Lex says, his voice low and soft. My knees buckle. Harrison's arm shoots out, 
but it is Lex who catches me and pulls me close. My mom? I barely get the words out. Your mother is fine, Miss Spratt, but the place took quite a bit of damage. She's at Dolores's place. She's shaken up and scared out of her wits about you, but other than a few bruises, she made it through, Lex says. His hand is rubbing soothing circles on my back. I close my eyes for a moment and let myself soak in the familiarity of his embrace, his scent, the sound of his voice. What about our place? Harrison asks. It's enough to pull me out of my momentary trance, and I step out of the embrace and away from Lex. I turn to look at Harrison. There's a strange look on his face. He's looking right through me at his cousin, his only concern for the family farm. It hurts, but I get it. Everyone's fine, Lex assures him quickly. Some trees are down and we need to check the fence lines, but no serious damage. Grandma and Grandpa? Harrison asks. They are okay. You know Grandpa, he ran out to the cow barn the moment the sirens went off, but the worst of it went south of us. Good. Harrison's voice sounds rough. He clears his throat. Your donkey got loose, though. Haven't seen him since the storm started, but I'm sure he'll come back when he gets hungry enough. Lex shrugs, and Harrison nods. Neither of them seems too worried. Donkey? I ask. For the petting zoo, Harrison explains. Would you like a ride into town, Miss Spratt? Sheriff Michaels asks. Yes, please. I need to see my mother and make sure she really is okay. I hop in the cruiser, the moment he pulls the door open for me. I'll ride back to the farm with Harrison, Lex says. I turn my head to look at the cousins. I'm not sure what to make of the look they exchange. Works for me. Sheriff Michaels walks around the car and gets into the driver's seat. I'm buckled and ready to go, eager to check on my mom when Harrison knocks on the window. I open the door and look at him. Yes? I'm glad your mom is okay. I'll come check on the two of you later, if that's okay? He smiles, and I remember the almost kiss and the time we spent huddled together in front of a tiny fire. I'd like that, I say before Sheriff Michaels starts the car and Harrison closes the door. Chapter 13 Harrison What's going on with you and Olivia? Lex asks the moment I shut the door to my car. Nothing. We're friends. I turn on the car and back out of the parking spot. Sheriff Michaels is in front of us. You're friends with my ex? After all that talk the other day? Lex fastens his seatbelt and turns to stare at me. I watch the cruiser in front of us take a right turn to take the shortest route back to town. I turn right, in the direction of the family farm, suddenly eager to see how much damage there's been and to make sure both of my grandparents are all right. Plus, I can't wait to get my cousin out of my car. Liv and I barely know each other, I say. I can already spot the damage. Plenty of dead limbs and fallen trees on the side of the road. The silo of the first farm we pass is leaning dangerously. I briefly wonder if that's something that can be fixed. Right. That's why you took off on a hike with her without saying a word to anyone. Lex crosses his arms, and the stare is back. I do my best to ignore it, focusing on the damage around me instead. I didn't take off without telling anyone. Grandma knew exactly where I was and I told you I was going on a hike. I don't know Liv all that well. We ran into each other at the copper kettle. She dumped her coffee on my laptop and gave me her number in case there was damage to it. I had no idea she was your girl and gave her a call. We met for a beer and played a couple of rounds of darts. You took her to the tipsy cow? Lex's voice gets louder. Where else was I going to take her in this town? My foot hits the accelerator. I can't wait to get him out of my car. Slow down, there are still trees on the road, Lex says. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see him clutching the door. There's nothing between me and Liv. For what it's worth, no, I didn't realize Liv and Olivia were the same person. I was never around while the two of you dated. Right. 
like I'm believing that. Are you trying to kill us? Lex yells when I push my little Honda harder. The landscape is flying past us. I'm trying to get us home so Grandma can stop worrying about me, I reply, biting back the grin when I feel his fear. It's stupid, but it's making me feel better. You like her, he bites out. I do. She's been the closest thing I've made to a friend outside of family around here. That's not cool. And you have got to slow down before we wreck. We pass the old Baptist church. The top of the steeple is laying in pieces next to the building. Past it, I can see the path of destruction the tornado has made as far as the eye can see. I slow down until the speedometer reads a little below the speed limit. Lex lets out a sigh of relief. You think the two of you have a shot at getting back together? I ask. Not with you taking her out. Lex's voice is soft and low. This isn't his pride speaking. He's hurting. I promise to check on her and her mom. I want to say more, but it's harder than expected. I'll come with you. From what the sheriff told me, her mom's place got torn up pretty bad. They are going to need all the help they can get. What the, my foot stomps the brake all the way to the floorboard. Coming out of a turn, I find myself face to face with a herd of cows. The brakes shriek, and the car finally comes to a stop inches from one of the large animals. The reddish-brown cow stares at us through the windshield and moves. Are those grandpas? I ask. Lex is out of the car before I get the last word out. I follow suit, keeping a healthy distance between myself and the animals. It's easy to forget how large these bovines are until you're standing next to one. Not ours, Lex calls out to me. The cows are making their displeasure about our interruption of their impromptu picnic known. I guess the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Who do you think they belong to? I call back. Lex steps closer to one of the cows and grabs the ear tag for a better look. He walks back toward me and the car. Old Fred has a field down there. Looks like a tree fell on his fence. I'll give him a call and see if they are his. What do you want me to do? I ask, hoping not for the first time since my arrival in Linden that I'd pay better attention during my summer visits. Being surrounded by people who live and breathe the ranch life isn't always easy for a city boy like me. Cut in front of the cows and keep them from heading any farther down the road. And don't let any cars hit them. Lex pulls his phone from his pocket and turns his back toward me. Easy for him to say. The calves are running back and forth, one of them inching closer to my car before turning and running off to the side of the road. A few of them are running back and forth across the street. I'm startled when the one closest to me nudges my hand before sticking out its large tongue and wrapping it around my wrist. I don't know which one of us is more surprised. I yelp and pull back my hand. The calf spins around and heads off to hide behind what I assume is its mom. Lex laughs, and I trod down the road, taking a wide berth around the cows until I get ahead of the small herd. There are at least fifteen full-grown cows and a handful of calves. I take a wide stance in the middle of the road, spreading my arms wide. One of the cows walks right past me. Hey! I run after it, cutting it off. I somehow convince it to veer off to the side into the grass, but neither of us has any illusions that I can keep her from making her way farther south. They are old Fred's cows. He's coming up. Lex says when he catches up with me. Oh, good. I am ready to get home and take a shower before checking on Liv and her mom. What are you doing? Lex asks when I repeat my spread eagle maneuver when the cow starts to move again. What do you think? Trying to keep her from going down the road. Thankfully, there has been no traffic. I have no idea what my cousin expects me to do to keep the cows safe when a car does come by. Waving and yelling is the only thing I can think of. Which is exactly what Lex does while slowly walking toward the cow. She's the largest of the bunch and, from the look of it, the lead cow. One thing I've learned from the few times I've moved cattle with my family it's that if you can get the lead cow to go where you want the herd, you're golden. Help me out here, he calls over his shoulder. I step beside him and copy the yelling and waiting he's doing. 
To my surprise, the cow stops, looks at us, and then turns around. She takes a few steps back toward the field they escape from before stopping to check out a clump of dandelions that look especially tasty. You think Olivia is the one? I ask Lex. He walks off to the side, picks a blade of grass, and leans against the fence post. I know she is. Why do you think I haven't dated anyone else? Have the two of you been in touch since she left? I know the answer, but I want to hear it from him. We texted in the beginning. Then I guess we both got busy. But that's all going to change now that she's back. He gives me a questioning look. I am going to check on her and her mom, then I'll keep my distance and let the two of you work things out. It hurts more than I like to admit to myself, but what else can I do? I am not going to be the guy that wrecks someone else's happiness. Besides, Liv and I barely know each other. We didn't even kiss. Thanks. And I'll come with you. From the sound of it, the tornado did quite the number on the Sprat place. I'm guessing they will need all the help they can get. Before I can respond, a cherry red Ford truck that's seen better days comes up the road. I look at Lex to see what we're supposed to do to keep the cows safe. They all look up and start to walk toward the slowing vehicle. That's Fred. Lex says. He pushes off the fence posts and walks down the road, raising his hand in greeting. I fall into step beside him. What's the plan? I ask. Get the cows back on the pasture and fix the fence, Lex says like it's no big deal. To my surprise, it isn't as hard as I'd feared. Old Fred walks to the back of his truck and pulls out a large bucket of some sort of feed. He rattles it, and the cows walk his way and follow him down the road like he's some Pied Piper. Lex and I run ahead, pulling the broken fence away to make a larger opening for the cows. Fred leads them further into the field. There's a couple of bales of hay in the truck, he calls over his shoulder. We run to the truck and bring the hay to the spot where Fred has dropped the feed cubes. That should keep them busy long enough to patch the fence. You brought your tools? Lex asks as we walk back out of the field. Course. Spare wire to patch this for today. I'll pull new line in a day or two. Old Fred climbs in the bed of his truck, handing us clippers, a wrench, and a roll of barbed wire. You don't happen to have some spare gloves back there? Lex asks. Fred nods and hands him a pair that has more patches than original leather. I'm relegated to handing the men tools as needed and holding posts upright while they get to work. It doesn't take long to patch the fence. The wire isn't as tight as they'd like, but both assure me that it will do. The cows are still happily munching their treats, all thoughts of escape forgotten. A calf is the only one who ventures back our way. I think it's the one that licked my hand and scared both of us. I scratch its head until one cow looks up, moves, and it runs back to rejoin the herd. Curious little fella, that one. He was born during that cold spell we had two months back. Kept him in the house with me overnight, and he's taken to following me around whenever I get out here. Fred leans against one of the posts that had survived the big escape and looks at his herd. He's a cutie, I say, and for the first time, I get my grandfather's love for these animals. He's something else. Thanks for your help, boys. Would have taken a lot longer without the both of you. Old Fred shakes hands with each of us. No problem. Everything else okay at your place? Lex asks. Fred nods. Like every farmer and rancher in the area, he'll spend the next few days walking fence lines, fixing what was broken, but all in all, he seems to have fared relatively well. Still no power, though. Ours was still out when I left, Lex says before we get back in the car. By the time we finally make it to the farm, I'm dead on my feet. Lex found you. Are you hurt? Grandma runs out on the porch and down the steps the moment we pull up. She's at my door before I can get out of the car and pulls me into a fierce hug the moment I do. I'm fine, Grandma. We got caught by the storm and took shelter under some rocks. Are you sure? You look awful. She pats my face and looks me over more closely. I'm fine. 
It was cold and uncomfortable, but we were safe. The worst of it didn't make it anywhere near us. I'm glad. Go get a shower, and I'll make you something to eat. The power came back on an hour ago. The water might still be a little cold, but it'll do. She's right. The water is barely lukewarm, but I feel better when I head back down, dressed in a clean pair of jeans and a fresh shirt. A plate of bacon and eggs and a stack of toast are waiting for me. The rest of my family is sitting at the kitchen table, digging in. The scent of the food makes my stomach growl. Loudly. My grandfather laughs. Sit down and eat, son. You've earned it. He doesn't have to tell me twice. I dig in and can't remember anything tasting this good. I listen as Lex catches my grandparents up on what we've seen on the road and how we stop to help old Fred. I suppress a yawn and reach for another biscuit and a couple of slices of bacon. The next thing I remember is my grandmother standing over me, shaking me. Harrison, wake up. You dozed off, she explains when I look up at her. I did? I look down at my plate. At least my face didn't land in my eggs. Why don't you go lay down for a bit, she suggests, pointing to the living room. The couch looks inviting, and I feel the pull to fall into it and sleep for a few hours. Then I remember that there's something I need to do first. Chapter 14 Olivia Mom I run up to her the moment I see her in the dimly lit dining room of the copper kettle. She looks bad. Tired and beaten with dirt smudges all over her face and dark circles under her eyes. Her hands and arms are covered in scratches and cuts. Olivia. Her face lights up when she sees me, and I run into her outstretched arms. We hold on to each other for a long time. I can feel the dampness from her tears on my cheek. Are you okay? We should get those cuts taken care of. I extricate myself from her embrace and take a closer look. None of the cuts are bleeding, but I'd feel better if they were cleaned and dressed. I'm fine. Everything's fine now that I know you are safe. I thought, her voice cracks, and I know what she's thinking. The same thing I thought when I saw Sheriff Michaels waiting for us. Bad news. The worst. Neither one of us will ever forget the day a man in a white coat stepped into the waiting room to tell us that my father was gone. Ever since that day, my mind goes to the worst-case scenario in situations like this. I know hers does as well. But you're safe. We're both still here, and that's all that counts. She caresses my cheek, and tears well back up in her eyes. Marshall? I'm afraid to ask. He's fine. He's at the house. I didn't think it would be a good idea to bring him here. How bad is it? I ask. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a man I don't recognize, give a stuffed toy and hand it to a little girl. She beams up at him like he's made her day. It's bad, Livy. My mother sits down, and I take the seat across from her. Her hand shoots up to hold mine. Tell me. The greenhouse is destroyed. The hoop house is completely gone. A chunk of the roof ripped right off. The chicken coop is gone. I don't know if any of the chickens made it. She shakes her head. I run my fingers across one of the cuts on her arm. There's dried blood, and it is starting to look red. We need to clean this before it gets infected, I say. My mom pulls her hand out of mind and pulls her sleeve down. Your daughter is right, Rita. The same man walks up to our table. He's about my mom's age and carrying a first aid kit I didn't notice before. We don't have time for this, my mother says. She gets up. Sit back down and let me treat your cuts. After that, I'll take you back to your farm and we can assess the damage. His voice is firm and to my surprise, my mother does as asked. Walter, this is my daughter, Olivia. Olivia, this is Walter. It's hard to tell under all the dirt and grime, but I'm pretty sure my mother's cheeks are turning red. We exchange pleasantries, and I watch the man carefully clean my mother's wounds with an alcohol swab. She flinches, but doesn't say a word. 
Good. You're finally letting him take care of those. Dolores walks up, setting a bowl and several napkins on the table in front of us. We're driving out to the farm as soon as Walter is done, my mother tells her. Not until you've cleaned up and eaten something. That's warm water. Coffee and sandwiches are coming right up. Where did you get warm water? I ask. The thought of hot coffee makes me go weak in my knees. Good thing I'm sitting down. Gas grill out back. As soon as the power comes back on, I'll fix us some proper food. She rushes back off and returns a few minutes later with another bowl for another table. The room is full of Linden residents. I recognize most of the faces. Everyone looks the way I feel. Tired. Helpless. Ready to wake up from this nightmare that we all find ourselves in. That's better, Walter says. I look up. He's dressed the cuts and scrapes in record time. Do you have medical training? I ask. Maybe, he says like that explains anything. And now you work in Dolores's kitchen? I can't get a good read on the guy. Peeled a lot of potatoes in my day. Walter is a man of few words. Don't let him fool you. Walter is an excellent cook, Dolores says. She's holding a stack of cups and an old-fashioned percolator. She pours each of us a cup and points to the counter where sugar and powdered creamer are sitting out. Cream and sugar? I ask Walter. He shakes his head. By the time I return with my mother's and my cup, the two of them have their heads stuck together, talking quietly. He's a good man, Dolores says. I didn't hear her walk up to me and almost drop the coffees. I don't think she's ready to see anyone. You've been gone a long time, Liv. And she gets lonely. Walter would be good for her. Especially now. You don't expect her to rebuild all by herself, do you? Dolores walks off, taking coffee to another group of people with no other place to go. Olivia. The smile on my mother's face does a lot to soothe the fear and panic that wells up every time I look around the room. Dolores's words are still ringing in my ears. I put the coffee in front of her and return to my seat. I'll be back, Walter says, pouring the last of the hot coffee down his throat. Another skill courtesy of the military, I guess. He's getting some tools, my mother explains. She takes her cup and wraps her fingers around them. Good. I'm grateful it won't be the two of us returning to the farm by ourselves. Not when I have no idea how extensive the damage is. What if the house isn't livable? I was so scared, Livy. Knowing you were out there in all this. Not knowing if you were dead or alive. Her voice cracks, and the tears threaten to come back. As do my own. I'm alive. We both are. Everything else can be fixed or replaced. I put my hand on her arm, barely touching the bandage. The last thing I want to do is cause her more pain. I know. It's just that, she lowers her head and stares into the cream-colored coffee. We can fix this, Mom. We'll make it better than before. Everything you and Dad dreamed the farm could be. I mean it. I'll move back home. Whatever it takes to help my mother get through this. We'll see. Mom takes a sip of the coffee. I do the same. The hot, sugary beverage helps. As do the sandwiches Dolores insists we take before heading out. Rita, how are you holding up? Mr. Eaton sits in the chair Walter vacated a few minutes ago. Hanging in there, Mac. How about you? We'll be all right. Couple of windows are broken, but that'll be an easy fix. I'll board them up this afternoon. Hope it won't be too long before the power comes back on. It'll be easier to clean up. My mother nods. Well, I'll let you get back to eating. If you need help with anything, give me a holler. The boys and I are happy to lend a hand. He isn't the only Linden resident who offers his help. By the time Walter returns and eats a peanut butter sandwich in record time, we've had several more offers to help out around the farm. 
Walter scoffs at them, mumbling something about there being no need, but it makes me feel better, knowing we aren't in this alone. The farm looks worse than I thought it would. And here I'd thought I was hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. Not even close. The place looks like a war zone. This doesn't look good. Walter is scanning the grounds. No joke. I can't get my bearings. There's so much destruction everywhere. My mother's livelihood is blown to bits. Mom was right. There's nothing left of the hoop house. Olivia. Mom doesn't look happy. I don't think there's much we can do to fix it. Your best bet is to tear it down and build a new greenhouse. Walter isn't phased by my comment or my mother's reaction. He's walking around what remains of the building, glass crunching under his boots. I can't believe you were here when all this happened. I take my mother's hand, needing the physical reminder that she was fine. I've never been so scared in my life, she admits. Where were you when the tornado came through? I ask. In the downstairs bathroom with Marshall. I crawled into the tub and put a pillow over my head. She tries to squeeze out a small smile, but I can see the horror of reliving the experience behind it. Show me, Walter says. We make our way to the house, stepping over broken pieces of glass, remnants of pots, garden tools, and various branches and other debris. Aside from a chunk of the roof missing and a cracked window, the house actually looks better than I expected. The tornado must have narrowly missed it. We make our way into the house. Walter insists on taking the lead to make sure it is safe. Marshall lets him pass and walks up to me, nuzzling my hand. This is where I sat. I stayed put for over an hour after it was done and over with. I was too scared to move. My mother leans against the doorframe to the bathroom. I stand inside staring at the tub where she'd hunkered down for who knows how long. Smart move. This is probably the safest place in the house. Walter nods approvingly before leaving to check on the rest of the house. What was it like? I ask, struggling to process the events of the past twenty hours. Had it really been less than a day since Harrison and I had sought shelter from the rain? Barely more than twenty-four hours since he picked me up right here in this house? It was awful, Livy. I was so scared. The sirens were blaring, the wind was howling, and I had no idea where you were and if you were safe. The weather moved through so much faster than anyone expected. Mom sits down on the toilet. She is shaking. I kneel down beside her and wrap my arms around her. It'll be okay. We're okay. The house is still standing. Everything else is fixable. She nods, and we sit there for what feels like a long time until she speaks again. Her voice is muffled against my shirt. It really did sound like a train going by. A train that didn't care what it took out, barreling through the landscape. Everything okay in here? Walter asks. We're fine. Give us a minute, and we'll meet you in the kitchen, I say. When he leaves, I stand up and catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror. I look awful. There are a few more smudges of dirt, or who knows what, on my cheeks, and my hair is a tangled mess with a few sticks and leaves woven in. How didn't I notice this until now? I grab a brush and work the worst of it out. I wonder if we still have water, I say to no one in particular. Let's find out. My mother opens the faucets. It spits and sputters for a moment, then runs. The water is clear. Don't drink that without boiling it, Walter calls from the kitchen. My mother smiles. We won't, she calls out to him. He's a good guy. Maybe I will go have coffee with him after all. I burst out laughing as I scrub a wet washcloth over my face. At this point, you owe him at least a home-cooked meal. You're not wrong. My mother nudges me out of the way to freshen up herself. By the time I walk back into the kitchen, Walter has cleared away the glass and debris from the cracked window. Everything okay, he asks when he sees me. Marshall is by his side, letting Walter pet his head. We're fine. Mom should be back in a minute. 
Thanks for coming back here with us. Marshall walks over, taking his usual position next to me. No problem. He leans against the counter and looks at the cracked window. She hasn't been with anyone since my dad. I sit down, feeling awkward and unsure about how to start this conversation. Dolores mentioned something like that. He's not going to make this easy for me. Don't hurt her, is all I can think to say. Don't plan on it, he replies. Aside from the window, this doesn't look too bad in here, my mother says. I'm not sure how long she's been back and what she's heard. I'll get some plywood and board this up for you, he says. I think there's some in the shed behind the house. I'm not sure it survived the storm, though. My mother steps out on the porch. It has been swept as well. The man works fast. I'll go, he says, jogging down the steps and disappearing around the side of the house. A familiar blue truck comes down the driveway. Lex has been driving it since the day he's gotten his license. The old Chevy used to belong to his father, and it's his pride and joy. Harrison and their grandmother climb out of the truck alongside him. Grandma Clark waves. What are you doing here? I ask. We promised to come check on you, Harrison says. This doesn't look so bad, his grandmother adds. The expression on her face as she takes in the mess that used to be our family farm belies her words. Walter walks back around the house, carrying a large sheet of plywood. Lex and Harrison jump and take it from him. The house is in pretty good shape. From what I can tell, it's structurally intact, but we'll have to replace a good chunk of the roof. Not a problem, Lex says. We should probably cover it up until we can get the materials. Harrison stares at the damaged corner of the roof. Shouldn't be hard with a couple of tarps. Do you have any? Lex looks at my mother. She shakes her head. We can go pick some up at the hardware store. Harrison smiles at me encouragingly. It makes my heart jump a little. I'm sure Brad will sell to us even if the power is still out. That part of town didn't take much damage. Walter stares at the roof. I'm guessing he's measuring it and making a mental supply list. Did you call the insurance company? Lex's grandmother asks my mother. She shakes her head. I should do that. I think the paperwork is in Mark's office. I'll come with you, for moral support, Grandma Clark says. I watch the two of them walk back into the house. Harrison, Lex, and Walter are putting plywood over the broken window, and I find myself alone with Marshall, staring at the total of the distraction in front of me. It's overwhelming. I need to do something, anything. Looking around, a pot in what is left of the greenhouse catches my eye. It is one of the tomato seedlings we up-potted a few days ago. Stay, I say to my dog. I carefully make my way through shards of glass and sharp pieces of bent and broken steel until I reach the plant. It's in perfect condition, sitting on a tiny little island of safety in a sea of disaster. I pick it up and carefully make my way back toward the house. Marshall isn't the only one waiting for me. Harrison is standing on the porch, staring at me when I step out of what remains of the greenhouse. What are you doing? He's wearing different clothes than he had yesterday on our hike. Despite the work he's done with the rest of the guys, not a single hair is out of place. He's clean-shaven, I notice, when I walk up the porch. He smells like soap and sunshine. You showered, I say. I carefully put down the plant on the edge of the porch, where it will get sun most of the rest of the day. I walk inside to get water from the kitchen. I did. Harrison steps up beside me and takes the cup out of my hand, filling it with water from the sink before I can spill it. Without another word, he walks back outside. Through the unbroken window of the front room, I watch him carefully watering the little plant. It's a survivor. We all are. What did the people from the insurance say? Lex asks when my mother and grandmother join us in the front room. I hadn't noticed either of the men when I'd walked in earlier. They will send someone as soon as they can, but it will be a while. My mother looks tired. How long are we talking? 
Harrison asks. Could be a couple of weeks. My mother shakes her head. Grandma Clark squeezes her hand. We'll need to get a couple of tarps on that roof. The sooner the better, Walter says. I'll help. Lex steps up and looks like he's ready to climb up on the roof right now. I will too. Harrison takes his spot next to his cousin when Lex's phone rings. Grandpa, everything okay? Lex listens intently for what seems like an eternity. We'll be right there. All eyes are on him by the time he puts his phone away. What's wrong? His grandmother asks. There's a pretty big break in the fence on the back of the property. Grandpa thinks we need to fix it before nightfall, or the cows might get out. He wants us back home. What about the roof? Walter can't put up the tarps by himself, Harrison says. I'll help, I say. Not a good idea, Lex says. You trip over your own feet, Harrison adds. The two exchange a strange look. You stay. I'll fix the fence, Lex says. I'll drive home with you. And the three of you are coming over for supper and to spend the night. We have power and hot water. Grandma Clark doesn't wait for an answer. I watch her and Lex leave while Walter and Harrison discuss everything they need to temporarily cover that portion of the roof. I walk outside and sit down next to the little tomato plant. We're going to be okay, I say softly, trying to make myself believe it. Chapter 15 Harrison I look out on the porch, and Liv is gone. I need to stop by my place to get a ladder and a few more tools. I'll swing by the hardware store on the way back and see what I can get. It's the most I've heard Walter talk. He seems like a solid guy, but not a fan of crowds. I'll come with you. Liv's mother grabs her purse off the counter don't let Marshall out, she says, and the two of them are gone. They're not at the end of the driveway yet when I hear a bump and a soft shriek. Liv! I race down the porch step and make my way to the side of the house. The greenhouse, or what remains of it, is in front of me. In the middle of all the glass and bent steel frame is Olivia. My heart skips a beat. If she trips and falls in there, she'll get seriously hurt. Wait for me, I shout. She turns and waves me off. What are you doing in here? I ask when I catch up with her, glass crunching under my boots with every step. I'm glad she's still wearing her hiking boots. Some of these shards would cut right through the thin sandals she'd worn the first time I'd seen her. What are you doing? I repeat when I stand next to her. She's in the same clothes she'd worn during our hike. I can smell a hint of the wood smoke from the small fire I'd managed to make to keep us warm throughout the night. It had been better than nothing, and while we both ended up cold and groggy, it had kept the critters away. I'm looking for plants. I was hoping more of them survived. She takes another step, her hand shooting out to grab a piece of steel when she loses her footing. Even if there are a few, I don't think it's going to matter. I realize it was the wrong thing to say the moment her head spins around and her glaring eyes reach me. It matters to me. She keeps stepping through the debris, and I get it. This is one small thing she can do. Something she has control over. Something she can save. I look across the area in front of us. Over there. I point to a small plant, half buried under what remains of an old kitchen table. It's a pepper plant. Liv walks over and examines the plant. A chocolate pepper, my favorite. How can you tell? To me, it looks like any other small plant. Maybe an expert could tell that it's some sort of pepper, but more than that? I'm doubtful. Liv grins and hands me the tag she's pulled out of the black plastic pot. Take this. There are more under here. I take the plant and pop the label stick back into the dark, rich soil while I watch Liv climb under the table. She comes out with two more plants. One of them looks in awful shape, but I keep my mouth shut. We make our way back to the porch and line them up next to the tomato plant. It isn't much, but I get it. There's life here. Hope. Where was this hoop house? I ask. Over there. 
Liv points to the area behind the greenhouse. The only thing left are a few clumps of dirt and a couple of pieces of PVC pipe sticking out of them. She walks off in the direction of the area, and I follow behind. We walk past the path of destruction toward the back of the property when I hear a familiar sound. Is that a donkey? Liv asks. Sure sounds like it. What would a donkey be doing here? I bought one the other day. He's been missing. You really do own a donkey? Liv stops and waits for me to catch up. Her eyes are wide. I do. Along with a few goats, rabbits, and guinea pigs. I'm pretty sure I told her about the goats. I'm not sure about the rest of my menagerie. Why a donkey, she asks. He was part of the deal, but to be honest, I'm not a fan. He's loud and obnoxious, and there's no way he'd let any child ride on him. As far as my petting zoo goes, he's a worse failure than the goats. At least they are turning into farm dogs that follow my grandmother around and keep trespassers away. What would he be doing over here? Liv asks. Who knows? He probably got scared and ran off. I have no idea why he would have stopped here. He usually stays wherever there's food. He's a tubby little guy, always interested in a meal. What do donkeys eat? Liv and I walk farther down the property toward the back of it where I think the donkey sounds were coming from. Mostly straw, hay, and grass, but this one is fond of vegetables. It was one of the reasons my grandmother isn't a fan. He did quite a bit of damage to her carrot and onion patch. Hmm. I wonder. Liv picks up the pace and walks around a thicket of bushes and an old shed. I'm a few steps behind. There you are, Tom. My donkey stands by a creek that runs through the back of the property. His back hoofs are in the water and he is surrounded by thick, green grass and wild onions. Tom? Liv asks, stroking his nose and pulling more of the lush grass along the creek for him and feeding it to the donkey. He carefully pulls it from her hand and snorts his thanks. Tom Bombadil. It's the first thing that came to mind when I heard him bray. Plus, he's on the chubbier side. I shrug. From Lord of the Rings? Liv shakes her head and laughs. Yes. And there are a couple of poems about him. I had no idea you were such a nerd, she says, patting Tom, who looks very pleased with himself. We don't really know each other all that well. I take a step closer, and Tom lets out a warning bray. Not yet, but I'd like to find out what else you like. Liv smiles up at me, and those pretty blue eyes make it so much harder to say the next words. I don't think that's a good idea. Her eyebrows draw together, and her nose scrunches up in the most adorable way. She gives Tom one more pat and walks back toward me, her boots caked in even more dirt and mud than before. Why not? Lex. Liv walks past me and into the small shed. She returns a moment later with a piece of rope. I thought we had this conversation already. Lex and I are over. We have been for a long time. He doesn't think so and neither do I. What have you seen that makes you think I'm still interested in him? She asks. She doesn't sound angry. Only curious. It's more of a feeling and hearing people like my grandmother talk about the two of you. I watch her walk back over to Tom. To my surprise, he lets her tie the rope around his neck. I can't believe anyone still believes in the whole Lex and Liv thing. Just because we were prom king and queen. She shakes her head and gently pulls on the rope. Tom takes a tentative step up the bank of the creek. I think there's more to it than that. Your grandfather's had his eye on this property. My father refused to sell it to him. With me being the only daughter, she and Tom make it back to me. What would he want this place for? I look across the small farm. That hay field back there has the biggest yield in the whole county. It would be enough to get his cows through the winter. He's been buying our hay for decades. Liv points to a large unfenced field on the other side of the house, running all the way back to the creek. That can't be the only reason why they want the two of you together. There aren't too many other eligible women in town with farm experience. 
and Lex hardly ever leaves town. I think he's afraid to leave your grandparents alone for more than a few hours. She and Tom walk back to the house. I fall into step beside her. I can't believe he's walking like that with you. He's such a good boy. She stops and gives him a soft kiss on his nose. Only with you. I can't help but wish she was kissing me. Am I really jealous of a small donkey? Maybe he doesn't want to be part of a petting zoo. Maybe he wants to be free and wander around, go where the wind blows him. She stares off into the distance. Is that what you want? Get away from here? Explore the world? I ask. That was the plan. She sounds sad, turning to hug Tom around the neck before I can warn her that he's not a fan of that kind of close interaction. To my surprise, he lets her get away with it, snorting across her head and gently nibbling on a few of the dark strands. Was the plan? I ask. Looks like I'll be staying around here for a while to help my mom. She doesn't sound happy about it. Is that an option? Don't you have a life to get back to in LA? I do. She lets go of Tom and shrugs when he gets impatient, tugging on her hair and taking a few tentative steps back. I wait for her to continue, but she doesn't. I don't want to probe. Not my place, I remind myself. We should get Tom back to your place, Liv says a little while later. We're almost back at the house. Walter's truck is turning into the driveway. I can bring a trailer over later today, or he could stay with you for a while if you'd like. I don't know where the idea is coming from, other than the fact that he seems to bring her comfort. Really? If you have a place for him to stay and your mom doesn't mind, I don't see why not. I'll bring some hay over. He isn't a lot of work when he doesn't wander off. He could get hurt around here. There's too much broken glass. She sounds sad and defeated. And she is right, of course. How about this, then? We'll take him back, but you come visit and hang out with him any time you want to. And when you get this place back in order, he can come by for another visit. It's a deal. She walks up and gives me a quick kiss on the cheek. Ready to climb on the roof? Walter calls out across the driveway before I can fully recover. I nod and walk to join him while Liv ties Tom to the porch railing and introduces him to her mother. Be careful, Liv calls. Chapter 16 Olivia Do you want to ride with us? Lex asks. He's made it back to the farm in his truck, pulling a small livestock trailer to take Tom back to the Clark farm. My new donkey friend is safely secured inside, but he doesn't sound happy about it. Harrison is standing next to the truck. I can't believe he's jumped on the Lex and Lib bandwagon along with most of the rest of the residents of Linden. I wonder if there's something in the water that puts everyone under the delusion that Lex Clark and I belong together. I shake my head. The last thing I want is to sit between the two of them for any length of time. I'll ride with Walter and my mom. We'll see you there. Both men climb into the truck and are off. My mom walks up next to me. She looks as tired as I feel. Neither one of us has slept much in the past 36 hours. Grab some clean clothes. Mrs. Clark is insisting that we shower and spend the night over there. Are you okay with that? I ask. They have power. And hot water. It'll be nice to sleep in a clean bed in a cool house, even if it isn't ours. And take a hot shower, I add. And the Clark house is huge. I can stay out of Harrison and Lex's way. And at first, it works. Both men are helping their grandfather in the barn when Walter drops us off at the farm. He didn't want to stay for dinner? Grandma Clark asks. He wants to help at the diner. He's worried about Dolores having to deal with keeping townspeople fed all by herself, my mother says. She has other staff, doesn't she? And I'm sure folks are helping out. Grandma Clark wipes her hands on the red and white checkered apron she's wearing. You're probably right, but it isn't my place to say something. I could be wrong, but my mother sounds disappointed that he didn't stay. 
He did offer to come back to help fix the roof, I say. And the boys will help as well. It'll be all I can do to keep that husband of mine from climbing on the roof right along with them. Grandma Clark shakes her head. Where is everyone? I ask. They are milking the cows and getting everyone fed and settled down. I'll tell you what, there's plenty of time for the two of you to get a shower and change into some clean clothes. I have the back room made up for you, and there's a stack of towels on the beds. My mother's cheeks turn red, and she looks down at her dirty clothes. I'm sure I look worse than her, despite our attempt to clean up back at the house. That bad, eh? I ask. Goodness, no. You are fine as you are. Both of you. I just thought you'd be more comfortable. You're right. A shower would be lovely. Thank you again for your hospitality. My mother pulls me by the arm and drags me upstairs. She comes to a stop when we reach the hallway. Last door on the right, I say, taking the lead. It's been a bit since I've been in this house, but I've spent enough time here, hanging out with Lex, to know the lay of the land. Thanks. My mother grabs a stack of towels and vanishes into the bathroom next door. She's dressed and ready to go by the time I get back from my own shower. That was wonderful. I didn't realize how much I needed that. I sigh and flop down on the bed. I'm almost too tired to go down for dinner. My stomach proves me wrong when the scent of homemade stew wafts up from the kitchen. Feel better? Grandma Clark asks when we return to the kitchen. Much. I can't thank you enough. Is there anything we can do to help? My mother asks. Nothing I can think of. I was about to walk out to the garden to grab a few things for a salad and some herbs to finish off the stew. Why don't you take a seat and relax? There's fresh coffee in the pot. I'd love to see your garden, my mother says. Come along then. I'll put you to work. Grandma Clark grabs two baskets and two small knives, handing one of each to my mother. Have fun, you too. The last thing I want to do is get my hand dirty after finally feeling clean. I have biscuits in the oven. You don't mind keeping an eye on them, Olivia? Grandma Clark doesn't wait for an answer and heads out the back door. Don't let them burn, my mother whispers before she leaves. I take a quick look. They are pale and will take at least another five minutes. I pour a cup of coffee and wander around the downstairs, peeking into the dining room and living room before stepping into the good room, the formal living room, reserved for guests, where Grandma Clark has family pictures displayed along the mantel and on the walls. Quite a few of them are of Lex, Harrison, and a girl slightly older than the two of them that I don't recognize. There are also older pictures of the two Clark sons, Lex's and Harrison's fathers. I can see the resemblance between Harrison and his dad. I don't remember ever meeting the man. Oh, no. I realize I lost track of time when the scent of something burning hits my nostrils. I run back into the kitchen and pull the cast iron pan from the oven. The biscuits are a lot darker than they should be, but I hope they aren't ruined. I pull them out as quickly as I can, burning my hand in the process. I'm not cut out for this kind of thing. I am not the kind of person who happily tends to the house, the garden, and the chicken coop while cooking up a storm to feed the hungry workers. I'm running cold water on my hand when my mother and Grandma Clark walk back inside. Olivia. Mrs. Clark asked you to do one thing. My mother looks visibly upset. Oh, don't worry. I've overcooked plenty of biscuits in my day, and those are quite salvageable. They are good enough to dip into the stew, and I'll make up another batch for those that like them lighter. Grandma Clark gets to work, and the second batch is done by the time Mr. Clark and his grandsons come in from their chores. Tell me about the damage to your place, Rita. Harrison says the greenhouse took quite a hit. That's a shame. Folks around here will be missing your plants. Grandpa Clark grabs another biscuit, one of the ones I burned, and dips it into what's left of his stew. It's not looking good. There's barely a trace left of the hoop house, 
and I don't think there's anything left to reuse in the greenhouse. I'm done for the season. By the time I hear back from the insurance, it'll be too late to start over. At least your house is still standing. Harrison said there's something wrong with the roof. You two are welcome to stay here until that's fixed, Grandma Clark says. Harrison nods. We secured it with a couple of tarps, and Walter seems to think it's structurally sound. It should be safe for you to stay home. I don't think you'll even notice it once the power is back on. And we'll be happy to help when it comes time to repair the roof. Grandpa Clark adds. You are not climbing any roofs. Let's hope the insurance company will get it all fixed up without any of you getting back up there. Grandma Clark looks at her husband and grandsons in turn. All I'm saying is that we're here for you. Both of you. Whatever you need, just give us a call. Grandpa Clark puts his spoon in the empty stew bowl and sits back to drink the last of his coffee. I appreciate that, but hopefully, we won't need to rely on either one of you too much after tonight. My mother gets up when Grandma Clark does, and the two of them clear the table. Harrison, will you take those extra chairs back upstairs? Grandma Clark asks. I pick up a stack of bowls and follow the two women back into the kitchen. Lex, would you mind closing up the chicken coop and seeing if there are any eggs for breakfast? Grandma Clark asks when we walk back into the dining room. She takes the last of the dishes, and my mother carefully removes the tablecloth to shake out the crumbs outside. I'll go with you. Chickens are the one type of farm animal I'm familiar with. My mother has had her flock for as long as I can remember. I hope most of them made it through the storm and will come back out of the woods or wherever else they've hidden in the next day or two. I'm sorry about your place. I know how much you love that old greenhouse, Lex says as we make our way out to the cook in the twilight. I was able to save a few of the plants. I look down to the coop for something to change the topic. That's nice. Where is Tom staying? I ask. Tom? the donkey that wandered off to my place. We step into the coop. It's quite a bit larger than my mother's. Most of the hens are inside, settling in the roost. Oh, that crazy thing. He's down the hill in the shed with the goats. You're not a fan? I ask before digging into the first of the nest boxes and pulling three eggs out. He's nuts. But at least he doesn't smell as bad as the billies. Lex pulls two more eggs out of another box. He's a sweetheart. One more grab, and both of my hands are full of raw eggs. At least they are fairly clean. Only you would think that. You have a soft spot for any animal you meet. He isn't wrong. I forgot to bring a basket, Lex says when he pulls his hand out of a fourth nest box. Wouldn't have been the worst idea. I gently pull my shirt out of my jeans and use the end of it to hold the eggs. By some miracle, I don't drop a single one. Lex isn't so lucky. Only three of his make the trip into his t-shirt. Don't tell my grandma, he says, before using his boot to cover the broken eggs with bedding. Remember the time we hid behind the shed and you somehow managed to roll onto an entire basket of eggs? I giggle at the memory. We'd been sneaking kisses away from prying eyes when I was supposed to be helping Lex with his chores. She was furious. She'd promised those eggs to Mrs. Ross. I was doing extra chores for weeks after that. Lex grinned. At least we have plenty for breakfast. If you can manage not to break any more, she might never notice. I reach into the last of the boxes and jump back when something hard stabs me into the soft spot between my index finger and thumb. Lex's grin turns into a full belly laugh. How many did you break? I look down at the pocket I made out of the bottom of my shirt. None. Seriously? That's a miracle. I nudge into him, almost causing him to drop a few more eggs. Hey, precious cargo on board. That's Bernice in there. I should have warned you. She's broody. Lex secures his hold on his eggs before gently reaching in and coaxing his hand under the hen. 
Now that I know of her existence, I can barely make out her shape in the dim bit of light that's coming in through the door. When we're done, only one of the chickens is still out in the run. We run around like chickens, trying to herd it into the coop without dropping any of the eggs. By some miracle, we manage the task without cracking a single one. This is nice, I say as we make our way back, both of us carrying eggs in our shirts. It's been a long time since we've had a straightforward conversation. It gives me hope we can finally become friends. Chapter 17 Harrison What are you looking at? My grandmother asks. Lex and Liv are coming back. They are laughing and talking, looking like they are enjoying each other's company. They make such a cute couple. I do hope they'll get back together now that Liv is back home. And with everything that's happened, I have a feeling she's going to stay around for a while. It'll be good for your cousin. He's been lonely. She squeezes my shoulder and walks back into the house. Any luck? I ask when they make it up to the porch where I'm sitting in the dark on one of the rocking chairs. Depends on what you call lucky. Lex here dropped a couple of eggs in the coop. But there should be enough for breakfast for everyone. Liv shows me the eggs tucked in the tails of her shirt. She's grinning from ear to ear. You're not going to let me forget that, are you? Lex smiles at her. It's the happiest and most relaxed I've seen him in a while. Oh, and don't tell your grandmother. He's buried the evidence. Liv giggles and walks inside. I think she's coming around. I can't wait for things to get to where they were before she left. Lex says softly before following her. I stay on the porch, staring out into the distance. Maybe everyone is right, and Lex and Liv belong together. And who am I to stand in the way of that? No matter what my stupid heart says. When my grandfather calls, I go back inside to join everyone in the living room. There's fresh coffee and chocolate chip cookies still warm from the oven. I have no idea when she's had time to bake them, but they are delicious and remind me of my childhood. No matter what far reaches of the earth we traveled to, my father would bake a batch of cookies on Sunday afternoon. We'd sit down and talk about our week eating cookies and drinking cold milk. These are delicious, Grandpa says. Rita made them. She had them whipped up and in the oven before I got all the dishes put away. Growing up, Mom made at least a batch a week. Liv picks up one of the baked treats and savors it. Something else we have in common. I shove the rest of my own into my mouth and wash it down with coffee. It leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. I should be happy for them. I'm trying. Oh, before I forget, I found something the other day when I was cleaning the bookshelf. Wait just a minute. Grandma jumps up and hustles out of the living room. She returns a moment later with a leather-bound photo album. I don't remember seeing this particular one before. She hands it to Liv. That's from junior prom. Liv's eyes grow wide, and she flips through a few of the pages. I didn't know you put these in an album. Lex takes a seat next to Olivia on the couch, and she moves the album between them. They go through the pictures that seem to cover most of their high school years together, heads bent over it, reminiscing about old friends and laughing about unfortunate wardrobe choices. I sit back and close my eyes, trying to tune it all out. We made a nice couple. Liv's words penetrate my mind, no matter how hard I try to shut it all out. Excuse me. I raise and walk out of the room, dropping my empty cup off at the kitchen sink and walking out the side door. The air has cooled in the last little while, and the night sky is lit up by an almost full moon and the first few stars. Harrison? Liv's voice is the last thing I expect out here. When I left, she was laughing and telling tales of the trouble she and Lex used to get into in high school. What are you doing out here? I was about to ask you the same thing. Are you okay? She walks next to me and peers into the rabbit cage. I have the door to the upper hutch open. Between the full moon and the streetlight at the corner where the drive tees into the road, there's enough light to get around once your eyes adjust. I needed some air. It's getting a little crowded in there, I say, stepping aside when she reaches out to pet the rabbit. We'll be out of your hair in the morning. That's not what I mean. 
I'm glad you're staying. It was just. I get it. More people than usual crammed into one room, everyone talking. Something like that. I grab a handful of Timothy Hay and put it in the hutch. My hand brushes Liv's, spending sparks up my arm and all the way into my chest. This is nice, she says. I take a deep breath of the clear night air. It is. Who is this, she asks, nodding in the direction of the rabbit she's still petting. That's Ginger. Over here we have Hop, Rex, Paddington, and Marnie. I point to each of the hutches that surround the guinea pig village. Hey, Ginger. Is that a good snack? She gives her one more pet before closing the door to the hutch. I take each of the remaining rabbits a bit of hay. It feels wrong to play favorites, though I have a soft spot for Ginger. She's the tamest and most curious of the rabbits. This is amazing. Liv is walking around the guinea pig village, taking it all in. It's not much. But I hope it will draw some people to the farm and the produce store Lex wants to build. I follow her around. As do several of the guineas. As far as I can tell, they don't sleep. No matter how early or late I'm out here, someone is buzzing from one little house or hiding spot to the next. And they are chatty little fellows, whistling and squeaking up a storm. I hadn't heard that he wants to expand. I guess that means the farm stand is doing well. I should get my mom to put one up. She bends down to pick up one of the guineas. She cradles it against her chest and asks me what this one's called. I haven't gotten around to naming them yet. Maybe you can help me come up with something fun for the kids. I'll have to see them in the daylight. They have such unique personalities. We can't name them without getting to know them. Liv picks a few dandelion leaves and feeds them to her little charge. You know a little something about them? I ask. She looks much too comfortable handling the little animal to be new to them. I had a couple of them when I was little. They lived in a corner of the living room. My dad wasn't a fan. They pee and poop everywhere, and I don't think they sleep at all. I laugh at the confirmation of my suspicion. At least that means they'll be out and about for the kids. I think that's nice of you to do something like this. There aren't too many things for children to do around town. We don't even have a playground aside from the one at the elementary school. I guess everyone's too busy playing outside in the woods and creeks. It's what Lex and I had done growing up whenever I'd come to visit, and my sister and me, wherever we lived at the time. I wish. I was outside from sunup to sundown when I was a kid, but no one does that anymore. They sit inside glued to their little screens. It's sad. They've lost all connection to nature and where food comes from. This will be good for them. I raise an eyebrow. Oh, no. I'm not suggesting. I mean, I know that they are eaten in some parts of the world. I laugh at the worry in her eyes. The guinea pig squeaks and does his or her best to escape from Liv's arms. She gently sits it down. Don't worry. You won't be dinner. Go, play with your friends and live your best life. I know what you meant. It's good for them to see a farm in action. Watch veggies being pulled from the ground and pick some apples from a tree. Who knows, maybe we can talk grandpa into letting them watch a cow getting milked. That would be so much fun. They could make their own butter, or better yet, ice cream. I've seen this neat little thing where you can make it with two Ziploc bags, some ice, and some salt. Like a mini ice cream maker. They'd have a blast. Liv's eyes light up with excitement. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I don't even know if anyone will show up to see this. I motion around the guinea pig enclosure and the rabbit hutches. It doesn't look like much. Don't forget about Tom and the goats. Who wouldn't come to see Tom? I think you're a little smitten by my donkey, I say. My voice turns husky, seeing her stand in there in the moonlight, admiring my work. She steps closer and leans her head against my shoulder like it's the most natural thing. I think I'm smitten by a lot of things about you. She steps around me to face me and reaches up to run her fingers through my hair. 
the touch is electric and soothing at the same time. It's the strangest feeling. I hold my breath, not wanting it to stop. I realize that's a mistake when she raises up and gently kisses me. I take a quick breath of fresh air before I bend down and recapture her lips. I deepen the kiss and lose myself in the feeling of her warm body pressed against mine. It's a heady feeling. My arms wrap around her of their own volition, pulling her even closer. I don't know how long we stay in there wrapped in each other's arms, drawing in the kiss I'll remember until the end of my days. Hmm, she says when we finally part. Her head rests on my shoulder again. My right arm is still wrapped around her. I need the connection. We both do. I. We, the fog is slowly lifting, and I realize what I've done. I kissed Liv. Olivia. Lex is Olivia. I feel my body stiffen. This is the one thing I promised myself I would never do. No matter what. What's wrong? Liv's voice is soft. As soft as the body still pressed against me. I peel my arm away and step to the side to create some distance between us. This shouldn't have happened. What? Why? Is there something wrong? Her hand flies to her mouth. No, there's nothing wrong with you. The kiss was amazing, electrifying, life-changing, and completely wrong. You didn't like it? I can feel her eyes more than see them in the dim light. That's not it. Not at all. But this can't happen again. You and I can't happen. I take another step back and force myself to look away from her. Why is that? Her tone is sharp, and there's a challenge in it. Because I'm not that guy. What guy? The kind of guy who takes someone else's girl. I turn my back to her. The temptation to throw my convictions to the wind and pull her back into my arms is too strong. That's ridiculous. I'm no one's girl, and I haven't been with Lex in a very long time. I told you that's over. Doesn't matter. Because it isn't for him, and that does matter. I will not be the harbinger of the pain I lived through. Fine. But if you ask me, you're making a big mistake. By the time I turn back, she's storming off in the direction of the farmhouse where I can see Lex standing on the lit up front porch. Chapter 18 Olivia Bright light streams into the unfamiliar bedroom when I wake up in the morning. The bed next to me is empty. The scent of freshly brewed coffee and bacon tempts me to get out of bed and dress in the second spare outfit I'd packed. It's nothing special. My favorite pair of jeans, a tank top, and a cotton cardigan that's light enough for most LA summer mornings. I slip into my sneakers and jog down the stairs. I can hear the indistinct noise of conversation all the way down. There you are. Grandma Clark beams at me like we hadn't seen each other for ten months instead of ten hours. Coffee? Lex asks, holding up the pot. Yes, please. I need it. I take the one remaining seat at the table, next to Harrison and across from my mother. Didn't sleep well? Grandpa Clark asks, folding up the paper he was reading. I'm surprised he's here and not out working on something. Actually, I did. I'm not all the way awake yet. It takes me a while to come around when I sleep in. And when you don't. You always looked half asleep on the way to school. Lex hands me a cup of coffee. I pour a healthy swig of cream into it and add a heaping teaspoon of sugar. I was up at six the other day. Not exactly, Harrison says under his breath beside me. He has yet to look at me. The memory of that kiss and his reaction afterward hits me like a hurricane. Or a tornado. Unexpectedly, quickly, and it throws me for a loop. I wrap my hands around the cup and look down into the caramel-colored liquid. Scoot over. Lex stands next to me, one of the chairs from the dining room in hand. I can feel Harrison move next to me. The legs of his chair are scraping on the linoleum floor that covers the kitchen. I pick up my chair and scoot over far enough to not touch Harrison or his chair. 
It gives Lex barely enough room to squeeze in. How do you like your eggs? Grandma Clark asks. Scrambled, Harrison, Lex, and their grandfather say. I already fed you. Are you seriously still hungry? She asks. The three men shake their heads up and down. It's like filling buckets with big holes in them. Olivia, how would you like your eggs? She smiles and looks right at me. Scrambled is fine. I'm tempted to say I'm not hungry and leave, but the truth is that I'm starving, despite the large dinner last night. Coming right up. Grandma Clark cracks about a dozen eggs into a bacon grease filled cast iron skillet and mixes them up with a wooden spatula. Liv, you never told me what brought you back to town, Lex says. Visiting. I pick up my spoon and stir my coffee. Not that it needs it, but it's something to do. Anything fun planned while you're back? He asks. I look at him. He has got to be joking. Sorry, I guess the rest of your time here will be spent working on cleanup. How much longer will you be here? He's turned his entire body, giving me his full attention. I'm not sure. Maybe we can grab a beer and play some darts, he says. Maybe. I can't exactly tell him that I'd rather play Harrison in another match. Not that he's interested. Lex, why don't you let Olivia enjoy her coffee? Here are your eggs, honey. You look a little pale. Did you sleep okay? Grandma Clark puts a large plate of eggs, bacon, and several biscuits in front of me, followed closely by a bowl of grits with plenty of butter and black pepper. She didn't, my mother says. She looks as concerned as Grandma Clark does. I slept fine, I lie. You were tossing and turning and getting up at all hours, honey. I guess that means you were awake, too. I look at her and notice the dark circles under her eyes. You two have been through a lot. It would surprise me if you got a good night's sleep. I know I didn't, and my farm was barely touched by the storm. Grandpa Clark digs into the plate of eggs his wife hands him. His portion is smaller than mine, which means, by the way he's eyeing my plate, he notices. Hopefully, you'll have power at your place and can sleep in your own bed, Lex says. Grandma Clark hands plates to both of her grandsons. Harrison takes his and mumbles his thanks. Lex looks down at his plate. What's with the senior portion? Hey, his grandfather says. This is your second helping. Any more food, and your stomach will burst, Grandma Clark says. By the twinkle in her eye, she doesn't mind. I'll be the judge of that. Hardworking men need a lot of fuel. Lex puts a large fork full of fluffy eggs into his mouth, grinning happily. Speaking of which. As soon as you're done here, I need the two of you to walk the fence line of the backfield. We're moving the cows over there tomorrow. Yes, sir, both men say in unison. Shouldn't take long, and we'll come over to help clean up as soon as we're done, Lex says. I don't think there's a lot to do until I can get someone to demolish and remove what's left of the greenhouse, my mother says. Why don't you rent a dumpster, and I can send one of the boys over with the excavator? Shouldn't take long to remove it. Grandpa Clark washes down his last bite of food with coffee and gets up. It's some sort of signal, because both of his grandsons get up as well, shoving what food they can into their mouths before taking their plates to the sink. What in the world? Grandma Clark says when we hear barking and bang outside, followed by the sound of a large vehicle pulling into the driveway. Everyone is on their way to the front porch when a horn honks loudly. It causes Tom and the dogs to kick it into another gear. An old GMC truck comes to a stuttering halt. It's pulling a large Airstream trailer that, like the truck itself, has seen better days. Who is that? Lex asks no one in particular. No idea, his grandmother replies. She's wiping her hands on her apron before running her fingers through her hair. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see my mother smoothing out the blouse she's wearing over a pair of worn jeans. Southern women. If there was a mirror out here, they'd be checking their lipstick. Both of the boys step down off the porch, looking a bit like a pair of guard dogs. 
The door opens, and a young woman with olive skin and hair as dark as mine climbs out. She's wearing skinny jeans, cowboy boots and a sleeveless silk top that flows over her upper body. Harry! She runs up the rest of the drive and jumps into Harrison's arms, wrapping her long legs around his waist. The fact that he seems just as happy to see her bothers me more than I like to admit. But it explained his reaction last night. Harrison has someone else who he didn't bother to mention. The pang in my heart takes my breath away, but a small part of me is glad that this is happening now instead of a few weeks or months down the road. This pain is nothing compared to what it could be if I'd actually let myself fall for the guy. Grandma. The woman extricates herself from Harrison and skips up the steps to the porch. Grandma Clark pulls her into a tight hug. Katie Bug, it's good to see you. I had no idea you were coming for a visit. Grandpa Clark, who kept in the background, looks just as happy to see her. Katie, these are our neighbors, Rita and Olivia Spratt. This is Harrison's sister Katie, my oldest grandchild. Grandma Clark's eyes are full of pride and joy. It's nice to meet you, my mother says, holding out her hand. Katie shakes it. The feeling of relief that floods through me leaves me speechless. What in the world are you doing out here? Harrison asks. I thought you were teaching scuba diving lessons down in Belize. Chapter 19 Harrison I can't believe you're actually here. Why didn't you call? I ask. I'm sitting at the kitchen table across from my big sister. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision. I woke up three days ago from a dream about this place and thought I'd drive over. Katie Bug, how do you like your eggs? Grandma asks. I don't eat eggs, Grandma, remember? I'm vegan. Katie smiles up at her. Eggs aren't meat but have it your way. How about some of these grits, then? There's butter in those, I say. Well, what can you eat then? Our grandmother is looking a little frustrated, scanning the stove and counter for what she has to offer. Toast up a couple of slices of sourdough bread and give her some of your famous strawberry jam, I suggest. Oh yes, please, and coffee would be great. Katie's eyes light up, and my grandmother is appeased. You're back to drinking coffee? The last time I saw my sister, she'd sworn of caffeine for good. Yes, Belize proved too tempting. You should see the coffee plantations down there. Katie takes the cup Grandma pours her and takes a sip, sighing deeply. How long ago did you leave Belize? Liv asks. She's standing at the kitchen counter, drying the dishes her mother insisted on washing, despite my grandmother's protests. Let me think. Six months ago? Something like that. Katie takes the plate that holds several slices of freshly baked sourdough bread and spreads jam on each of them, ignoring the butter dish Grandma places in front of her. What have you been doing since? I ask. Traveling across the Southwest. I've been taking pottery lessons. There are some amazing artists out in Arizona. You should head out to Sedona sometime. You'll love it, she says. I doubt it, but keep my mouth shut. My sister and I are very different people. She's always been a free spirit without a sense of money or business. I don't think she's ever opened a savings account. Have you talked to mom and dad? Katie asks. Not recently. Why? Are they stateside as well? After the past few days, nothing would surprise me. Not as far as I'm aware. Last I heard, they were in Brussels. Katie takes a bite of her bread and jam. They haven't mentioned any moves. I hand her a napkin. Thanks. Grandma, this jam is amazing. Our grandmother looks pleased. I have no doubt that she'll send a couple of jars with Katie whenever she decides to leave. You've been living in that airstream? I ask. I have. I know it's overkill for one person, but I got a good deal and the guy I bought it from really needed the cash. It's not in the best of shape and I'm afraid the truck is on its last leg, but it's been home. Katie licks a bit of jam off her fingers. I'll take a look at it, 
I promise. Why don't you let your grandfather and Lex do that, my grandmother suggests before insisting on finishing the last of the dishes. We should head back to the house, Rita says, taking the towel from Liv. I'll go pack our stuff. It was nice meeting you, Katie, Liv says. It was nice meeting you, too. We should hang out sometime. We're kind of busy putting our place back together, Liv says. What if we grab a drink tonight? Not much you can do after dark. This place has to have some sort of watering hole. My sister isn't one to give up quickly. We'll see how it goes. Liv waves and leaves. I can hear her run up the stairs. What's wrong with her? My sister asks. Katie! Grandma spins around quicker than that chick from the Exorcist movie. Sorry. Their farm got hit by a tornado day before yesterday. Had it really been two days already? Oh, man. I heard about those. They did quite the number down in Alabama. I ended up driving north for a bit to avoid them. I didn't realize you'd taken damage here. If there's anything I can do to help, please let me know and put me to work. Unlike my brother over here, I'm pretty handy with anything that doesn't involve an engine. Harrison has been very helpful. He and a friend of mine secured my roof and boarded up the windows that were broken. Rita wipes her hands on the apron she borrowed from my grandma before taking it off and returning it to the hook on the wall. It was nothing. All we did was cover it with a tarp. I'll come by and check on it later though, make sure it's not going anywhere. I'm grateful for her support. That would be nice. I hate to bother you, but would either one of you be able to give us a ride back? I don't have my car here, Rita doesn't look like she enjoys asking for favors. Something I have the feeling she has in common with her daughter. They are both strong, independent women. After what Liv told me about her father during our night huddled under a rock, I don't know if it's something that comes naturally or something that was born out of necessity. Or maybe a little of both. I'll take you as soon as you're ready, my grandmother says, hanging her own apron up as well. Great, that means Harrison can give me a tour of the farm. I haven't been back here since he was a baby. Katie jumps up and takes her cup and plate to the sink, washing both before Grandma protests. Sure thing, I say. We wait until Liv and her mom are ready to leave. Where are Grandpa and Lex? Katie asks when we step outside. Grandma's Oldsmobile is pulling out of the drive, Liv sitting in the wide back seat, mucking out the stalls in the barn where the milk cows spend the night. I point in the direction of the large building. In that case, let's start this tour somewhere else. Katie skips down the stairs and turns, looking at me expectantly. Kitchen garden or petting zoo? I ask. There's a petting zoo? When did that happen? Her eyes light up. It's hard to believe my sister is five years older than me. She acts like she's nine. Not long ago. It was my idea. I don't even try to keep the pride out of my voice. In that case, lead the way. She motions in the direction of the kitchen garden. I grin and take off down the driveway toward the rabbits and guinea pigs. I'll introduce her to the goats and Tom later. This is it? Katie doesn't look impressed when she climbs out of the center seat of Lex's truck and looks at the entrance to the tipsy cow. This is it. Lyndon's pride and joy. It's bigger than it looks. Come on, cuz. I'll buy you a beer. Lex links his arm with hers, and the two of them waltz into the bar. I follow behind, feeling like a third wheel. I don't know why I let her talk me into this. After a long day of fixing fences and a quick trip to the Spratt place, I was ready to sit on the porch with a cold one before heading upstairs to hit the hay. Of course, my sister had other ideas, and Lex had quickly taken her side. I walk into the tipsy cow, wondering why Lex and Katie stopped three feet in. Lex is whispering something into her ear. FYI, Olivia is here, she says over her shoulder. Liz sits at the bar, talking with Amy. A folder sits between them. I'm guessing it's the script Liv wants her to read. It doesn't look like it's going well. Why don't the two of you grab a table, 
and I'll get us some beers. Pitcher okay with everyone? Lex asks. Pitcher sounds great. Katie walks to the table next to the dartboard, and Lex takes off in the direction of the bar before I get a chance to reply. I follow my sister and take the seat next to her, my back to the bar. Wanna play? I ask, pointing to the board. Later. What's going on with you and Olivia? There's some weird tension between the two of you. She kicks out the chair across from her and puts her boots on it. There's nothing going on between us. She and Lex were high school sweethearts, and he hopes they'll get back together now that she's back in town. Hmm, Katie's look speaks volumes, but before I can ask her what that's about, Lex is back, Olivia in tow. Look who I picked up. Liv, take a seat. I'm so glad we bumped into you. My sister sits up and brushes a bit of imaginary dust from the chair she propped her feet up on. Thanks. I can't stay long, though. Liv takes a seat. Lex sits down next to her and pours her a glass of beer when Amy brings the pitcher he ordered. We're not staying out long either, my sister assures her, despite previous claims to stay out dancing all night. How did things go with Amy? Does she like the script? I ask. The look Liv shoots me is all I need to know. Not as well as I'd hoped. Leo's reading it, though. Lex pours a glass for Katie before filling his own. There's enough left in the pitcher to fill my own about halfway. I'll go get us another one, I say, and walk over to the bar. That's your sister? She looks like trouble. Amy refills the pitcher before I get a chance to place the order. She is, but she's harmless. She will put your jukebox over there through a workout, though. And there will probably be dancing at some point, I warn. Nothing wrong with that. She's a pretty girl. It'll keep people around. You should bring her over here more often. Amy grins and hands me the pitcher, telling me it's on the house. Liv's shoulders stiffen the moment I return. Anyone up for a game of darts? I ask, hoping that will break the ice. I walk up to the board and pull out the darts. Liv shakes her head. Maybe later, Lex says. He's sitting back, resting his arm on Liv's chair like it's no big deal, scanning the bar for familiar faces. What we need is some music. Katie takes a swig of her beer and saunters over to the old-fashioned jukebox. She pulls a few coins out of the tiny leather purse slung across her body and makes her selection. A moment later, here for the Party by Gretchen Wilson starts to play. Katie dances in the bit of empty space in front of the box. It doesn't take long before some yokel joins her, and before I know it, Leo and one of the regulars are moving tables, creating more space for her and the couples joining her. I turn to apologize for her. Olivia's eyes are glued to the small crowd, her foot tapping to the rhythm of the music. Would you like to dance? For old time's sake? Lex asks, holding his hand out. To my surprise, she grabs it, and the two are off. I'm left by myself, watching the two of them move across the dance floor. Liv is smiling and looks happier than I've seen her since we made it back from our hike. Dance with me. My sister stands in front of me, slightly breathless, her hand outstretched. She's not taking no for an answer but grabs me and pulls me out just as the song ends. Saved by the bell, I say. Not so fast. Katie winks and twirls herself under my raised arm before launching into a two-step as this kiss by Faith Hill starts to play. You have got to be kidding me, I mumble. The last thing I need is to watch Liv and Lex dance to a song that perfectly describes the one and only kiss she and I shared. What's wrong, my sister mouths over the sound of the music. I shake my head and try to ignore the lyrics while moving her across the dance floor. The next song is slower, the music softer. So, what's going on between you and Olivia? Katie asks, pulling me closer. I'm not slow dancing with you. I step out of her embrace and walk her back to our table. All right, but you're not getting out of this conversation. Katie takes a drink of her beer. I look back toward the dance floor. Lex and Liv don't seem to have a problem dancing together. I guess they had lots of practice at all those school dances growing up. 
not here, I say, anxious to get away from the sight. I empty my glass and walk outside, Katie falling close behind me. Spill. You like live, don't you? My sister doesn't lose any time, and I know better than to try to lie to her. I do. But so does Lex. I shrug and lean up against the old picnic table that's sitting beside the brick building. Why does that matter? Katie hops up on the table, crossing her legs in front of her. He and Liv are high school sweethearts. She broke up with him and left town a couple of years ago. Now that she's back, he's hoping they'll get back together. This is about who called Dibs first? Her eyes are wide, her eyebrows raised. He's still hung up on her. He told me she's the one. And I'm not the guy that will take that away from him. But you like her. No, it's more than that. You're falling for her big time, aren't you? I can feel her eyes on me. It doesn't matter. Of course it matters. How does Liv feel, she asks. We kissed the other night. Well, she kissed me. I can feel the heat creeping up my neck at the admission. Did you kiss her back? I did. Then why weren't you pulling her out on the dance floor tonight instead of Lex? It's obvious you wanted to. I told her I couldn't do this. Not with Lex. Seriously? She reaches over and slaps my head. Ouch. What was that for? For being stupid. You're not Bree. Please don't tell me you're bowing out because of that sad excuse of a woman. I'm not doing that to Lex. So she and Lex got back together? There's a challenge in her tone and her expression. No. Then you're not doing what that cheater did. You're both interested in the same girl. There's nothing wrong with that. And from the sound of it, she's into you. I haven't seen her kissing Lex. Katie hops down and stands right in front of me. Neither have I, but that doesn't mean. Baby brother, you have to learn to follow your heart. She likes you. She's looking at you anytime she thinks no one's paying attention. I wish it was that simple. It is. Tell her how you feel. Show her. Whatever it takes. It worked for mom and dad. Not so much for us, though, did it? I say. Not yet, Harry. And it won't if you don't go after what and who you want. She turns and walks back inside the bar. Where did you two disappear to? Lex asks when we get back to our table. He and Liv are back at the table. Someone else must have taken over the jukebox. Hank Williams is playing. I needed some fresh air after all those moves, my sister says before I can come up with an excuse. Thanks for keeping me company. She sits down, pulling the chair next to her out for me. It's what little brothers are for, I say, picking up my own glass. How far are the two of you apart? Liv asks. She's looking at my sister, and I keep my mouth shut. Five years. I remember when mom and dad brought him back from the hospital. He was red and wrinkly and had a bit of a cone head. Not at all what I expected. Hey! Sharing embarrassing stories about me is one of Katie's favorite pastimes, but this isn't the time or the place. Relax. He got cuter from there, and I'm proud to call this handsome guy my brother. She ruffles my hair before placing a quick kiss on my cheek. Seriously? I look to Lex for help, but he's grinning from ear to ear, enjoying the joke at my expense. The ribbing continues for a while, with Katie sharing stories of the misadventures of my early childhood like the time I'd run off wearing nothing but a diaper until a kind gendarme at the French village we lived at picked me up and carried me back home. Mom was napping on the couch and hadn't realized he'd been gone. Katie rocks back in her chair. Because you didn't bother waking her up after opening the front door for me, I say. You wanted to go out and wouldn't stop begging me to let you go. What was I supposed to do? She shrugs. Change of topic, please. I look at each of them in turn. Liv is the only one who takes pity on me. Where are you off to next? she asks my sister. I'm not sure yet. India maybe. 
I'm still working out the details. I figure I'll stick around here until I do. Which means I have a lot of extra time on my hands to help out at your place. You don't have to do that. Liv looks off into the room, looking a little embarrassed by the offer. I know that, silly. I want to help out. I'm sure Lex and Harrison do, too. We'll be at your place bright and early tomorrow morning. What sounds reasonable? 8 a.m.? My sister finishes her beer and looks at Liv expectantly. 8 sounds good, unless the two of you have chores. Liv looks at Lex, still doing her best to avoid me. We should be done by then. It's a lie, and it means getting up at least half an hour earlier than we usually do, but I keep my mouth shut. Great. That's settled then. Harrison tells me you're pretty good at this. Up for a game? Katie points to the dartboard. To my surprise, Liv jumps at the chance. I guess I'm the only one she doesn't want to play with anymore. Those two are becoming two peas in a pod, aren't they? Lex says, moving to Katie's seat, which gives him a better view of the board and the game in progress. Not sure that's a good thing, I say, looking at the two of them chatting and laughing before Liv demands a rematch. Chapter 20 Olivia Hey, Liv. What are we working on today? Katie waves at me as she hops out of her truck. It's the third day that she and the boys have shown up to work on the farm. The site of the greenhouse is almost pristine. Between the four of us, my mom and Walter, who's faithfully spent any time he has not working at the diner over here, we've made more progress than I thought possible. I think we're going to set up a new high tunnel. It should allow my mom to start some plants in the house and get them through the last few cool days. Katie. Come get some coffee. Did you have breakfast? My mother calls from the front door. I follow her inside and take a seat at the kitchen table where Walter is sketching out the plan for the new beds and the PVC pipe supported cover that will go over them. I found some plans online that will allow you to open and close it as needed. Might get you some more use throughout the year. You can cover the beds when we have one of those downpours heading our way. Walter has become a lot more talkative over the past few days. I can't wait to see what you're growing in there. You'll have to send me pictures. Katie pours herself a cup of coffee and peeks at the plans. You're leaving? Already? I knew she wasn't staying in Linden for long, but this felt sudden. Not for a few more days. Don't tell Harrison or Lex, though. I haven't had a chance to break it to my grandmother yet. Where are you off to, my mother asks. She's grown as fond of Katie as the rest of us have. India. There's an ashram I've been wanting to check out for ages. That's a yoga thing, right? My mother takes a seat across from us. There's more to it than that, but, yes, I'll be there for a yoga retreat. Any goats? I ask. I hope not. I can't believe my baby brother bought two billy goats to offer goat yoga at the farm. She shakes her head. He's trying so hard, and his heart is in the right place, my mother says, and I couldn't agree more. If only he didn't have that misplaced sense of honor that keeps him from kissing me. It may take him a little while at first, but he usually figures stuff out and gets it right. Katie's looking at me, and I get the feeling there's something she's trying to tell me. That truck of yours doesn't sound great. Want me to take a look at it? Walter says before I get a chance to respond. That would be great. Actually, if you can think of someone who'd be interested in buying it and the Airstream, let me know. The truck maybe. Don't see much need for that kind of camper around here, Walter says. That would be great. I'm sure I'll figure something out. It's not a bad little home. If nothing else, I'm sure Grandpa will let me store it somewhere on the farm. I might have an idea, I say, thinking about Harrison's plans to offer some places for people to come stay on the farm. The Airstream wouldn't be a bad place to start. Tell me about it on the way out, Katie says, getting up and taking her coffee with her. She wasn't someone who liked to sit around. 
Let me guess, you have a list in your head and are ready to put everyone to work. I follow her out the back door. Liv, you know me so well. It's like we grew up together. She grins and surveys the site in front of us. All evidence of the old hoop house and the destroyed greenhouse are gone. A large container is sitting next to the drive, waiting to be picked up. It's filled to the top with glass, scrap metal, shards of pots and the likes. Where do we start? I ask. Let's lay out the plant beds. We can mark them out with rope and have the boys build the boxes when they get here. Katie walks off into the direction of her truck and climbs into the bed. Come grab this. You came prepared, I say as she hands me a roll of twine and a stack of tomato steaks. Of course. She hops out and grabs more steaks. Mom's favorite beds are three and a half feet wide. It's a little shorter than most raised garden beds, but we're both short and it makes it easier to reach every square inch. Great. Let's measure it out over here and get the first few stakes planted. We work together, making good progress. I can see this project taking shape and am surprised by how good it feels to restore part of the farm and bring it back to life so soon. So you and Lex dated for a good while, Katie says. We're walking down the length of what will become the raised bed covered by a hoop house. We did. But that was a long time ago. We've moved on. I pull the rope along with me, wrapping it around the stakes that Katie is pounding into the packed dirt. I'm not sure he feels the same way. If you ask me, he's trying to win you back. If he bothered to ask, or at least listen, he'd know that this isn't going to happen. Besides, we're friends now. Because I have a crush on his cousin. Not like I'm going to throw that into his face. And not like it matters, anyway. Harrison is pretty smitten with you, too. I don't know what's going on with the three of you, but you have that whole Bella vibe going on. Very twilight. It's nothing like that. I pull the rope harder than necessary and pull several of the stakes out of the ground. Right. You tell me then. What is this thing between the three of you then? Katie has a hand on her hip, obviously not happy with me. I take the rubber mallet from her and start pounding the stakes back into the ground. It's simple. I like your brother. He thinks I should get back with Lex. I'm not interested in that. End of story. Did you tell him that? Tell him what? That I like him? Of course I did. I kissed the guy, and he tells me it was a mistake and can never happen again. The rejection still stung. Unfortunately, it had done little to change my feelings about her brother. Did you tell him that you and Lex are just friends? That you're not interested in rekindling the flame with that cousin of mine? Repeatedly. Not that it was doing much good. Can't say I'm surprised. He's always had a stubborn streak. Especially when he's feeling righteous. Mom calls him her little martyr. Katie walks over and takes the mallet away from me. Great. Don't give up hope. All you have to do is show him. He'll get it. Show him how? I ask. If I have to tell you that, you're not as into my brother as I thought you were. Katie pounds in the last of the stakes and leaves me to ponder her advice. You and Harrison seem to be getting along better, my mother says. We're standing in what will soon become the new hoop house. Walter and the boys are working on cutting the lumber for the new planting boxes that will form the center and basis of the structure. He's talking to me. That's something. He'd even cracked a joke over lunch. At my expense, but it was better than the cold shoulder treatment he'd been giving me. Or if I'm being perfectly honest, I have been doing the same. It's progress. Anything is better than watching the two of you walk on eggshells around each other. She is walking the length of the roped-in area, picking out rocks, twigs, and anything else that could cause a problem later. Katie is raking the far end of the area. I pull the wheelbarrow we've been using farther down the line and join my mother. I didn't realize you noticed. Of course I did. I care about you and want you to be happy. 
my mother chunks a handful of rocks into the barrel. They clink against the metal as they hit. Katie looks our way before getting back to raking. I should take turns with her, knowing firsthand what using a rake will do to your hands if you're not used to a bunch of yard work. I'm just glad you're not Team Lex. What does that mean? Mom asks. It means I'm glad you're not one of the people that think Lex and I should get back together. Of course not. You two were never right for each other. She tosses another rock, and it hits with a satisfying thud. Really? Your dad and I were up plenty a night worrying about the two of you. You don't exactly bring the best out in each other. Lex needs someone different. Someone who builds him up and encourages him. Makes him rise to his potential. Hey, I'm encouraging, I say, raising up and staring at my mom. You can be, but you're not the kind of person who thrives on that. You need a partner, someone who challenges you intellectually and makes you go out there and conquer the world. Someone you're equal. Like Harrison. He's good for you. I'm too stunned to speak. It's the first time she's mentioned anything like this. And honey, don't take this the wrong way, but I think you and Lex need to have a conversation about all this. You owe him that much. She smiles at me, a smudge of dirt on her cheek. I think you're right. I look over at the guys. They are busy putting the first of the planter boxes together. I see Harrison walking around the house and out of sight. Now is as good a time as any to have that talk. I'll be right back. Everything going okay over there? Lex asks when I join him. He's sitting on the first of the boxes. I join him. We're almost ready for the boxes. Listen, there's something you and I should talk about. What's that? You're asking me out? He winks, looking his usual confident self. No, I'm not. I appreciate your help, and I'm glad we got a chance to reconnect. But that's all this is. We're old friends who happened to date back in the day. Back in the day? You make it sound like we're ancient history. He gets up and kicks the rock in front of him. In a way, it is. I've changed. You have too. We aren't the same people we were back in high school. I guess we're not. When you came back, I'd hoped. I know you did, and I hate to see you disappointed. But you and me? It was never that perfect relationship everyone made it out to be. We want different things, and you deserve to build a life with someone who gets you and supports you 100%. I hate to see the hurt look on his face. And that can't be you, can it? He turns and stares right at me. I have the feeling he finally gets it. It can't. Part of me wishes it could be, but that's not me. I love what we had, and part of me will always love you. As a friend. I swallow hard. He nods. I should go check on Harrison. I watch him disappear around the house. Your dad would be proud of you. My mom puts an arm around me. Why does it feel so crappy then? I ask. Because part of you still loves him and always will. And that part of you hates that you have to hurt him, even if you know it's better for both of you this way. Give Lex a little time. He'll come around, she says as we walk back to the future place of the hoop house. You and dad really talked about this kind of stuff? About who would be the right person for me? I ask a little while later, still trying to process what I've learned while we work. The men are putting the rest of the planter boxes together. The constant sound of hammering becomes the background noise we work to. It's making me pick up the pace, my breath coming faster and beads of sweat forming on the bridge of my nose. Of course we did. We talked about all sorts of stuff, staying up late sitting in the kitchen drinking mint tea. Her smile is sad, her gaze going off into the distance, like she's seeing him in the far corner of the hayfield. You miss him, don't you? It's a stupid question. Of course she does. We both do. I just didn't realize how much. I do. But it's not as hard as it was in the beginning. Life has a way of creating new rhythms and new habits for us. 
and you're meeting new people. Like Walter. He's good for her, even if she struggles with accepting his help and the attention he gives her. We both are. Have you met anyone nice in California? Someone who misses you while you're gone, she asks, before humming a tune and picking up more sticks and rocks so they don't stick through the weed fabric we plan to lie down before installing the boxes. I stop in my tracks. I can't think of a single person who would actually miss me. In fact, I have proof. I've been gone a full two weeks, and not a single person has called or checked in other than my landlord, who's looking for his check. I'm grateful that my mother isn't waiting for an answer. It's nice to have you back home, she says out of the blue. It's nice to be home. The circumstances aren't ideal, but it's good to be back. I'm glad. I, she shakes her head. What? Never mind. It's silly. Tell me, I insist, taking a few steps to close the distance between us. It's selfish. She turns to pick up another shark rock. Nothing wrong with that. Tell me what you wanted to say. It's nothing major. Some days, I just wish you didn't live so far away. It would be nice to see you a little more often, have you come over for dinner? That kind of thing. It's silly. It's not silly. I blink to clear away the tears. She misses me. It is. And it's selfish. Forget I said anything. You need to go after your dreams and build a life for yourself. Something you love and are proud of. She stops working and looks right at me. Rita, is this looking smooth enough? Katie calls from the other end. I hope she didn't overhear our conversation. My mother walks her way, and I pick up the wheelbarrow that's already almost full again. I realized it's counterproductive to let it get too full. It makes the path to the area behind the shed where we found Tom too treacherous. My mother's words keep running through my head. She's lonely. I've known that since I left, but it's much harder to ignore now that I see her here on the farm by herself. It isn't fair, and if I'm honest with myself, I've missed this place. Missed being here. It's easier to remember my dad in familiar places, like the old oak that still holds the swing he built for me or the creek we used to wade in when the summer days got too hot. My mom and Katie have their heads stuck together, talking to each other when I return. This can't be good, I mumble under my breath. Mom walks in my direction when they see me. Why don't you grab another rake and help Katie over there? I can finish the last patch myself. How do you want to do this? Katie asks when I walk up to her, rake in hand. We can do wide sections each, or rake, side by side. It's how Dad and I used to do it, and the option she picks. That way we can chat, she says. I can't shake the feeling that my mom is putting her up to this. What do you want to chat about? How are you liking LA, she asks. It's an exciting city. Lots of stuff going on. Ain't that the truth? It's almost as bad as New York City. I can't make it more than 48 hours in either place. Now Vegas, that's a different story. Katie laughs, and my mother looks our way. You've been? To Vegas? I lived there for a year. I was a magician's assistant for one of the smaller shows. It was a blast. Katie moves her rake, and I follow suit. You've traveled all over the place, haven't you? Since before I was born. My family never stays anywhere for long. Except my grandparents and Lex. They've been here in Linden forever. I don't think any of them have made it more than a hundred miles from here. You're not wrong. Technically, Lex has been farther for a field trip to Washington, D.C., but the sentiment is right. And you couldn't wait to get out of here. Am I right? She asks. First chance I got. It's a big part of why Lex and I broke up. He's happy here. And you? Do you like it better in LA? She asks before we both turn to rake in the other direction. There are things I like about it and things I don't. The traffic, the bad air quality, the lack of space. 
the fact that I can barely support myself and haven't gotten a foot in the door anywhere. I think that's why I'm still hopping from place to place. Finding the one that feels like home, Katie says. Hmm. Oh, girl, that was the most loaded nonverbal sound I've heard in a while. Spill. What's going on in that head of yours? She pulls the rake up and puts a hand on her hip. This place still feels like home. Nothing wrong with that. What's the problem, she asks. I'm not sure. I guess it feels like I failed. I went out to LA to make it. And I haven't, yet. And moving back home feels like giving up, right? She asks. I nod. Except that's not true. I'm sure you've learned a lot, going out on your own. You've grown as a person. Maybe you needed to move away to realize that this is home. Maybe. It was tempting to accept her explanation, but I wasn't sure it was the entire truth. Moving back home would make things easier, especially when it came to money. It's not like you have to decide today. Think about it. But promise me one thing. Don't let pride get in the way of your happiness. That's never a good idea. And don't ask me how I know. I won't. I promise. Good. In that case, come over tomorrow for lunch. I'll cook us some Egyptian food, and we can talk about how we can turn my camper into something that Harrison can rent out to people. I can do that. I love the idea and the fact that Harrison still has no idea that his sister is going to gift him with the Airstream. Great. Hopefully, my hands won't be covered in blisters. She looks down at her hands. They look red and sore. Why don't you go check on the boys while I finish up here? I ask. I have a better idea. I'll send Harrison over to help. She grins and walks off toward the sound of hammers pounding in nails. Chapter 21 Harrison Knock, knock. I open the door to my sister's camper. Come on in. Food's almost ready, my sister calls. It smells like home. You didn't tell me you were making Tata's lentil soup. It's a surprise. Plus, I promised Liv to make her some authentic Egyptian food. She nods her head in the direction of the small dinette that's right behind me. Tata is what we call our maternal grandmother. I guessed as much. Liv is sitting on the small couch that's covered in blankets and colorful pillows. I wouldn't be surprised if my sister had woven those blankets herself during her time in Arizona. At the very least, they came from a local artisan. The entire space has a southwestern feel to it. Hey. I step next to my sister and peer into the pot. It's almost done. The pita is store-bought, but it'll do. Grab some bowls out of that cabinet over there. Katie points to a small overhead cabinet that holds a stack of mismatched plates and bowls. I thought you wanted to run this idea of yours by me, I breathe, for only her to hear. Oh, it's actually Liv's idea. She can tell you all about it while we eat. If you'll set the table, I'll bring the soup as soon as it's blended up. Katie holds up a potato masher and gets to work mashing the cooked lentils and veggies into a somewhat smooth soup the way our grandmother has always done it. Mom uses a stick blender, I say, picking three bowls and digging around for spoons. Well, Mom isn't a traditionalist. Besides, I don't have one of those in here. Katie blows me a kiss, and I look around for the table she wants me to set. What can I do? Liv asks. Not a thing, honey. Relax and be ready to be amazed by the flavor of this soup. You'll love it, Katie says pointing the potato masher at a small fold-out table that's tucked up against the couch. Do you mind holding this? I hand the bowls and spoons to Liv. My hands brush hers while our eyes meet. She looks away, studying the design on the pottery intently. By the time the soup is blended up and the pita toasted, I have the table set. Lemon. We need lemon wedges. Katie smacks her forehead and dives into the tiny gas-powered fridge, emerging with the citrus fruit. I shake my head but appreciate the finishing touch. Sit, eat, 
she says when she returns with the lemon wedges. Yes, ma'am. I take a seat next to Liv and watch my sister ladle soup into each of our bowls. It's fragrant and hot. This brings back memories of Tata's place. Where's that? Liv asks, taking a cautious taste. I can't wait to see how she likes it. What do you think? She asks. It's good. Very good. The spices are interesting. Liv eats another spoonful. Squeeze some lemon in. It'll brighten the flavor. And to answer your question, our grandparents have a place on the outskirts of Cairo. Liv does as suggested, and her eyes light up with the next bite. They're not far from the pyramids, then. Different side. Have you been? I'm surprised. Not many people over here realize that the Great Pyramids are that close to the city. They imagine them out in the desert somewhere. No. California is as far as I got. That must have been fun, though. Growing up, all over the world. Seeing one of the great wonders, she follows my example and dunks some of the pita bread into the thick soup. It was. Remember that time Ghetto had to come rescue us when we got in trouble for climbing on one of the smaller monuments? I ask. It had been her idea. Ghetto is your grandfather? Liv asks. Katie nods. Not nearly as much trouble as you and that little friend of yours would have gotten into if one of your treasure hunts out would have resulted in anything. The Egyptian government takes protection of objects from the past seriously, I add. But I'm sure you've seen them. Artifacts, I mean. Of course. Real ones and fakes. Our dad would drag us to museums any chance he got, and Ghetto loves nothing better than to point out all the fake stuff they sell to the tourists. That's so interesting. Did you see any mummies? Liv turns to get a better look at both of us. Of course. The museums are full of them. And we've been to all the major sites. Giza, obviously, Alexandria, Memphis, Luxor, Karnak. My sister rattles off site after site. Don't forget the Valley of the Kings. And Hatshepsut's Temple. It had always been my favorite. If it's on a travel itinerary, we've been there. Katie shakes her head. I know what she's thinking. Some of it had been boring when we'd been kids. As we'd grown, we'd come to appreciate that part of our heritage more and more. Have you sailed on the Nile? Liv asks. Of course. But enough about that. This isn't why I asked both of you here. Liv, tell Harrison about this brilliant idea of yours. What idea? Liv's eyebrows are drawn together. About this place. Katie waves her arms around. Oh. So since Katie is leaving and can't take this thing with her, and since there aren't a lot of buyers for an airstream around here, I thought you could turn it into a place for people to come and stay at the farm. It would be faster than building something or doing one of those shipping container conversions. You're leaving? I look at my sister, shocked at the first bit of info. You knew I wasn't going to stay here for good. It's time for me to spread my wings and experience something new. Where? When? In three days. I have a flight out of Atlanta. I'm going to India for a while. A friend of mine invited me to stay in this ashram. What? Why? I feel Liv's hand on mine, offering comfort and support. I've been thinking about getting deeper into meditation and yoga for a while. Real yoga, not that goat stuff you've been talking about. She smiles at me with kindness in her eyes. She loves to tease me, but this time it has a sweet undercurrent, not the barbs she usually throws at me. When are you coming back? I feel like we've barely reconnected, and she's leaving. Not that it comes as a surprise. I'm not sure. I'm going to play it day by day. Do you think you could give me a ride, though? Tuesday morning. My flight leaves at 11. I nod. Of course. Great. So since I can't sell this thing, and it really needs some work anyway, Liv here thought it would make a great little vacation getaway for people. What do you think? 
she looks around the space she's called home for the past few months. It has potential. I look around. It's spacious enough for two to four people. The kitchen and cabinets are in decent shape. Some paint and a few interior design improvements, and this could work. I'm not sure how we'll get the smell of incense out of it, though. Right? It's the perfect size, and you could be up and running within a few days. There's a spot behind the milk barn, close to the creek, that would be lovely. Liv points in the direction of the place. I know what she's talking about. If we can level it off a bit, it could work. How much do you want for it? I ask my sister. Not a thing. Aside from the ride on Tuesday. It's yours. Are you sure? I ask. Of course. I can't sell it around here, at least not quickly enough, and I'd rather see it put to good use than watch it run away in some old barn. Her phone rings, and she glances down at the screen. Grandpa wouldn't enjoy having it take up room in his barn, I say. Definitely not. Glad that's settled. I have to go take this. You two finish lunch, and, Liv, share some of the ideas you have for the place. Katie walks out of the trailer, closing the door behind herself. Through one of the large windows, I see her walking off toward the house. Do you think she's coming back? Liv asks. We've finished our meal and are doing dishes. Probably not. I have a feeling that call was an excuse to get the two of us to spend a little time together. I dry the last of the bowls and return them to their space in the cupboard. I got that feeling, too. Liv pours herself a glass of water and returns to the table. I'd love to hear your ideas for this place if you've got a few minutes to stick around. I put away the last of the dishes and join her. Sure. Do you have any design scheme in mind? She asks. Anything that isn't this Southwest, hippie mix. Not that it looks bad, but it's obvious this is my sister's place and it looks well lived in. I think something clean and modern with a hint of farmhouse chic could work well. Liv pulls out her phone and shows me a picture of what she has in mind. I love the dark wooden counters and white wall combo. It would brighten up the place quite a bit. I think so too. And there's this neat building I've seen where someone turned this space into a dinette area that doubles as a second bed. She pulls up a YouTube video and shows me. You've given this a lot of thought, haven't you? I ask. Liv laughs. I love interior design and decorating, but this is your project. You do what you think will work best. I think you're on the right track. If you have any other ideas, I'd love to hear about them. Okay, but don't say I didn't warn you. I have sketches and Pinterest boards galore. Wanna see? Before I get a chance to respond, she has an app open that includes a collection of inspiration pictures and renovation ideas. I'm loving the enthusiasm. What's your Pinterest email? I'll add you to these boards, she offers, after scrolling through a slew of pictures. I don't have one. Sure. I've heard of the app and seen it come up in search results, but I've never had a need for my own account. Apparently, that's about to change. Give me your phone. She holds out her hand. I do as asked. Email address? I spell it out for her. Preferred password? Anything is fine, I say. I will change it to something secure later. Hmm, let me think. Goat Yoga 2000. No one who doesn't know you well will ever guess that one. And it's easy to remember. She smiles proudly. Two minutes later, she hands the phone back to me, and I'm the proud owner of a new app and ten different boards full of saved images. Thanks. I hope you're this efficient when it comes to doing the actual work, I say, keeping my tone light. You'll be pleasantly surprised. I am, and I have a good bit of experience. Lucky for you. I'm also very frugal. We can make this whole place look entirely different for under a thousand dollars. Good to know. Without a steady income, my savings are dwindling even if I live rent-free for the time being. What do you think of that spot by the creek? She asks. It has potential if we can flatten out a wide enough space. 
I would like to build some sort of patio or hangout spot. Maybe add a fire pit. I have a spreadsheet full of features that some of the most popular Airbnb places have in common. A fire pit is pretty high on the list. As is a coffee bar and local honey, to my surprise. Thankfully, all of those are simple additions we can easily make. I can easily make, I remind myself. Want to start bright and early Wednesday morning? Liv asks. You're really up for this? And does that mean you'll stick around for a while? There isn't a lot to do at my mom's place until the insurance check comes in. And yes, I think I'll stay around at least a little while longer. She stares at her phone, and something in the tone of her voice is off. Things aren't great in LA, are they? Not particularly, no. Are you thinking of moving back permanently? I hold my breath. Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do. She sounds so lost. It breaks my heart. Purely hypothetically speaking, what would you do if you lived back here? Interior design? Liv looks up and smiles. There's not too much of a market for that around town. Unless barn decorating becomes a trend. What were you planning on doing before you left? I ask. Nothing. That's why I left. I'm honestly not sure what I could do aside from helping my mom restart the greenhouse and the family business. Who knows? If this takes off, we might be redoing campers and building cottages all over the place. That makes her laugh. Chapter 22 Olivia I can't believe you're actually doing this. Harrison pulls the backpack that makes up the entirety of Katie's luggage aside from a tiny crossbody purse out of the trunk of his car. We're stopped in the departure line at the airport, cars zooming in and out around us. Oh, please. You can't wait to get rid of me so you can get to work on that trailer that used to be mine. She grins and pulls her brother in for a hug. You've got a point. Go have fun. Email me when you land. Harrison lets go of her. Katie turns to me. I'm so glad I got to meet you. The woman who bewitched my cousin and my brother. I stare at her. Just kidding. You just traded up. He's the better Clark to build a life with. Don't run away from this one, okay? She gives me a quick hug and turns to walk through the automatic doors to enter the airport. Have a good flight. Harrison calls. Katie turns and takes a few steps back. I almost forgot. I booked the two of you a yoga session in half an hour. It's not far from here. And it's already paid in full, so don't even think about skipping. Gotta run, or I'll miss my flight. She hands me a piece of paper and is gone. What exactly did my sister get us into? Harrison asks when we're in the car. He pulls out of the temporary parking spot, and we get in line with the rest of the car slowly exiting the airport. It's a 30-minute session at a yoga studio. Looks like it's a 20-minute drive, I say after googling the address on the printout. What do you think? Do you want to go do yoga with me? He asks, rolling his shoulders. I could use a break before we drive back. My shoulders feel tense after the hours spent in the car. Plus, I haven't been to yoga since I left LA. Oh, good. Katie wouldn't let me hear the end of it if we skipped out on her gift. Can you navigate? He asks. Sure, I say with more confidence than I actually have. Take a ride over there. No, not that one, the next one. Somehow Harrison manages to get back into the left lane to take the second right in Atlanta's crazy traffic. Are you sure? He asks when I give him the next set of instructions. I look at the screen, double-checking everything. When I look up, he's made the turn without my confirmation. Let's use the car GPS for the drive home, I say when we pull into the small strip mall where the yoga studio is located. Good idea. Harrison locks the door, and we head upstairs to the studio. Welcome to Zen Yoga. How can I help you? 
The middle-aged woman is wearing a pair of fuchsia-colored leggings and an oversized white t-shirt with the studio's logo on it that consists of a lotus flower and some swirly designs. She's incredibly fit, and it's making me very aware that the dress pants and button-downs I'm wearing aren't going to do well, even if the pants have a good bit of a stretch in them. My sister booked us a session. Harrison Clark. He hands her the printout of the gifted session. Oh, how fun. You're going to love this session. Gabriella and Sam are the best. Did you bring something you can change into? She asks, looking at me. This was a bit of a last-minute surprise. Neither one of us brought workout clothes, Harrison says. You'll be fine, she says to Harrison, before turning to address me. I don't think your blouse will make it through this. Hold on just a minute. I wonder what that's about, Harrison says. We both look around the small studio. It looks similar to the place I use in LA. Here you go. On the house. She hands me a purple shirt. Thanks. It's a fitted t-shirt, and I don't quite see how my blouse, not my dress pants, are the issue, but decide to switch into it. By the time I get back, the classroom is open. Hello, everyone. I am Bridget, your instructor. Gabriella and Sam should be here any minute. You're going to love this. They must be some sort of guest instructors, Harrison says. We choose our spots next to each other. It's us and seven other people, by the looks of it. We do a few stretches to warm up and loosen up. Here they come, Bridget says. The door opens, and two women walk inside, each of them carrying a baby goat. Goat yoga? The expression on Harrison's face is priceless. I burst out laughing. Thankfully, it's covered up by the expressions of glee and delight from the rest of our small crowd. The women let down the goats, unhooking the ropes from their colorful collars. Gabriella and Sam carefully explore the room. I invite you to sit down in the lotus position, or however you're comfortable. Be very still, and let's see who these two choose as their first favorites. Bridget sits down slowly, and we follow her example. The young goats are spooked at first with the movements across the room, but quickly regain their confidence. Don't worry, we have treats for you to give to them. You'll each get a chance to experience goats climbing all over you, Bridget says. The women walk around, handing everyone a small bag of animal cookies. Is this right? I ask, holding up my bag. It's the same cookies my neighbor in LA gives her children. Yes, they love them. Kids love animal crackers, one of them said, making the group break out into laughter. Time to get back into our routine. Bridget walks us through a few basic movements, with plenty of interruptions, by baby goats jumping on our backs or into our laps. She's eating my hair, one of the women in the group squeals. She's about my age and looks slightly terrified. Harrison jumps up and distracts the goat with the last of his crackers. That was sweet, I say. He smiles, looking pleased, before getting back to his downward dog position. He's barely set up, when the other goat, Sam, I think, jumps on his back and shoulder, standing up like she's some sort of mountain goat, standing guard on her favorite rocky outcrop. I pull my phone out to take a picture just in time for Sam to let loose and handfuls of milk duds roll down Harrison's back. Please tell me that didn't just happen, he says, moving his shoulders in a failing attempt to get the goat off his back. I understand why the lady at the front desk thought my blouse wasn't appropriate and buy a water bottle, a hat, and a matching shirt for Harrison as a way to thank her for her kindness. That was fun, I say on the way back to the car. Easy for you to say. You don't have goat manure stains all over your back. Harrison pulls his shirt over and sniffs it. Here. I throw him the large t-shirt I bought for him. For me? You look like you could use a fresh shirt. I grin and quickly close my mouth when he pulls his stained shirt off, revealing washboard abs and shoulders that look even wider when they aren't covered in material. Too quickly, he pulls the new t-shirt over his head, but I have a feeling I'll be enjoying that view again tonight as soon as I fall asleep. The drive home goes smoothly once we make it out of Atlanta. 
I could never live here, I say. But LA is fine? Harrison asks. You have a point. Being back in Linden is putting things into perspective for me. I have a hard time picturing myself back on the West Coast. Glad to hear that. Harrison goes quiet after that. A few miles down I-85, he turns on the radio. We listen to country, the news, and the tail end of a Braves baseball game, talking about anything and everything in between. Too soon, we're at the exit to Linden, and not long after that, Harrison pulls into the drive that leads up to my home. Thanks for a fun day, I say when the car comes to a stop. Thanks for not letting me make the trip back by myself. I would have been moping the whole way back. Yeah, right. I don't see Harrison Clark moping around. I turn to look, but he's not smiling. You are going to miss her, aren't you? Of course. I always do. But that's not what I'm talking about. The whole saying goodbye and leaving by myself is what gets me. No matter how many times we've practiced this, and trust me, in my family, we do that a lot. In that case, you're welcome. I'm glad I could be there for you. I unbuckle my seatbelt and grab my purse. Something about his demeanor changes when I look back up. Harrison unbuckles his seatbelt, and for a second, I wonder if I should ask him inside. Before I get a chance to utter a word, he leans forward. For a moment, we're so close our noses almost touch. Neither one of us say a word. I would like to give that kiss we almost had the other day another try. You're okay with that, he asks, his voice, barely a whisper. Okay. Getting that one word out coherently is an effort. My heart is racing a mile a minute, and all conscious thought has fled my mind. Good, he mumbles before his lips brush across mine. I lose myself in the feeling of them pressing against mine. Until he deepens the kiss, and I forget who I am. There is nothing but the feeling of the two of us. Nothing but the clean scent of his soap. The feeling of his hand cradling the back of my head, pulling me toward him. Closer. We can't get enough of each other. By the time we break apart, both of us breathless, I'm surprised the windows aren't foggy. See you tomorrow, he says, before I stumble out of the car. Scratch that dream about Harrison shirtless, tonight. I'm reliving this kiss. Tonight and every night, going forward. I wake up, thinking about that kiss. The sun is streaming into my old familiar bedroom, the yellow curtains softening the light into something pleasant. What's got you in such a good mood this morning, my mother asks. I had a good dream. That's nice, honey. Coffee before we go mix up soil to go into the new hoop house beds? When I nod my head, she pours some into a large travel mug and hands it to me. You want to get started now? I ask. No time like the present. I need to get seeds started as soon as possible if I want to have any chance of having something to sell at the farmer's markets this year. She grabs her own cup and a pair of gardening gloves. Lead the way. I've lost count of how many batches of soil and compost we've mixed and poured into the first bed when my phone rings. That's odd. It's my landlord in LA. It can't be much past 6M over there. Who is it? My mother asks. Someone from L.A. I'll be right back. I walk out of the hoop house and down toward the back of our property. Olivia, did you get my messages? Oscar asks the moment I accept the call. What messages? I know full well about the emails and texts he sent me, reminding me my rent is due. Overdue, if I'm being honest. Don't mess with me, Olivia. You know full well what messages. The ones I send you every month, you're late with my check. This isn't cute anymore. Do you have the check or not? He asks. Oh, that. It's in the mail. You should have received it by now. Please don't tell me it got lost. It hasn't. I haven't sent it because it will completely drain my account. If what's left would even cover it. I've been afraid to look. I have not. Tell you what. 
If I have a check in my hand one way by the 15th, you can stay. Otherwise, get your stuff out, or you can go look for it at the dump. He hangs up. Wow. That was harsh, I say. Hee ha. Tom comes trotting out from behind the shed. Did you run away again? The grass and weeds must be really tasty here. He Tom shakes his head. I'll take that as a yes. And never mind that before. It's my landlord. It'll be fine. I just have to figure out how to come up with enough money for rent and the drive back to LA. Ha. Huh. Tom moves his head, looking at me intently. I swear he's actually listening. I can't ask my mom. Every penny she owns is going into rebuilding the farm. And there's no one else. I shrug. Hugh ha. Hugh ha. Tom walks up and gently nudges me into the shoulder. You're right. It's time to put on my big girl pants and deal with this. Come on. You can stay with my mom until I can get Harrison over here. He follows close behind me, gently blowing hot air into my ear, before nibbling on my hair. I take it as a sign of approval. Liv, we won't open for another half an hour, Amy says when I knock on the door of the tipsy cow. I was hoping to chat for a few minutes. I walk in before she can tell me to get lost. Not that Amy would do that. She's too nice of a person. Sure thing. What can I get you? She walks behind the bar. Diet Coke with lemon. Coming right up. What did you want to talk about? The script? Yes. Did you read it? I cross my fingers under the bar. This is my one chance to make it. I did. It's a great script, and I'm sure it'll be an awesome movie. She hands me my soda. But. I'm done with the whole acting thing. This is my life now, and I have no plans to change that anytime soon. Or at all, I hope. Amy is right. It's a great script. Is the writer a friend? Leo sits down on the stool beside me, handing the script back to me. More of an acquaintance. I'm tempted to ask Amy for something stronger than the soft drink in front of me. Why is this so important to you? Amy asks. I shrug. The usual. Trying to make it. Trying to pay the bills. And it's not going well? I shake my head. At the rate things are going, I'll be here, for good. I wish I could at least make it back for my books and my plants. If they're still alive. The plants, not the books. I didn't realize things were that bad. Amy looks at her husband. I still have a few contacts in the industry. Let me make a couple of phone calls and see what I can do, he says. Seriously? I try not to get my hopes up. Of course. Anything for a friend of Amy's, he walks off, pulling his phone out of his back pocket. Chapter 23 Olivia Mom, do you have a minute? I clear my throat. Sure, honey. Do you want some tea? My mother holds up the kettle. Tea sounds great. It will give me a minute to get my thoughts together. Something I didn't manage to do on the drive back from the tipsy cow. What's on your mind, she asks, sitting two large mugs of peppermint tea on the kitchen table. I take a deep breath. How would you feel if I went back to LA? I know we've been talking about me moving back home and helping you rebuild. My mom puts her hand on mine. Don't worry about me. I want you to do what makes you happy. Build the life you've always dreamed of. Are you sure? It feels wrong to leave you with all this. I look out the window at the missing greenhouse. I am. And I'm not sure I want to rebuild. Some investors came by yesterday when you were in Atlanta and made me an interesting offer. Maybe it's time to let this go. Move into town, get a part-time job. I could come visit you, spend more time with Dolores. And Walter. Her cheeks turn red, and she pulls her hand out of mine. I think that's a wonderful idea. Spending more time with Dolores. 
She sees she's been missing you. And I'm sure Walter wouldn't mind seeing you again, either. I don't even try to hide my grin. The man has been out here every single day since the storm. Take some time to think about it. This is your heritage, your legacy. I won't sell it if you think this is a place you may want to come back to. I shake my head. This has been your and dad's dream. It's never been mine. Yes, this is my childhood home and part of me thought it would always be here, but that's no reason to tie my mother to it. Not when she has other dreams of her own. What kind of daughter would I be if I moved back across the country, asking my mother not to sell so I'd have a place to visit once every couple of years? Besides, it's not like the farm is going anywhere. It'll just have a new owner. I tell her as much. Tell you what, we'll sleep on it, and if you still feel the same way in the morning, I'll give those investors a call. Okay. I take a sip of my tea. The mint and honey mixture soothes my throat. When are you thinking of going back to L.A.? Mom asks. Tomorrow? That sounds like a question. It is. In a way. I'm trying to figure stuff out. The Cliff Notes version is that Leo made a few calls and set up an interview for me in L.A. tomorrow afternoon. Amy's husband. From what I hear he was an up-and-coming producer when they met. I'm sure he'll get you in touch with some good people out there. I hope so. But that means I need to be on the first flight to L.A. I can connect from Greenville through Atlanta and make it in time. It'll be a close call with L.A. traffic, but it's worth a shot. Even if it costs me every penny I own and then some. That sounds wonderful. Why aren't you more excited? Is it money? Yes, and no. More of a cash flow problem. I'd have to max out the emergency credit card you gave me. And that would barely cover the flight. I was still short on rent. Sometimes you have to go all in to win the pot. Go book that flight, and I'll drive you to the airport. She gets up and pulls open the kitchen drawer. Without a word, she hands me a stack of twenties. That's three hundred dollars, Mom. I can't take that. Yes, you can. You can pay me back when you get the job. Thank you. I have tears in my eyes. This woman has done and sacrificed so much for me over the years. Anytime, honey. I'll come back the first chance I get to visit. Maybe we can make the road trip back together. I will need my car back at some point. The sooner the better. Maybe there'll be enough time before I start my new job. If I get it. That sounds nice. And don't you worry about me. I have friends here in town. And Dolores is practically family. My mother smiles. I get the feeling she's actually happy about all this. And there's Walter. Yes. But what about you and Harrison, she asks. I walked right into that one, and I have no idea how to break the news to him. Hey, what are you doing here? Harrison looks surprised when I show up at the farm right before sunset. He's out in the spot we'd talked about for the airstream, shoveling gravel. What are you working on? The spot for the camper? I ask to buy myself a little time. Lex borrowed an excavator from a friend and leveled the ground for me. I thought I'd get some gravel put down and give it a chance to settle before we pull the airstream back here. He looks around the small site, pride shining in his eyes. Looks great, but I bet you wish that excavator was still here. That looks like a lot of work. I point to the large pile of gravel left. It's faster than you think and a good workout. Definitely more effective than goat yoga. He wipes the sweat off his brow. I see that. And about as dirty. It'll rinse off. Hey, wanna come by the day after tomorrow and help me line it up? We can get started on some of those ideas for the interior we talked about. He looks at me, eyes wide. About that, I shuffle my feet and kick a few rocks around. Live, spit it out. Whatever it is, I can take it. He grins. He is not ready for what I'm about to tell him. 
I got a job offer in LA. I'm flying out first thing in the morning. I get the words out as quickly as I can, hoping this is a little like pulling off a band-aid. When are you coming back, he asks, looking confused. I'm not sure. It all depends on how things go in LA tomorrow. Tomorrow. You're leaving just like that? What about this? He points to the ground he's working on. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's my chance to get a foot in the door with a real production company. They make movies, Netflix shows, everything. It's what I've always wanted. I guess I should wish you good luck then, he says, and picks up his shovel. Chapter 24 Harrison Just when I think my life can't get any worse, it does. What do these vultures think they can pull off around here? I don't even know what plans they have for Linden. Golf course development, senior living community, a theme park? Whatever it is, it's nothing good, and it will destroy this town. Mark my words. Grandpa paces the living room from one end to the other, waiting the paperwork the developers left. It's not a bad offer, Lex says. The rolled up papers fly in his direction. And nothing's going to happen unless the majority of landowners agree to sell. They made that pretty clear. I pull my legs in to let my grandfather pass. What we need is a town meeting. Make sure no one signs this, this, Grandpa shakes his head, unwilling even now to utter a foul word. Why don't you call Dolores? I'll get out the word for everyone to meet there tomorrow after church. Grandma rises and heads into the kitchen. Nothing will cause her to be late with dinner. Not even the impending doom of the town she's spent most of her life in. That's not a bad idea. I'm calling her right now, Grandpa says. The room is packed when I walk into the copper kettle with my family on Sunday. I think the whole town showed up, Grandma says. Sure did. I'm going to put on another couple of pots of coffee. After that, do you want to say a few words, Mr. Clark? Dolores asks. It's Alec. We're in this together if we want to save this town. My grandfather holds out his hand, and she shakes it. You really think it will come to that? Dolores asks. The Linden we know will be gone if they get their hand on enough of our land. Let's get to work making sure that doesn't happen. I watch my grandfather hop up on a chair. The whistle that's usually reserved for the cow stops every other sound in the room. Friends, neighbors. We have a problem. I'm sure many of you have been approached by a certain real estate development firm with offers for your land. Let's talk about what that could mean to our town and how it will destroy our way of life. That's one way of looking at it. It's also an offer for more money than any of us ever thought of seeing. Old Fred walks up next to us. And it could bring a lot of new business to town. People to shop on Main Street. To come here to eat, someone I don't recognize says. Ha! Huh. That country club crowd won't eat at a diner. They'll build some fancy restaurants to go with their mansions. And forget about pastures. Those will become golf clubs, maybe even an airstrip. At the very least, expect more traffic than this town can handle. Most of the community seems to agree with my grandfather. We don't need the kind of change something like this would bring. And the farms it would put out of business, my grandmother adds. I don't think it's a bad idea. The deal they are offering sounds fair to me, Liv's mom says. Please tell me you're not seriously considering this. My grandfather walks over to the table where Rita is sitting with Walter. As a matter of fact, I am. It would take a lot to get my place where it'll turn a profit again. Might be nice to downsize to something smaller here in town. Get a chance to visit my daughter. By the time it's all said and done, you might not be able to afford anything around here. And neither will we if property taxes skyrocket, my grandfather says. You don't know that. And the taxes they will pay on anything they build will help our schools, our roads. This could be a good thing. You can't be serious, Rita. I don't remember ever seeing my grandfather this upset. I am. Olivia has her life and her career in California. My husband is gone. 
there is no one to pass this down to. You have your grandsons, and I hope you can keep things going for them. Well, that isn't likely to happen if people sell around here. Starting with you. Never thought you were a sellout. He shakes his head. Grandpa, that's a little harsh, I say when I see the look on Rita's face. No, Harrison, it isn't. This will kill our town. Our way of life. If that's what you want, go ahead and take their offer. Can't say I'm surprised, he says. What's that supposed to mean? Rita asks. I'm not surprised to see you walk out after your daughter has done it not once, but twice. He turns to me. I've said my piece. Time to go. How is Grandpa? I ask after Lex and I are done with the chores. Better. I'm making him take a nap. He's not too happy with me, Grandma says. Doesn't sound like he's too happy with anybody right now. He'd given Lex and me quite the lecture about not getting involved with anyone in cahoots with the developers, including Rita and Olivia Spratt. Don't take him too seriously. He doesn't mean all that stuff he said about Liv and her mom. Grandma pulls the Sunday roast out of the oven. It smells amazing. What does it matter, anyway? It's not like she's coming back. I grab a stack of plates and walk into the dining room to set the table for Sunday supper. Grandma follows me, grabbing a stack of linen napkins from the buffet that's been in the family for as long as anyone can remember. It's older than the house and the farm, which is saying something. You miss her, don't you? She asks, folding each of the napkins before placing them on the plates. Who, Liv? I shrug. Yes, Olivia. Who else? And don't act like you don't. I know you better than that. She opens another drawer and gets out the good silverware. Really, I'm fine. We barely knew each other. Harrison. You don't fool me. You haven't been yourself since the day she left. You miss her. I do, but nothing anyone says is going to change that. It's something I need to deal with on my own. I'm fine. I promise. You're not, and if you ask me, it was a mistake to let her go, she says, placing the last of the forks and knives on the table and walking back into the kitchen. Like I had a choice in the matter. She's right, you know, Lex says. I don't know where he came from. About what? About everything. You're not okay. You're miserable. And you should have stopped her. The two of you are good together. Better than she and I have ever been. That's not true. Yes, it is. And you know it. Her and I never had what the two of you have. Had, I say. She left me the same way she'd left him. Only if you let her. If you love her as much as I think you do, go after her. Lex leans against the buffet. You didn't, I say. Because no matter how much I was fooling myself, she wasn't the one for me. But she is for you. Besides, from what I hear, her car is still at her mom's place. I'm sure she could use it back in LA. Chapter 25 Olivia Olivia, I need those contracts now. James McNeil sticks his head out of his office and glares at me. I'm doing what I can. This printer. I don't need excuses. I need results. Clients will be here in less than an hour. I could run out to a print shop. What are you waiting around for then? Go. Get it done. He shuts his door harder than needed. The guy is a jerk and nothing like his boss, the person I interviewed with. But I need this job if I want to keep my place. I grab my purse and head outside. By the time I'm finally on the bus home five hours later, it's all I can do to hold back my tears. Is this what I gave up everything I left for? My mom, my hometown, the house I grew up in? I don't allow myself to think about who else I left back in Linden. I blink away the tears that pool in my eyes and promise myself takeout from the little place downstairs as soon as my paycheck hits the bank account. I can do this. Three more days of P. Banjay, 
and I can stop worrying about money for a few days. I sling my purse across my shoulder and climb off the bus, ready to make the two-mile walk to my little studio apartment. I miss my car, I say to myself, when I see the same blue Honda parked less than 50 yards from my door. Maybe one of these days, I'll be able to take a few days off, fly home, and drive it back. Maybe I'll even be able to talk my mom into coming with me. Show her around town, take her out to dinner, drive past the houses of her favorite movie stars. The idea puts me in a better mood, even if it seems far off. Stay positive, live. This is the city where dreams come true and fortunes are made. I have got to stop talking to myself. But who else am I going to talk to around here? It's not like I'm making friends at the office. I shake my head and turn to walk up to the stairs that lead to my place. Hey, Liv. Surprise. Harrison sits at the bottom step, a duffel bag next to him. I come to a full stop, stunned. What are you doing here? Harrison gets up and takes a step toward me. I thought you could use your car. He points down the road. That's my car? I look at it, then back at Harrison. It is. You haven't been gone that long. I figured you'd remember it. He grins. Of course. I do. But I didn't expect it to be here. Or you. What? Why? I realize what I sound like and shut my mouth. Why don't we go upstairs and talk about this? Please tell me you have a decent shower I can use. I've been on the road for three days, and I need it. We can't. You can't. I turn to look at my car. Oh. I get it. I guess I could find a motel or something nearby for the night. I'll take the first flight back tomorrow. He turns and picks up his bag. That's not what I mean. We can't go upstairs until we find a parking spot, or my car won't be there when we come back down. You're in front of the hydrant. Parking in this town is ridiculous. No wonder you left your car at home. Harrison walks out of the shower, wearing nothing but a clean pair of jeans. I still can't believe you drove all the way out here to bring it back to me. I swallow hard. What I really can't believe is that Harrison is standing here, in my place. How's the new job? Harrison pulls a clean t-shirt on, hiding those abs of his. Ugh, don't ask. That bad? I thought Leo was helping you get a foot in the door with some PR firm, Harrison says. He did, and the guy running the show is nice. I open the fridge and pull out a carton of eggs. But? I'm not working for him. I'm working for the guy who signs new talent. Eggs? You must be starving. I crack the first one into a bowl. Eggs would be great, thanks. So your boss is a jerk. That's only temporary though, right? Foot in the door and all that. He sits down at the bar that serves as my dining table and home office desk. We'll see. More eggs go into the bowl, and I whisk them with more force than necessary. Liv, I think those eggs are about as scrambled as they'll get. He leans across the counter and puts a hand on mine. Sorry, bad day, that's all. I pour the eggs into the pan. Is that all it is? he asks. We all have bad days. I seem to remember you having a few of them on the farm. How are your folks doing, by the way? I move the eggs around and grab two plates. They are fine. My grandfather isn't too happy about some developer coming in and buying up land. I heard about that. My mom's thinking about selling. We've talked on the phone almost every day since I got back, and it makes me realize how much I miss spending time with her. And my grandfather isn't taking that too well. I'm sure they'll work it out. That's not why I'm here, though. I put the eggs in front of him and take a seat on the second bar stool. There's barely enough room for both of us. Why are you here? Harrison turns toward me and pulls my hands into his. I'm here because I'm tired of missing you. Lyndon isn't the same without you. 
and if you'll have me, I'd like to stay out here with you for a while. See where this goes. You would do that? I don't know what to say. I do. I will. In case you haven't noticed, I like you, Olivia Spratt, and I would like us to spend more time together. If you'll let me. You're serious? Just like that? Just like that. When you know, you know. I brought everything important with me. The rest I can get Lex to ship out here. If you want me to stay. You hate big cities, like LA. I'm having a hard time processing everything that's happening here. It's not that bad. I'm sure it's got its charm. He takes a bite of his eggs. What would you do out here, though? For a living, I mean. He looks around my tiny, overpriced apartment. I guess there isn't much space to rent out around here. That makes me laugh. Yeah, I think you're going to have to come up with a different idea. We're not turning my place into a band bee. And no traveling petting zoo either. My landlord won't even let me have a fish. It's true. The guy is worried about water damage from a tiny fish tank. I'm sure I can find something. I did graduate top of my class, and it's not like I'm looking for an acting gig. Or we could move back home and work on building those cabins and renting them out. I'm not sure where the idea is coming from. You would give up all this? He looks around my place again. If you would have asked me a week or two ago, I probably would have said no. But the truth is, I miss it. I miss Lyndon. I miss my mom. I miss Tom. Everything. I miss what we had back there. That's a big decision. I think that's something you should sleep on. Harrison is no longer grinning. He's serious. I don't think so. I think I should quit, and we should drive back home. Are you up for another road trip? I ask. As long as I can finish these eggs and get 10 to 12 hours of sleep, I'm good to go. Too bad you brought all your stuff. My poor little car was still full of his stuff. No sense in unloading it if we'd leave. That's a problem. We'll have to figure out what to do with all this. Harrison is looking around yet again, taking inventory. I should sell most of it or give it away. But that still doesn't fix our problem. I look around. I haven't been in California that long, but there are some things I wouldn't mind taking home with me. It doesn't. I guess we could rent a U-Haul. Or we could buy a camper and use it as the next rental on your grandfather's farm, I say. I have no idea where we'd come up with the cash, though. That's not a bad idea. Do you think we can find something around here quickly? Harrison asks. I pull my laptop closer and pull up Facebook Marketplace. There's at least a couple of dozen to choose from. How big do we want to go? That depends. Do you want to take a vacation, or do you want to get your stuff back home as quickly as possible? Harrison scoots closer, pushing his plate away. Get home as soon as possible, if that's okay with you. We can take a trip after we get settled in, and I figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And spend some time with your mom. Harrison takes the computer from me and starts clicking on the listings. That too. So something cheap, but in decent enough shape to restore when we get back to Linden. I look at the first listing. It's completely stripped and has more rust than my first car. And this one is too big. There's no way that little car of yours could pull this all the way over the Rockies. He moves on to the next one. This one has potential. It's a cute little trailer in decent shape. All it needs is a little sprucing up. I like it, he says by the time I notice the price and remember that I'm too broke to order us dinner. You know, I'm sure we can cram a little more stuff into my car. The rest I can sell or put into storage or something. I take his plate and put it in the sink. There is no way we can fit everything in, and it's a great plan. Harrison walks up behind me and wraps his arms around me. What are you really worried about? I'm broke. What does that have to do with it? I'm buying the trailer. 
it's for my rental project, after all. I can't let you do that. I step to the side, out of his hug. The loss of warmth and connection is instant, and it's all I can do to keep the small bit of distance between us. Of course you can. It's perfect. I'll message them and see if we can go take a look at it today, pack up tomorrow, and get out of here. Harrison walks back to my computer, and his fingers fly across the keyboard. What did they say? I ask when I hear the messenger app beep. They're out of town until tomorrow night, but if we want it, it's ours. Harrison walks back to the sink where I'm still standing, trying to get my bearings, and pulls me close. That means we have the whole day tomorrow to get a head start on packing. I'm making a mental list of everything I need to do, doing my best to look over his broad shoulders. Or we could spend the day playing tourist. You could show me the sights. If you're up for it. Harrison takes the tiniest step back and cradles my face in his hands. Of course. We'll do the whole thing. Hike up to the Hollywood sign, stroll down the Walk of Fame, have lunch in Chinatown, go to the Griffith Observatory. Before I get another word in, he captures my mouth with his. The kiss takes my breath away. And it makes up for everything. The turbulence on the flight back here, the traffic, the crappy job, living on ramen and peanut butter sandwiches. That was something else, he breathes when we both come up for air. It was. I think we should do that again. Epilogue Three days later, somewhere in Kansas. Harrison Turn it up, I love this song. Olivia is singing off the top of her lungs, hands drumming on the steering wheel as we fly down Interstate 70. You've got it. I join in, and we eat mile after mile of highway as the next two country songs play. Not my favorite genre, but the only thing we can pick up out here in the middle of nowhere. Liv, on the other hand, knows every line, singing off the top of her lungs as we fly down Interstate 70 East. Going home. Do we have any more Twizzlers? Liv asks when a commercial comes on and we both take a breather. I think we have pretty much every type of junk food and candy available at a gas station in this car. I dig around the bags and hand her a couple of the bright red strands. I rummage around to find something for myself. At some point we should probably stop for some actual food, Liv says when the next song ends. What, you're already tired of Snickers and beef jerky? I ask. Honestly, yes. I'm looking forward to some greens, preferably from my mom. I guess I better enjoy them while I still can, Liv says. Sounds like she's pretty set on selling. My grandfather is so mad he won't talk to her. That'll make coming home a little awkward, won't it? Liv holds her hand out for more Twizzlers, and I'm starting to think we should have bought a bigger bag. We'll figure it out and I thought you were craving salads. Once we get off the road, yes. For now, it's music and junk food to get us there. Hey, where do you want to put the camper when we do? She bites into another one of the red strings and passes an 18-wheeler pulling three trailers. I'm torn. It would make a cute couple's getaway, so something down by the creek away from the house would be nice. But there's also enough room for a family with one or two little kids. I bet they'd love to wake up next to the rabbits and guinea pigs. I would have loved that growing up, Liv says. How are Ginger and the gang? They are fine. And turns out guinea pigs multiply as quickly as rabbits do. We're making some changes. Lex and I are building the boys their own enclosure. And I think I'm going to have to find homes for most of the new additions once they are big enough. Running a petting zoo was turning into a much bigger deal than I'd expected, but at least it was working. The farm stand is packed on the weekends. I can't wait to see it. She grins and holds her hand out for more candy. You're going to get a stomachache, I say. Buzzkill. Fine, coffee then. I need something to keep me going. Ready to switch? I ask. Not yet. We've got a quarter tank of gas. We'll switch when we fill up. Deal. I pour coffee from the thermos we filled this morning into her cup without spilling a drop. 
Impressive. She takes the cup. We can't both spill it all over the place. Ha. Huh. Hilarious. What am I in charge of, then, she asks. What are you talking about? You are in charge of pouring caffeinated beverages. What's going to be my job? Oh, that's easy. Donkey wrestler and saving me from wild dogs, I say. Marshall isn't a wild dog. She laughs. You need to tell him that. He tried to eat me when I picked up your car. He did not. He did. Ask your mom. It was all she could do to pull him off me. Let's face it, your dog doesn't like me. He's protective. Probably needs a little time to get used to you. I promise I'll work on it as soon as we get back home, she says. Good. Maybe we can turn him into some sort of bunny wrangler. A couple of the boys are quite the escape artists. And bunnies are faster than you think. I'm not buying that tortoise and hare story since becoming the proud owner of my own little petting zoo. I don't think that's the best idea. If he can catch something, it doesn't end well for whatever he's after. You might have a point there. I guess he'll be good at keeping people off the farm, I say. Your family's or mine, she asks. I'm guessing mine, since your mother is selling hers. Good point. I need to figure out what her plans are and where I fit in. She turns to glance at me, her eyebrows drawn together. Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. First thing, we'll turn that little camper behind us into something someone would actually want to stay in. I turn to make sure it's still happily bouncing along behind us. Hey, it's not that bad. It has a surprising amount of space in it. She's not wrong. We were able to cram everything she decided to bring in there. Can you imagine what this would be like without it? I ask, leaning back in the seat. This trip would take us at least four days, I can tell you that. Taking turns driving helps. You would know. She laughs. I'm never going to get enough of that laugh. And just wait. It'll turn into a great little rental when we're done with it. Great, problem solved then, I say. What problem is that? You wondering what we're going to do when we get home? I say. Fixing up the trailer. Check the Pinterest board I shared with you. Is that what you were doing while we drove through eastern Colorado? I ask. Got it all planned out. You'll love it. All right, I'll keep an open mind. I promise as we pull into the gas station to fill up for the last big stretch through Kansas. We're barely back on the road when the emergency broadcast signal interrupts the start of the next song. Tornadoes? Liv looks as shocked as I feel. What do we do? Get off the road and hunker down. I'm on my phone, searching for the next rest area. Thankfully, one is coming up in less than five miles. I hope we can find some sort of cover, Liv says, her voice shaking. I look at the landscape in front of us. It's so flat you can see the earth curve. Nothing but fields with the occasional farmhouse surrounded by large oak trees to break the wind. We'll be fine. Can you try that again and sound a little more confident? Liv steps on the gas, her eyes scanning the horizon. We both breathe a sigh of relief when we pull into the rest area and see the sturdy buildings and trees. Liv parks as close as she can to the back side of the restrooms. The radio is tuned to the emergency weather broadcast. I can't believe we're in the path of a tornado again, she says. I know. We made it through last time, and we'll make it through this one too. At least we're staying dry this time, I say, reaching over and taking her hand. Do you think we're okay here, or should we make a run for the building, she asks. Right on cue, the rain pelts on the windshield. The wind picks up, making the branches whip back and forth. I think it's too late for that. Lightning flashes across the sky, almost immediately followed by the loud boom of thunder. The storm is above us, and I have no idea where the tornadoes are. I'm scared. Liv stares at me, her eyes wide. She's pale and shaking like a leaf. Come here. I pull her close. It's awkward with the center console between us, but we make it work. 
The car and trailer shake in the wind. Sirens go off in the distance. Harrison. Liv calls out, pressing her body closer to mine. Look at me. We are going to be okay. We made it through this once, and we'll do it again. The words are as much for me as for her. Are you sure? I am sure. We didn't come this far to have it all blown to smithereens. I hold her close, her head resting on my shoulder. I pick up my phone and refresh the radar on my weather app. I hope you're right. I want to go back home. Hug my mom, play with Marshall. She extricates herself from my embrace and looks right into my soul. And I want to build a life with you. Good. Because that's exactly what we're going to do. Together. I caress her cheek. Together, she says. Always. Because for me, it will always be Olivia. The woman I fell for the moment she fell towards me. I love you, Harrison Clark. I love you, too. We hold on to each other as the storm rages on above us and around us. How bad does it look, she asks, glancing down at my phone when the wind finally lets up a little. You know what? I think we're going to be okay. We're through the worst of it, and all active tornado warnings are to the east of U.S. I breathe a sigh of relief as the screen refreshes. We should probably stick around a little while longer, though. Just to be safe. Liv climbs across the center console and into my lap. Just to be safe. I say before pulling her in for a kiss. The End This has been Fighting for Olivia written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2023 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.